Chapter Three of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Ziegler. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume Two by Havelock Ellis. Chapter Three: Sexual Inversion in Men, Part Eleven. The next case belongs to a totally different class from all the preceding histories. These, all British or American, were obtained privately. They are not the inmates of prisons or of asylums, and in most cases they have never consulted a physician concerning their abnormal instincts. They pass through life as ordinary, sometimes as honored, members of society. The following case, which happens to be that of an American, is acquainted with both the prison and the lunatic asylum. There are several points of interest in his history, and he illustrates the way in which sexual inversion can become a matter of medical-legal importance. I think, however, that I am justified in believing that the proportion of sexually inverted persons who reach the police court or the lunatic asylum is not much larger in proportion to the number of sexually inverted persons among us than it is among my cases. For the documents on which I have founded the history of Guy Olmsted, I am indebted to the kindness of Dr. Talbot of Chicago, well known from his studies of abnormalities of the jaw and face, so often associated with nervous and mental abnormality. He knew the man who addressed to him the letters from which I here quote. HISTORY 26 On the 28th of March, 1894, at noon, in the open street in Chicago, Guy T. Olmsted fired a revolver at a letter carrier named William L. Clifford. He came up from behind and deliberately fired four shots, the first entering Clifford's loins, the other three penetrating the back of his head, so that the man fell and was supposed to be fatally wounded. Olmsted made little attempt to escape, as a crowd rushed up with the usual cry of, Lynch him! But wavered his revolver, exclaiming, I'll never be taken alive! And when a police officer disarmed him, Don't take my gun! Let me finish what I have to do! This was evidently an allusion, as will be seen later on, to an intention to destroy himself. He eagerly entered the prison van, however, to escape the threatening mob. Olmsted, who was thirty years of age, was born near Danville, Illinois, in which city he lived for many years. Both parents were born in Illinois. His father, some twenty years ago, shot and nearly killed a wealthy coal operator, induced to commit the crime, it is said, by a secret organization of a hundred prominent citizens to whom the victim had made himself obnoxious by bringing suits against them for trivial cases. The victim became insane, but the criminal was never punished, and died a few years later at the age of forty-four. This man had another son who was considered peculiar. Guy Olmsted began to show signs of sexual perversity at the age of twelve. He was seduced, we are led to believe, by a man who occupied the same bedroom. Olmsted's early history is not clear from the data to hand. It appears that he began his career as a schoolteacher in Connecticut and that he there married the daughter of a prosperous farmer, but shortly after he fell in love with her male cousin, whom he describes as a very handsome young man. This led to a separation from his wife, and he went west. He was never considered perfectly sane, and from October 1886 to May 1889 he was in the Kankakee Insane Asylum. His illness was reported as of three years' duration, and caused by general ill health heredity doubtful, habits good, occupation that of a schoolteacher. His condition was diagnosed as paranoia. On admission, he was irritable, alternately excited and depressed. He returned home in good condition. At this period, and again when examined later, Olmsted's physical condition is described as, on the whole, normal and fairly good. Height, 5 feet 8 inches, weight, 159 pounds. Special senses normal, genitals abnormally small, with rudimentary penis. His head is asymmetrical, and is full at the occiput, slightly sunken at the bregma, and the forehead is low. His cephalic index is 78. The hair is sandy and normal in amount over the head, face, and body. 
His eyes are gray, small, and deeply set. The zygomi are normal. The nose is large and very thin. There is arrested development of upper jaw. The ears are excessively developed and malformed. The face is very much lined. The nasolabial fissure is deeply cut, and there are well-marked horizontal wrinkles on the forehead, so that he looks at least ten years older than his actual age. The upper jaw is of a partial V-shape, the lower well-developed. The teeth and their tubercles and the alveolar process are normal. The breasts are full. The body is generally well-developed. The hands and feet are large. Olmsted's history is defective for some years after he left Kankakee. In October 1892, we hear of him as a letter carrier in Chicago. During the following summer, he developed a passion for William Clifford, a fellow letter carrier about his own age, also previously a schoolteacher, and regarded as one of the most reliable and efficient men in the service. For a time, Clifford seems to have shared this passion, or to have submitted to it, but he quickly ended the relationship and urged his friend to undergo medical treatment, offering to pay the expenses himself. Olmsted continued to write letters of the most passionate description to Clifford and followed him about constantly until the latter's life was made miserable. In December 1893, Clifford placed the letters in the postmaster's hands and Olmsted was requested to resign at once. Olmsted complained to the Civil Service Commission at Washington that he had been dismissed without cause, and also applied for reinstatement, but without success. In the meanwhile, apparently on the advice of friends, he went into hospital, and in the middle of February 1894, his testicles were removed. No report from the hospital is to hand. The effect of removing the testicles was far from beneficial and he began to suffer from hysterical melancholia. A little later, he went into hospital again. On March 19th, he wrote to Dr. Talbot, from the Mercy Hospital, Chicago. I returned to Chicago last Wednesday night, but felt so miserable I concluded to enter a hospital again, and so came to Mercy, which is very good as hospitals go, but I might as well go to Hades as far as any hope of my getting well is concerned. I am utterly incorrigible, utterly incurable, and utterly impossible. At home I thought for a time that I was cured, but I was mistaken, and after seeing Clifford last Thursday, I have grown worse than ever so far as my passion for him is concerned. Heaven only knows how hard I have tried to make a decent creature out of myself, but my vileness is uncontrollable, and I might as well give up and die." I wonder if the doctors knew that after emasculation it was possible for a man to have erections, commit masturbation, and have the same passion as before. I am ashamed of myself. I hate myself, but I can't help it. I have friends among nice people, play the piano, love music, books, and everything that is beautiful and elevating. Yet they can't elevate me because this load of inborn vileness drags me down and prevents my perfect enjoyment of anything. Doctors are the only ones who understand and know my helplessness before this monster. I think and work till my brain whirls, and I can scarce refrain from crying out my troubles. This letter was written a few days before the crime was committed. When conveyed to the police station, Olmsted completely broke down and wept bitterly, crying, Oh, Will, Will! come to me. Why don't you kill me and let me go to him? At this time, he supposed he had killed Clifford. A letter was found on him as follows. Mercy, March 27th, to him who cares to read. Fearing that my motives in killing Clifford and myself may be misunderstood, I write this to explain the cause of this homicide and suicide. Last summer, Clifford and I began a friendship which developed into love. He then recited the details of the friendship, and continued. After playing a litz rhapsody of For Clifford over and over, he said that when our time came to die, he hoped we would die together, listening to such glorious music as that. Our time has now come to die, but death will not be accompanied by music. Clifford's love has, alas, turned to deadly hatred. For some reason, Clifford suddenly entered our relations and friendship. 
In his cell he behaved in a wildly excited manner and made several attempts at suicide, so that he had to be closely watched. A few weeks later he wrote to Dr. Talbot, Cook County, Gowell, April 23rd. I feel as though I had neglected you in not writing you in all this time, though you may not care to hear from me, as I have never done anything but trespass on your kindness. But please do me the justice of thinking that I never expected all this trouble, as I thought Will and I would be in our graves and at peace long before this. But my plans failed miserably. Poor Will was not dead, and I was grabbed before I could shoot myself. I think Will really shot himself, and I feel certain others will think so too, when the whole story comes out in court. I can't understand the surprise and indignation my acts seem to engender, as it was perfectly right and natural that Will and I should die together, and nobody else's business. Do you know I believe that poor boy will yet kill himself, for last November, when in my grief and anger told his relations about our marriage, he was so frightened, hurt, and angry that he wanted us both to kill ourselves. I acquiesced gladly in his proposal to commit suicide, but he backed out in a day or two. I am glad now that Will is alive, and I am glad that I am alive, even with the prospect of years of imprisonment before me. But I will cheerfully endure for his sake, and yet for the last ten months his influence has so completely controlled me, both body and soul, that if I have done right, he should have the credit for my good deeds, and if I have done wrong, he should be blamed for the mischief, as I have not been myself at all, but a part of him, and happy to merge my individuality with his. Olmsted was tried privately in July. No new points were brought out. He was sentenced to the criminal insane asylum. Shortly afterward, while still in the prison at Chicago, he wrote to Dr. Talbot, As you have been interested in my case from a scientific point of view, there is a little something more I might tell you about myself, but which I have withheld, because I was ashamed to admit certain facts and features of my deplorable weakness. Among the few sexual perverts I have known, I have noticed that all are in the habit of often closing the mouth with the lower lip protruding beyond the upper, usually due to arrested development of upper jaw. I noticed the peculiarity in Mr. Clifford before we became intimate, and I have often caught myself at the trick. Before that operation my testicles would swell and become sore and hurt me, and have seemed to do so since just as a man will sometimes complain that his amputated leg hurts him. Then, too, my breasts would swell, and about the nipples would become hard and sore and red. Since the operation, there has never been a day that I have been free from sharp shooting pains down the abdomen to the scrotum, being worse at the base of the penis. Now that my fate is decided, I will say that really my passion for Mr. Clifford is on the wane but I don't know whether the improvement is permanent or not. I have absolutely no passion for other men, and have begun to hope now that I can yet outlive my desire for Clifford, or at least control it. I have not yet told of this improvement in my condition because I wished people to still think I was insane, so that I would be sure to escape being sent to the penitentiary. I know I was insane at the time I tried to kill both Clifford and myself, and feel that I don't deserve such a dreadful punishment as being sent to a state prison. However, I think it was that operation and my subsequent illness that caused my insanity rather than passion for Clifford. I should very much like to know if you really consider sexual perversion an insanity. When discharged from the criminal insane asylum, Olmsted returned to Chicago and demanded his testicles from the city postmaster, whom he accused of being a systemized conspiracy against him. He asserted that the postmaster was one of the chief agents in a plot against him, dating from before the castration. He was then sent to the Cook Insane Hospital. It seems probable that a condition of paranoia is now firmly established. End of Chapter 3, Part 11 Recording by Kirk Ziegler, Ogden, Utah Voiceovers by Kirk.com Chapter 3 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Geller. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 3, Sexual Inversion in Men, Part 12. The following cases are all bisexual, attraction being felt toward both sexes, usually in predominant degree toward the male. History 27. H.C., American, aged 28, of independent means, unmarried, the elder of two children. His history may best be given in his own words. I am on both sides distantly of English ancestry, the first colonists of my name having come to New England in 1630. Both my mother's and my father's family have been prolific in soldiers and statesmen. My mother's contributed one president to the United States. So far as I am aware, none of my antecedents have betrayed mental vagaries, except a maternal uncle who, from overstudy, became for a year insane. I am a graduate of two universities with degrees in arts and medicine. After a year as physician in a hospital, I relinquished medicine altogether to follow literature, a predilection since early boyhood. I awoke to sexual feeling at the age of seven, when, at a small private school, glimpsing bare thighs above the stockings of girl schoolmates, I dimly exulted. This fetishism, as it grew more definite, centered at last upon the thighs and then the whole person of one girl in particular. My first sexually tinged dream was of her, that while she stood near I impinged my penis upon a red-hot anvil and then, in beatific self-immolation, exhibited the charred stump to her wondering, round eyes. This love, however, abated at the coming of a new girl to the school, who, not more beautiful, but more buxom, made stronger appeal to my nascent sexuality. One afternoon, in the loft of her father's stable, she induced me to disrobe, herself setting the example. The erection our mutual handlings produced on me was without conscious impulse. I felt only a childish curiosity on beholding our genital difference. But the episode started extravagant whimsies, one of which persistently obsessed me. With these obviously compensatory differences, why might not the girl and I affect some sort of copulation? This fantasy, drawn exclusively from that unique experience, charmed with its grotesqueness only, for at that time my sense of sex was but inchoate, and my knowledge of it was nothing. The bizarre conceit, submitted to the equally ignorant girl and approved, was borne to the paternal hayloft, and there, with much bungling, brought to surprising and pleasurable consummation. In the four ensuing years I repeated the act not seldom with this girl and with others. When I was eleven, my sister and I were taken by our parents to Europe, where we remained six years, attending school each winter in a different city and, during the summer, traveling in various countries. Abroad my lust was glutted to the full. The amenable girl playmate was ubiquitous, whom I plied with ardor, at Swiss hotels, German watering places, French pensions, where not? Toward puberty I first repaired at times to prostitutes. Masturbation, excepting a few experiments, I never resorted to. Few of my schoolmates avowedly practiced it. Of homosexuality, my sole hearing was through the classics, where, with no long pondering, I opined it merely our modern camaraderie, poetically aggrandized, masquerading in antique habiliments and phraseology. It never came home to me. It attuned to no tone in the scale of my sympathies. I possessed no touchstone for transmitting the recitals of those ambiguous amours into fiery messages. The relation to my own sex was, intellectually, an occasional friendship devoid of strong affection. Physically, a mild antagonism. The naked body of a man was slightly repellent. 
Statues of women evoked both carnal and aesthetic response. Of men, no emotions whatever, save a deepening of that native antipathy. Similarly, in paintings, in literature, the drama, the men served but as foils for the delicious maidens who visited my aerial seraglios and lapped me in roseate dreamings. In my eighteenth year we returned to America, where I entered the university. The course of my love of women was now a little erratic. Normal connection began to lose fascination. As long ago I had formulated untutored the rationale of coitus, so now imagination, groping in the dark, conceived a fresh fillip for the appetite, cunilictus. But this, though for a while quite adequate, soon ceased to gratify. At this juncture, Christmas of my first college year, I was appointed editor of a small magazine, an early stricture of whose new conduct was paucity of love stories. Such improvident neglect was in keeping with my altering view of women, a view accorded to me by self-dissipation of the glamour through which they had been wont to appear. I had wandered somehow behind the scenes, and beheld no footlights of sex intervening, the once so radiant fairies resolved into a rattled humanity, as likable as ever, but desirable no longer. Soon after this the Oscar Wilde case was bruiting about. The newspaper accounts of it, while illuminating, flashed upon me no light of self-revelation. They only amended some idle conjectures as to certain mystic vices I had heard whispered of. Here and there a newspaper illusion still too recondite was painstakingly clarified by an effeminate fellow-student who, I fancy now, would have shown no reluctance had I begged him to adduce practical illustration. I purchased, too, photographs of Oscar Wilde, scrutinizing them under the unctuous auspices of the same emasculate and blandiloquent mentor. If my interest in Oscar Wilde arose from any other emotion than the rather morbid curiosity then almost universal, I was not conscious of it. Erotic dreams, precluded hitherto by coition, came now to beset me. The persons of these dreams were, and still are, invariably women, with this one remembered exception. I dreamed that Oscar Wilde, one of my photographs of him incarnate, approached me with a buffoon languishment and perpetrated fellatio, an act verbally expounded shortly before by my oracle. For a month or more, recalling this dream disgusted me. The few subsequent endeavors, tentative and half-hearted, to repristinate my venery were foredoomed, partly because I had feared they were, to failure. Erection was incomplete, ejaculation without pleasure. There seemed a fallacy in this behavior. Why coitus without sensual desire for it? No sense of duty impelled me, nor dread of sexual aberration. The explanation is this. Attraction to females was not expunged, simply sublimed. My imagination, no longer importing women from observation, created its own delectable sirens, grown exacting and transcendental, petitioned reality in vain. Substance had receded for good now, and soon even these tormenting shadows of it became even dimmer and dimmer, until they too at length faded into nothingness. The antipodes of the sexual sphere turned more and more toward the light of my tolerance. Inversion, till now stained with a slight repugnance, became aesthetically colorless at last, and then delicately retinted, at first solely with pity for its victims, but finally the color deepening with half-conscious inclination to attach it to myself as a remote contingency. This revolution, however, was not without external impetus. The prejudiced tone of a book I was reading, Kraft Ebbing's Psychopathia Sexualis, by prompting resentment led me on to sympathy. My championing, purely abstract though it was to begin with, nonetheless involved my looking at things with eyes hypothetically inverted, an orientation for the sake of argument. After a while, insensibly and at no one moment, hypothesis merged into reality. 
I myself was inverted. That occasional and fictitious inversion had never, I believe, superposed this true inversion. Rather, a true inversion, those many years dormant, had simply responded finally to a stimulus strong and prolonged enough as a man awakens when he is loudly called. In presenting myself thus sexually transformed, I do not aver having had at the outset any definitive inclination. The instinct, so freshly evolved, remained for a while obscure. Its primary expression was a feebly sensuous interest in the physical character of boys, in their feminine resemblances especially. To this interest I opposed no discountenance, for wantonness with women under many and diverse conditions, having long ago medicined my sexual conscience to lethargy, no access of reasons came to me now for its refreshment. On the other hand, intellectual delight in the promises of the new world, as well as sensuality, conduced to its deliberate exploration. Still for a year the yearning settled with true lust upon no object more concrete than youths whose only habitation was my fancy. A young surgeon, having read my copy of Psychopathia Sexualis, fell one evening to discussing inverts with such relish that I inquired ingenuously if he himself was one. He colored, whether confirmatively or otherwise I could not guess, in spite of his vehement no. Presently he very subtly recanted his denial. But to his counter-question I maintained my own no, lest he propose some sexual act, the point of aesthetics of my developing inversion would not yet concede, the boys of my imagination being still predominant. One evening soon after this, he convoyed me to several of the cafés where inverts are accustomed to foregather. These trysting places were much alike, a long hall with a sparse orchestra at one end, marble-topped tables lining the walls, leaving the floor free for dancing. Round the tables sat boys and youths, Adonises both by art and nature, ready for a drink or a chat with the chance Samaritan, and shyly importunate for the pleasures for which upstairs were small rooms to let. One of the boys, supported by the orchestra, sang the jewel song out of Faust. His voice had the limpid, treble purity of a clarinet, and his face the beauty of an angel. The song concluded, we invited him to our table, where he sat sipping neat brandy as he mockingly encountered my book-begotten queries. The boy prostitutes gracing these halls, he apprised us, bore fanciful names, some of well-known actresses, others of heroes in fiction, his own being Dorian Gray. Rivals, he complained, had assumed the same appellation, but he was the original Dorian. The others were jealous impostors. His curly hair was golden. His cheeks were pink, his lips coral red, parted incessantly to reveal the glistening pearliness of his teeth. Yet, though deeming him the beautifulest youth in the world, I experienced no sexual interest either in him or in the other boys, who indeed were all beautiful. Beauty was their chief asset. Dorian, further, dilated on the splendor of his female attire satin corsets low-cut evening gowns etc donned on gala nights to display his gleaming shoulders and dimpled plump white arms thus arrayed he bantered he would bewitch even me now so impassive until i would throw myself in tears of happiness into his loving embrace my first venture upon fallacia was a month later with the young surgeon i confessed the whim to try it and he acceded though this nauseous and fatiguing act very imperfectly performed was prompted mostly by curiosity there arose soon a passional hankering for repetition in short a penance for fellatio grew slowly from that night of mawkish fiasco and waxed eventually into a sovereign want perhaps miscarriage of that initiatory experiment was due to precipitance incubation of my perverse instinct being not yet complete 
A hiatus of a month now supervened, in which, while further fallacia was not attempted, my mind came always nearer to a reconcilement with the grossness of the act, and began to discover for its creatures some correlation in pretty boys beheld in the flesh. One evening, in Broadway, I conceived suddenly a full-fledged desire for a youth issuing from an hotel as I passed. Our glances met and dwelled together. At a shop window he first accosted me. He was an invert. With him, in his room at the hotel whence I had seen him emerge, I passed an apocalyptic night. Thereafter commerce with boys only in the spirit ceased to be an end. The images were carnalized, stepped from their framework into the streets. That boy, that god out of the machine, I see him clearly, his brown, curling hair, his eyes blue as the sea, his chest both arched and so plump, his rounded arms, his taper waist, the graceful swell of his hips and full snowy thighs. I recall as of yesterday the dimples in his knees, the slenderness of his ankles, the softness of his little feet, with insteps pink like the inside of a shell. How I gloated over his ample roundness, his rich undulations. In the last eight years I have performed fellatio, never pedicatio, with more than three hundred men and boys. My preference is for boys between fifteen and twenty, refined, pretty, girlish, and themselves homosexual. Personally, barring this love for males, I am in all ways masculine, given to outdoor sports and to smoking and drinking moderately. In appearance, I am but a boy of eighteen. My face and figure are generally considered beautiful. I am clean-shaven, with black curling hair, red cheeks, and brown eyes, features delicate and regular, bodium of medium height, everywhere practically hairless. By years of training I have attained alike great strength and classic proportions, the muscular contours smoothly rounded with adipose tissue. My hands and feet are small. My penis, though perfectly shaped, is rather enormous erect ten and a half inches in length seven and a quarter inches in circumference some abetment of my apostasy from orthodox methods was no doubt this hypertrophy of the penis which already in my twentieth year had acquired its present redundance rendering coitus impracticable with most women i essayed and painful where insertion was effected since falling heir to inversion a unique recurrence of normal desire six years ago persuaded me to attempt coitus with eleven or twelve prostitutes and strangely enough with much of the old-time salacity and full erection but as it chanced always with too great disparity of parts for success a certain preciosity in the manner of this communication may be put down partly to the nature of the literary avocations with which the writer is by preference occupied, and partly, no doubt more fundamentally, to the special character of his predominantly aesthetic temperament, an attraction to the exotic. An attraction for exotic experiences will not, however, suffice to account for the rather late development of homosexual tendencies, a late development which may be held to place this case in the retarded group of inverts. H. C. has himself pointed out to me that his aversion to women, beginning to appear in the eighteenth year, was already well pronounced before he had ever heard definitely of specific homosexual acts, and fully a year before he experienced the slightest sexual interest in men or boys. Moreover, while it is true that the actual tendency to homosexual attraction only appeared after he had read Kraft Ebbing and come in contact with inverts, such influences would not suffice to change the sexual nature of a normally constituted man. It may be added that H.C. is not attracted to normal males. As regards his moral attitude, he remarks, I have no scruples in the indulgence of my passion. I perceive the moral objections advanced, but how speculative they are and constructive, while immediately inversion is the source of so much good. He looks upon the whole sexual question as largely a matter of taste. I regard the foregoing case as of considerable interest. 
It presents what is commonly supposed to be a very common type of inversion, Oscar Wilde being the supreme exemplar, in which a heterosexual person apparently becomes homosexual by the exercise of intellectual curiosity and aesthetic interest. In reality, the type is far from common. Indeed, an intellectual curiosity and an aesthetic interest, strong enough even apparently to direct the sexual impulse in any new channel, are themselves far from common. Moreover, a critical reading of this history suggests that the apparent control over the sexual impulse by reason is merely a superficial phenomenon. Here, as ever, reason is but a tool in the hands of the passions. The apparent causes are really the results. We are witnessing the gradual emergence of a retarded homosexual impulse. History 28. English, aged 40, surgeon. Sexual experiences began early, about the age of 10, when a companion induced him to play at intercourse with their sisters. He experienced no pleasure. A little later a servant girl began to treat him affectionately, and at last called him into her bedroom when she was partially undressed, fondled and kissed his member, and taught him to masturbate her. On subsequent occasions she attempted a simulation of intercourse which gave her satisfaction, but failed to induce emission in him. On returning to school, mutual masturbation was practiced with schoolfellows, and the first emission took place at the age of fourteen. On leaving school, he became a slave to the charms of women, and had frequent coitus about the age of seventeen, but he preferred masturbating girls, and especially in persuading girls of good position, to whom the experience was entirely novel, to allow him to take liberties with them. At twenty-five he became engaged, and mutual masturbation was practiced to excess during the engagement. After marriage, connection generally took place twice every twenty-four hours until pregnancy. At this time, he writes, I stayed at the house of an old schoolfellow, due of my lovers of old days. There were so many guests that I shared my friend's bedroom. The sight of his body gave rise to lustful feelings, and when the light was out I stole across to his bed. He made no objection, and we passed the night in mutual masturbation. We passed the next fortnight together, and I never took the same pleasure in coitus with my wife, though I did my duty. She died five years later, and I devoted myself heart and soul to my friend until his death by accident last year. Since then I have lost all interest in life. I am indebted for this case to a well-known English alienist who remarks that the patient is fairly healthy to look at, but with neurasthenia and tendency to melancholia and neurotic temperament. The body is masculine and pubic hair abundant. One testicle shows wasting. Histories 29 and 30 I give the following narrative in the words of an intimate friend of one of the cases in question. My attention was first drawn to the study of inversion though I then regarded all forms of it as depraving and abominable, at a public school, where in our dormitory a boy of fifteen initiated his select friends into the secrets of mutual masturbation, which he had learned from his brother, a midshipman. I gave no heed to this at the time, though I remembered it in after years when immersed in Plato, Lucretius, and the Epicurean writers. But my attention was riveted to it at the age of twenty, when I spent a holiday with A, a companion with whom I was, and still am, on terms of great friendship. We enjoyed many things in common, studied together, and discussed most unconventional matters, but not this. Previously, we had always occupied separate sleeping apartments. On this occasion, we were abroad in a country place and were compelled to put up with what we could get. We not only had to share a room, but a bed. I was not surprised at his throwing his arm over me, as I knew he was extraordinarily attached to me, and I had always felt a brute for not returning his affection so warmly. But I was surprised when later I awoke to find him occupied in fellatio and endeavoring to obtain my response. Had it been anyone else, I should have resented strongly such a liberty, and our acquaintance would have ended, but I cared for him too well, though never very demonstrative. This episode led to discussion of the topic. He told me that his sexual strength was great, 
that he had tested it in many ways, and that it was essential to his well-being that he should have satisfaction in some way. He loathed prostitution and considered it degrading. He felt physically attracted to some women and intellectually to others, but the two elements were never combined, and though he had been intimate with a few, he felt that it was not right to them, as he could not marry them because he held too high an ideal of marriage. He had always felt attracted to his own sex, and had kept up a platonic friendship with a college chum, X, to whom I knew he was passionately attached for some years. Both considered it perfectly moral, and both felt better for it. Both abhor pedicatio. X, however, would never discuss the subject, and seemed half ashamed of it. A, on the other hand, though showing a grave self-respect in all things else, feels no shame, though he says he would never discuss it except with close friends or if asked for private advice. A is the elder child of a military officer. His parents were twenty-one and nineteen, respectively, at the time of his birth. Both parents are healthy, and the two children, both boys, have good constitutions, though the elder has the better. He is of medium height and slender limbs, proud carriage, handsome and intellectual face, classic Greek type, excellent complexion, charming manners, and good temper. The penis is large, the foreskin very short. He is fond of philosophy, natural science, history, and literature. He is reflective and patient rather than smart, but strong-willed and very active when roused, never resting till he has accomplished what he wants, even if this takes years. He sings excellently and is fond of cycling, boating, swimming, and mountain climbing. He enjoys excellent health and has never had a day's illness since he was twelve years of age. He says the only time he cannot sleep has been when in bed with someone who could not or would not satisfy him. He requires satisfaction at least once a week, twice or thrice in the hot season. He never smokes nor drinks beer or spirits. He is still single, but believes that marriage would meet all his needs. X is also an oldest child, of young and healthy parents between 21 and 24 at his birth, of different class, father a builder. He is of pleasing but not handsome appearance, very sensitive, very neat, and methodical in all things, not very strong-willed and very reserved to women. He is a very studious disposition, especially fond of philosophy, politics, and natural science, a good musician takes moderate exercise, but rather easily fatigued, is generally healthy, but not over-strong. He is a vegetarian and was brought up as a free thinker. Until two years ago, he was never attracted toward a girl. Indeed, he disliked girls, but he is now engaged. For about 18 months, he has relinquished homosexuality, but has suffered from dreams, bad digestion, and peevishness since. He thinks the only remedy is marriage, which he is pushing on. He regards homosexuality as quite natural and normal, though his desires are not strong, and once a fortnight has always satisfied him. He was led to the practice by the reasoning of A, and because he felt a certain vague need and discomforted him. He thinks it a matter of temperament and not to be discussed except by scientists. He says he could never perform it except with his dearest friend, whose request he could not resist. He has a long foreskin, flesh like a woman's, and is well proportioned. Both men are ardent for social reform, the one actively, the other passively engaged in it. Both also regard the law as to homosexuality as absurd and demoralizing. They also think that the law prohibiting polygamy is largely the cause of prostitution, as many women are prevented from living honest lives and being cared for by someone, and many men could marry one woman for physical satisfaction and another for intellectual. They were devoted to each other when I first knew them. They are still friends, but separated by distance. Both are exceedingly honorable, and the latter is truthful to a fault." According to later information, X had married and his homosexual tendencies were almost completely in abeyance, partly, perhaps, owing to the fact that he now lives quietly in the country. 
a has surprised his friends by his ardent attachment to a lady of about his own age to whom he has become engaged he declares that he loves this woman better than any man but nevertheless he still feels strong passion for his men friends it is evident that the homosexual tendency in a is distinctly more pronounced than in his friend x as is found more often in bisexual than in homosexual persons, he is of predominantly masculine type, possesses great vitality, and desires to exert all his faculties. He has a sound nervous system and is very free of all nervousness. He has written a scientific treatise and can study undisturbed amid violent noises. His voice is manly in singing deep bass. He can whistle. He is not vain, though well-formed, and his hands are delicate. His favorite color is green. The demonstrative warmth of his affection for his friends is the chief feminine trait noted in him. He rarely dreams and has never had an erotic dream. This he explains by saying, earlier than Freud, that all dreams not caused by physical conditions are wish dreams, and as he always satisfies his sexual needs at once, with a friend or by masturbation, his sexual needs have no opportunity of affecting his subconscious life. There may be some doubt as to the classification of the two foregoing cases. They are not personally known to me. The following case, with which I have been acquainted for many years, I regard as clearly a genuine example of bisexuality. History 31. Englishman. Independent means. Aged 52. Married. His ancestry is of a complicated character. Some of his mother's forefathers in the last and earlier centuries are supposed to have been inverted. He remembers liking the caresses of his father's footmen when he was quite a little boy. He dreams indifferently about men and women, and has strong sexual feeling for women. Can copulate, but does not insist on this act. There is a tendency to refined, voluptuous pleasure. He has been married for many years, and there are several children by the marriage. He is not particular about the class or age of the men he loves. He feels with regard to older men as a woman does, and likes to be caressed by them. He is immensely vain of his physical beauty. He shuns pedicatio and does not much care for the sexual act, but likes long hours of voluptuous communion during which his lover admires him. He feels the beauty of boyhood. At the same time, he is much attracted by young girls. He is decidedly feminine in his dress, manner of walking, love of scents, ornaments, and fine things. His body is excessively smooth and white, the hips and buttocks rounded. Genital organs normal. His temperament is feminine, especially in vanity, irritability, and petty preoccupations. He is much preoccupied with his personal appearance and fond of admiration. On one occasion, he was photographed naked as Bacchus. He is physically and morally courageous. He has a genius for poetry and speculation, with a tendency to mysticism. He feels the discord between his love for men and society, and also between it and his love for his wife. He regards it as, in part at least, hereditary and inborn in him. History 32. C.R., physician, age 38. Nationality, Irish, with a Portuguese strain. My mother came of an old Quaker family. I was quite unaware of sexual differences until I was about fourteen, as I was carefully kept separate from my sisters, and, although from time to time strange longings which I did not understand possessed me, I was a virgin in thought indeed until that period of life. When I was fourteen, a cousin some years older than myself came to stay with us and shared my bed. To my surprise, he took hold of my penis and rubbed it for a time when a most pleasant feeling seized me and increased until a discharge came out of my organ. He then asked me to do the same to him. We frequently repeated the process during the following month. I was quite unaware of any harm resulting. The same year I went to school, but none of my schoolmates for some time even suggested such actions, until a friend staying with us for the holidays one day in the bathroom repeated the process and pressed his penis between my thighs when a similar discharge took place. I shortly found out that several of my school friends and male cousins had the same desires, and an elder brother of my first introducer into sexuality repeatedly spent the night with me, when we would amuse ourselves in a similar way. A little later, 
my mother being away from home, I shared my father's bed, and he took my penis in his hand and pulled my foreskin back. I, in return, took hold of his and found that he had an erection. I proceeded to rub him when he stopped me and told me that I should not do so, that when I was a little older I should love a woman to do it, and that if I did not rub myself and allow the other boys to do so, I would enjoy myself much more. I am quite certain that my father was inverted, as he frequently, if sleeping with me, used to press my naked body against his, and he always had a strong erection. On one occasion he rubbed me until I had a discharge, and then, turning over on his back, made me take his penis in my hand and rub him for a few minutes. I used to jest frequently with my father, as from my seventeenth year my penis was larger than his. I will return to my father a little later. When I was seventeen, a college friend shared my bed, and when undressing he said that he envied me my penis being so much larger than his. After getting into bed, he asked me to turn on my side, and I found that he was attempting pedicatio. I was astonished at his doing so, when he informed me that next to a woman this process gave most pleasure. However, nothing resulted, and this is the only experience of pedicatio that I have ever had. When I was eighteen one evening, a college chum introduced me to a woman, and she was the first I ever had connection with. We went behind some rocks, and she took hold of my penis and pressed it into her body, lying against me. My father evidently suspected me when I came home, and a few days afterward told me that it was very dangerous to have anything to do with women, that I should wait until I was older, that when a boy became a man he ought to have a woman occasionally, and that if I ever had a nasty disease I should promptly tell him so that I could be properly cured. At college I found several chums who were fond of sharing my bed and indulging in mutual masturbation, pressing our bodies together face to face until there was mutual discharge, but never again anyone who tried anal connection. A short time afterward I was in Brussels and I paid my first visit to a brothel, a place close to the cathedral. I picked a girl of about eighteen from eight naked beauties paraded for my choice. She was avaricious and demanded ten francs. I had paid twenty for my room and had only two left. I wanted her to play with me, but she only seized the penis and pulled me to her with such vigorous action that I discharged very rapidly. I was so disgusted with the result that I masturbated when I returned to my boarding house. A year later I paid Portugal a visit, and my friends there frequently brought me to brothels and also introduced me to ladies of easy virtue. I had connection with them. The Portuguese prostitutes never suggested anything unnatural, and in no instance did a male approach me for sexual purposes. When I became a medical student, I used to visit a Turkish bath frequently. On one occasion I playfully slapped a friend on the buttocks, when my father, who was present, told me not to do it so as it was not proper conduct in public, that if I liked to do so to him or one or two others it was no harm in private. Until I was twenty-one, in the bath my father always covered his penis from my view, but after I attained my majority he always exposed himself and repeatedly showed me pictures of naked women. He also taught me the use of the condom. In my twenty-fourth year, a tall, handsome man who used to frequent the baths one day sat down beside me and playfully knocked my toes with his. He then pressed his naked thigh against mine, and a little later in the cooling room slipped his hand under my sheet and grasped my penis. He then asked me to meet him a few days later in the baths, saying I would be pleased with what he would do. I kept the appointment, and he took me into the hottest room, where we lay on the floor. In a few minutes he turned on his side and threw one of his legs across me. I got frightened and jumped up. He had a powerful erection, but I refused to lie down again, although he pulled his foreskin back to excite my desires. I was afraid of being surprised by another bather. Twice on future occasions I met this man, and he made advances. I believe that I would have yielded then if we had met at a private house. Shortly afterward I met an elderly gentleman at the baths, who also made advances to me, but from fear I resisted him. I also disliked him as he had a foul breath and bad teeth. Besides, I was now able to go to the continent and enjoy female charms to my heart's desire. 
after qualification i joined the army in south africa and to my astonishment found many of my comrades fond of male society one officer who had been wounded shared my bedroom at a military hospital and when undressing frequently admired my penis we used to play with each other until we had powerful erections but we never masturbated or tried any unnatural vice i used to have connection with women as frequently as i could and i visited the turkish baths and found that several clients were abnormal including one of the masseurs the latter enjoyed playing with my penis kissing and tickling me i married at twenty-eight my married life has been normal and my wife and i are still in love with each other we have had several children my last sexual experiences have been in australia once in sydney at the baths a fellow bather playfully began tickling me when i had an erection he grasped my penis i jumped up and he asked me to do anything that i liked with him i refused once on board a coasting steamer a fellow passenger used to expose himself posing as a statue we became very familiar and he wanted me to spend a night with him i also refused his offers i am very healthy and strong fond of riding fishing and shooting i lead a very active life i am neither musician nor artist but fond of hearing music and i admire works of art in person i am six feet high inclined to fat my body is very strong my penis is six inches long in repose and eight in erection i can without fatigue discharge twice in the night and have connection at least twice a week my scrotum is tense and both testicles large i am rather slow at discharging i have never had any desire to have connection with any other woman since marriage but several times i have met men who attracted me i have a friend another doctor who is very familiar with me and if we spend a night together we will play with each other i have a great desire for him to circumcise me we have never indulged in anything beyond feeling or pressing our bodies together like schoolboys my favorite color is green my erotic dreams when i have any are of my wife or a male lover sexual inversion is more widespread than is popularly supposed and i have never had any twinge of conscience after any of my affairs I regard the homosexual instinct as quite natural, and, except in regard to my wife, it is stronger in my case than the heterosexual instinct. I have never initiated a youth into the sexual life or had any desire to seduce a girl. Boys under seventeen or persons of lower social class have no attraction for me. End of chapter 3, part 12 Recording by Tom Geller Oberlin, Ohio, Tom Geller dot com t o m g e l l e r dot com chapter three of studies in the psychology of sex volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Tom Geller Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis Chapter 3, Sexual Inversion in Men, Part 13 History 33 M. O., thirty years of age, born in the United States, of English father and mother whose father was Scotch, the rest of his ancestry being English of long standing in America, with a very little admixture of Dutch blood. He is five feet eight inches in height, and has brown hair and eyes. No hereditary troubles so far are known. In childhood, for some time, quote, threatened with cholera, end quote, is subject to tonsillitis and a stubborn, though not severe, form of indigestion induced by sedentary habits. He is of quick, nervous temperament. Has an aversion from most outdoor sports, but a great aesthetic attraction to nature. Highly educated. As far back as he can remember, he lived in a house from which his parents removed when he was four years old. Before this removal, he remembers two distinctly sexual experiences. A cousin five years older was in the bathroom, seated, and M. O. was feeling his sexual organs. His mother called him out. On another occasion, he was in a wagon house with a girl of his own age. They were lying on a carriage seat attempting intercourse. 
the girl's older sister came in and found them. She said, I am going to tell Mama. You know, she said, for you not to do that any more. With each of these clear memories comes the strong impression that it was but one among many. Five years ago, Emmo met a man of his own age who had lived in that neighborhood at the same time. Comparing notes, they found that nearly all the small children in it had been given to such practices. The neighborhood was a thoroughly, quote, respectable, end quote, middle class one. From it, Emmo removed to another of just about the same character and lived there until he was eleven years old. Of this period, his memories are very fresh and abundant. With a single exception, all the children between five and fourteen years of age appear to have indulged freely in promiscuous sexual play. In little companies of from four to twelve, they went where trees or long grass hid them from observation and exhibited their persons to one another. Sometimes also they handled one another, but not in the way of masturbation. Of this last, M. O. was wholly ignorant. Sometimes when two or three were together, intercourse was attempted. In M. O.'s case, there was eager sexual curiosity and a more or less keen desire, but actual contact brought no great satisfaction. On two or three occasions, girls practiced fellatio, and he then reciprocated with conolictus, but without pleasure. In all these plays, he is sure that girls took the initiative as often as boys did. During all this period, M. O. had now one girl sweetheart and now another. This was conventional among the children and was fostered by the banter of older persons. M. O.'s sexual curiosity was certainly greater in regard to the opposite sex. At this time, however, his homosexual interests appeared. With a boy two or more years older, he frequently went to some hiding place where they looked at each other's organs and handled them. He and another boy were once in an abandoned garden, and they took off all their clothes the better to examine each other. The other boy then offered to kiss M.O.'s fundament and did so. It caused a surprisingly keen and distinctly sexual sensation, the first sexual shock that he can remember experiencing. He refused to reciprocate, however, when asked. Toward the end of this period there was a new and increasing development of another sort, not recognized then as at all sexual in character. He began to feel toward certain boys in a way very different and much keener than he had done thus far toward girls, although at the time he made no comparisons. For instance, there was a boy whom he considered very pretty. They visited each other often and spent long times playing together. In school they looked and looked at each other until delicious, uncontrollable giggling spells came on. Sexual matters were never discussed or thought of. These experiences were, in their way, very sentimental and ideal. Emmo is sure that with himself the main consideration was always the other boy's beauty. He began to recall with great fondness a certain much older and very handsome youth who had lived near him in the first neighborhood, and had at the time shown him various little friendly attentions. He seldom saw him now, and hardly sought to do so, yet was immensely pleased by a casual word or look from him in the schoolyard, and much interested when other people spoke of him. A cousin about two years younger than M. O. often visited him and slept with him. They were very fond of each other, and handled each other's organs. When M. O. was about eleven years of age, the family removed to a distant neighborhood where there were almost no children of his own age, and where any association with those in the one he just left was practically impossible. From this time until the changes of puberty were well under way, his sexual life contrasted strongly in its solitude with the former promiscuity. He remembers liking to wrestle with two or three schoolboys and get their heads between his legs. He thinks they were not aware of his sexual impulses. He flirted, consciously flirted, with certain schoolgirls, but never even suggested anything sexual to them. He read a few family medical books. One day, lying on an old, uneven couch, innocently enough at first, he induced a new and delicious sensation altogether different from any he had ever dreamed of, something far beyond the satisfaction of mere curiosity. He repeated the thing, and before long produced emissions. Masturbation soon followed. Certain days he would perform the act two or three times, but again he would avoid it for days. 
He began at once to fight the tendency and felt very guilty and very ashamed for indulging it. He prayed for help and at times wept over his failures to break the habit so quickly formed. For a certain period, after two or three years, he seemed to have succeeded, but he observed that he had intense erotic dreams with copious emissions regularly every eight days. Just then certain newspaper advertisements fell under his eye, and these persuaded him that he had produced in himself a diseased condition. He never resorted to the remedies advertised, but he was discouraged in his efforts to overcome the bad habit and since the evil effects appeared to consist only in the seminal losses, he concluded that he might as well have the greater enjoyment of masturbation. For a short time he remembers that he had an intense but revolting interest in the sexual organs of animals, especially horses. The males were much more interesting. Gradually he began to develop, entirely from within, the ideal of a male comrade, a beautiful, emotional boy between whom and himself there might exist a powerful, romantic passion. He lay for hours dreaming of this and inventing thrilling situations. Suddenly at church he became acquainted with the very youth, Edmund, who seemed to satisfy all his longings. M. O. was then sixteen and a half and Edmund fifteen. A real wooing ensued, Edmund finally yielding to the physical appeals of M.O. after several fits of misgiving. The yielding was, in the end, complete, however. The two spent night after night together, enjoying intercrural intercourse and sometimes mutual masturbation. Their parents may have been slightly uneasy at times, but the connection continued uninterruptedly for a year and a half or more. In the meantime, M. O. occasionally had relations with other boys, but never wavered in his real preference for Edmund. For girls he had no sexual desire whatever, though he was much associated with them. Then M. O. and Edmund went to college at different places, but they met in vacations and wrote frequent and ardent love letters. Both had genuine attacks of lovesickness and of jealousy. As M. O. looks back on this first love passion, he can by no means regret it. It doubtless had great formative influence. After the first year at college, Edmund transferred to another school farther away from M. O. and the opportunities for meeting became rarer, but their affection was maintained and the intercourse resumed whenever it was possible. Gradually, however, Edmund became interested in women and finally married. M. O. also formed relations repeatedly with college friends and occasionally with others. On the whole, M. O. preferred boys a year or two younger than himself, but as he grew older the age difference increased. At thirty he regarded himself as virtually, quote, engaged, end quote, to a youth of seventeen, one unusually mature, however, and much larger than himself. M. O. is always unhappy unless his affections have fairly free course. Life has been very disappointing to him in other respects. His greatest joys have come to him in this way. If he is able to consummate his present plan of union with the youth just referred to, he will feel that his life has been crowned by what is for him the best possible end. Otherwise, he declares, he would not care to live at all. He admires male beauty passionately. Feminine beauty he perceives objectively, as he would any design of flowing curves and delicate coloring, but it has no sexual charm for him whatever. Women have put themselves in his way repeatedly, but he finds himself more and more irritated by their specifically feminine foibles. With men generally, he is much more patient and sympathetic. The first literature that appealed to him was Plato's Dialogues, first read at twenty years of age. Until then he had not known but what he stood alone in his peculiarity. He read what he could of classic literature. He enjoys Pater, appreciating his attitude toward his own sex. Four or five years later he came across Rafalovich's book, and ever since has felt a real debt of gratitude to its author. M. O. has no wish to injure society at large. As an individual, he holds that he has the same right to be himself that anyone else has. He thinks that while boys of from 13 to 15 might possibly be rendered inverts, 
those who reach sixteen without it cannot be bent that way. They may be devoted to an invert enough in other ways to yield him what he wishes sexually, but they will remain essentially normal themselves. His observations are based on about thirty homosexual relationships that have lasted various lengths of time. M. O. feels strongly the poetic and elevated character of his principal homosexual relationships, but he shrinks from appearing too sentimental. With regard to the traces of feminism in inverts, he writes, Up to the age of eleven I associated much with a cousin five years older, the one referred to above, and took great delight in a game we often played in which I was a girl, a never-ending romance, a non-sexual love story. Somewhat later and until puberty I took great delight in acting, but generally took female roles, wearing skirts, shawls, beads, wigs, headdresses. When I was about thirteen my family began to make fun of me for it. I played secretly for a while, and then the desire for it left, never to return. There still lingers, however, a minor interest which began before puberty in valentines. My feeling for them is much like my feeling for flowers. Before I reached puberty I was sometimes called a sissy by my father. Such taunts humiliated me more than anything else has ever done. After puberty my father no longer applied the term, and gradually other persons ceased to tease me that way. The sting of it lasted, though, and led me more than once to ask intimate friends, both men and women, if they considered me at all feminine. Every one of them has been very emphatically of the opinion that my rational life is distinctively masculine, being logical, impartial, skeptical. One or two have suggested that I have a finer discrimination than most men, and that I take care of my room somewhat as a woman might, though this does not extend to the style of decorations. One man said that I lacked sympathy with certain, quote, grosser manifestations of masculine character, such as smoking, end quote. Some women think me unusually observing of women's dress. My own is by no means effeminate. In a muscular way, I have average strength, but am supple far beyond what is usual. If trained for it early, I believe I would have made a good contortionist. I have never had the least inclination to use tobacco, generally take neither tea nor coffee, and seldom any liquor, never malt liquors. The dessert is always the best part of the meal. These tastes I attribute largely to my sedentary life. When out camping I observed a marked change in the direction of heartier foods and mild stimulants. My physical courage has never been put to the test, but I observe that others appear to count on it. I am very aggressive in matters of religious, political, social opinion. In moral courage I am either reckless or courageous. I do not know which. I am perhaps a better whistler than most men. When I was quite little, my grandmother taught me to do certain kinds of fancy work, and I continued to do a little from time to time until I was twenty-four. Then I became irritated over a piece that troubled me, put it in the fire, and have not wanted to touch any since. As a pet economy, I continue to do nearly all of my own mending. I have a decided aversion for much jewelry. My aestheticism is very pronounced as compared with most of the men with whom I associate, although I have never been able to give it much scope. It makes for cleanliness, order, and general good taste. My dress is economical and by no means fastidious, yet it seems to be generally approved. I have been complimented often on my ability to select appropriate presents, clothing, and to arrange a room. M. O. states that he practices the love bite at times, though very gently. He often wants to pinch one who interests him sexually. He considers very silly the statement somewhere made that inverts are always liars. Very few people, he says, are perfectly honest, and the more dangerous society makes it for a man to be so, the less likely he is to be. While he himself has been unable in two or three instances to keep promises made to withhold from sexual intercourse with certain attractive individuals, he has never otherwise been guilty of untruth about his homosexual relations. The foregoing narrative was received eight years ago. 
During this interval, Emmo's health has very greatly improved. There has been a marked increase in outdoor activities and interests. Two years since, Emmo consulted a prominent specialist who performed a thorough psychoanalysis. He informed Emmo that he was less strongly homosexual than he himself supposed and recommended marriage with some young and pretty woman. He attributed the homosexual bent to Emmo's having had his, quote, nose broken, end quote, at the age of six by the birth of a younger brother, who from that time on received all the attention and petting. Emmo had continued, up to that age, very affectionate toward his mother and dependent on her. He can remember friends and neighbors commenting on it. At first Emmo was inclined to reject this suggestion of the specialist, but on long reflection he inclines to believe that it was indeed a very important factor, though not the sole one. From his later observations of children and comparisons of these with memories of his own childhood, Emmo says he is sure he was affectionate and demonstrative much beyond the average. His greatest craving was for affection, and his greatest grief the fancied belief that no one cared for him. At ten or eleven he attempted suicide for this reason. Also as a result of the psychoanalysis, but trying to eliminate the influence of suggestion, he recollects and emphasizes more the attraction he felt toward girls before the age of twelve. Had his sexual experiences subsequently proved normal, he doubts if those before twelve could be held to give evidence of homosexuality, but only of precocious nervous and sexual irritability, greatly heightened and directed by the secret practices of the children with whom he associated. He does not see why these experiences should have given him a homosexual bent any more than a heterosexual one. The psychoanalysis recalled to M.O. that during the period of early flirtation he had often kissed and embraced various girls, but likewise he recalled having observed at the same time, with some surprise, that no definitely sexual desire arose, though the way was probably open to gratify it. Such interest as did exist ceased wholly, or almost so, as the relation with Edmund developed. There was no aversion from the company of girls and women, however. The intellectual friendships were mainly with them, while the emotional ones were with boys. Very recently, Emmo spent several days with Edmund, who has been married for several years. With absolutely no sexual interest in each other, they nevertheless found a great bond of love still subsisting. Neither regrets anything of the past, but feels that the final outcome of their earlier relation has been good. Edmund's beauty is still pronounced and is remarked by others. In spite of his precocious sexuality, Emmo had from the very first an extreme disgust for obscene stories and for any association of sexual things with filthy words and anecdotes. Owing in part to this, and in part to his temperamental skepticism, he disbelieved what associates told him regarding sexual emissions, only becoming convinced when he actually experienced them and the facts of reproduction he denied indignantly until he read them in a medical work. Until he was well over twenty-five, the physical aversion from any thought of reproduction was intense. He knows other, normal, young men who have felt the same way, but he believes it would be prevented or overcome by sex education such as now being introduced in American schools. Again, as to traces of feminism, Perhaps two years ago, all impulse to give the love by disappeared suddenly. There has been lately a marked increase of dramatic interest, arising in perfectly natural ways, without any of the peculiarities noted before. The childish pleasure in Valentine's has all gone. M.O. believes that circumstances have lately been more favorable for the development of a more robust aestheticism. For some years he has heard no definite reproach for feminism, though some persons tell his friends that he is, quote, very peculiar, end quote. He forms many intimate, enduring, non-sexual friendships with both men and women, and he doubts if the peculiarity noted by others is due so much to his homosexuality as it is to his aestheticism, skepticism, and the unconventional opinions which he expresses quite indiscreetly at times. With the improvement in general health has come the changes that would be expected in food and other matters of daily life. 
Resuming his narrative at the point where the earlier communication left it, M. O. says that about a year after that time, the youth of seventeen to whom he had considered himself virtually engaged withdrew from the agreement so far as it bore on his own future, but not from the sentimental relation as it existed. Although separated most of the time by distance, the physical relation was resumed whenever they met. Subsequently, however, the young man fell in love with a young woman and became engaged to her. His physical relation with M.O. then ceased, but the friendship otherwise continues strong. Shortly after the first break in this relation, M.O. became, through the force of quite unusual circumstances, very friendly and intimate with a young woman of considerable charm. He confided to her his abnormality and was not repulsed. To others their relation probably appeared that of lovers, and a painful situation was created by the slander of a jealous woman. M. O. felt that in honor he must propose marriage to her. The young woman was non-committal, but invited M. O. to spend several months at her home. Shortly after his arrival, a sad occurrence in his own family compelled him to go away, and they did not meet again for four years. They corresponded, but less and less often. His relations with boys continued. Before his final meeting with her, he became acquainted with a woman whom he has since married. The acquaintance began in a wholly non-sentimental community of interests in certain practical affairs, and very gradually widened into an intellectual and sympathetic friendship. M. O. had no secrets from this woman. After a full and prolonged consideration of all sides of the matter, they married. Since that event, he has had no sexual relations except with his wife. With her they are not passionate, but they are animated by the strong desire for children. Of the parental instinct he had become aware several years before this. M. O. believes that no moral stigma should be attached to homosexuality until it can be proved to result from the vicious life of a free moral agent, and of this he has no expectation. He believes that much of its danger and unhappiness would be prevented by a thorough yet discreet sex education such as should be given to all children, whether normal or abnormal. End of chapter 3 Recording by Tom Geller, Oberlin, Ohio Website tomgeller.com, T-O-M-G-E-L-L-E-R dot com Chapter 4 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 4. Sexual Inversion in Women, Part 1. Homosexuality is not less common in women than in men. In the seriocomic theory of sex set forth by Aristophanes in Plato's Symposium, males and females are placed on a footing of complete equality, and, however fantastic, the theory suffices to indicate that to the Greek mind, so familiar with homosexuality, its manifestations seem just as likely to occur in women as in men. That is undoubtedly the case. Like other anomalies, indeed, in its more pronounced forms it may be less frequently met with in women. In its less pronounced forms, almost certainly, it is more frequently found. A Catholic confessor, a friend tells me, informed him that for one man who acknowledges homosexual practices there are three women. For the most part, feminine homosexuality runs everywhere a parallel course to masculine homosexuality and is found under the same conditions. It is as common in girls as in boys. It has been found, under certain conditions, to abound among women in colleges and convents and prisons, as well as under the ordinary conditions of society. Perhaps the earliest case of homosexuality recorded in detail occurred in a woman, and it was with the investigation of such a case in a woman that Westphal may be said to have inaugurated the scientific study of inversion. Moreover, inversion is as likely to be accompanied by high intellectual ability in a woman as in a man. The importance of a clear conception of inversion is indeed in some respects, under present social conditions, 
really even greater in the case of women than of men. For if, as has sometimes been said of our civilization, this is a man's world, the large proportion of able women inverts, whose masculine qualities render it comparatively easy for them to adopt masculine avocations, becomes a highly significant fact. It has been noted of distinguished women in all ages and in all fields of activity that they have frequently displayed some masculine traits. Even the first great woman in history, as she has been called by a historian of Egypt, Queen Hatshepsu, was clearly of markedly virile temperament, and always had herself represented on her monuments in masculine costume, and even with a false beard. Other famous queens have on more or less satisfactory grounds been suspected of a homosexual temperament, such as Catherine II of Russia, who appears to have been bisexual, and Queen Christina of Sweden, whose very marked masculine traits and high intelligence seem to have been combined with a definitely homosexual or bisexual temperament. Great religious and moral leaders like Madame Blavatsky and Louise Michel have been either homosexual or bisexual, or at least of pronounced masculine temperament. Great actresses from the 18th century onward have frequently been more or less correctly identified with homosexuality, as also many women distinguished in other arts. Above all, Sappho, the greatest of women poets, the peer of the greatest poets of the other sex in the supreme power of uniting art and passion, has left a name which is permanently associated with homosexuality. It can scarcely be said that opinion is unanimous in regard to Sappho, and the reliable information about her, outside the evidence of the fragments of her poems which have reached us, is scanty. Her fame has always been great. In classic times her name was coupled with Homer's, but even to antiquity she was somewhat of an enigma, and many legends grew up around her name, such as the familiar story that she threw herself into the sea for the love of Phaon. What remains clear is that she was regarded with great respect and admiration by her contemporaries, that she was of aristocratic family, that she was probably married and had a daughter, that at one time she had to take her part in political exile, and that she addressed her girlfriends in precisely similar terms to those addressed by Alcaeus to youths. We know that in antiquity, feminine homosexuality was regarded as especially common in Sparta, Lesbos, and Miletus. Horace, who was able to read Sappho's complete poems, states that the objects of her love planes were the young girls of Lesbos, while Ovid, who played so considerable a part in weaving fantastic stories round Sappho's name, never claimed that he had any basis of truth. It was inevitable that the early Christians should eagerly attack so ambiguous a figure, and Tatian, Horatio ad Grecos, chapter 52, reproached the Greeks that they honoured statues of the tribade Sappho, a prostitute who had celebrated her own wantonness and infatuation. The result is that in modern times there have been some who placed Sappho's character in a very bad light, and others who have gone to the opposite extreme in an attempt at rehabilitation. Thus W. Muir, in his History of the Language and Literature of Ancient Greece, 1854, volume 3, pages 272 to 326 and 496 to 498, dealing very fully with Sappho, is disposed to accept many of the worst stories about her, though he has no pronounced animus, and, as regards female homosexuality, which he considers to be far more venial than male homosexuality, he remarks that, quote, in modern times it has numbered among its votaries females distinguished for refinement of manners and elegant accomplishments, end quote. Bascoul, on the other hand, will accept no statements about Sappho which conflict with modern ideals of complete respectability, and even seeks to rewrite her most famous ode in accordance with the colourless literary sense which he supposes that it originally bore. J. M. F. Bascoul, La Chasse de Sappho et le Mouvement Féministe à Athènes, 1911. Vilamovitz Mullendorf, Sappho und Simonides, 1913, also represents the antiquated view, formerly championed by Welker, 
according to which the attribution of homosexuality is a charge of vice to be repudiated with indignation. Most competent and reliable authorities today, however, while rejecting the accretions of legend around Sappho's name, and not disputing her claim to respect, are not disposed to question the personal and homosexual character of her poems. Quote, All ancient tradition and the character of her extant fragments, says Professor J. A. Platt, Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition, Article Sappho, continued, quote, show that her morality was what has ever since been known as lesbian. End quote. What exactly that lesbian morality involved, we cannot indeed exactly ascertain. Quote, it is altogether idle, as A. Croissant remarks of Sappho, Histoire de la littérature grecque, volume 2, chapter 5, quote, to discuss the exact quality of this friendship or this love, or to seek to determine with precision the frontiers which language itself often seems to seek to confuse of a friendship more or less aesthetic and sensual, of a love more or less platonic. End quote. See also J. M. Edmonds, Sappho in the Added Lights of the New Fragments, 1912. Ivan Bloch similarly concludes, Ursprung der Syphilis, Volume 2, 1911, page 507, that Sappho probably combined, as modern investigation shows to be easily possible, lofty ideal feelings with passionate sensuality, exactly as happens in normal love. It must also be said that in literature, homosexuality in women has furnished a much more frequent motive to the artist than homosexuality in men. Among the Greeks, indeed, homosexuality in women seldom receives literary consecration, and in the revival of the classical spirit at the Renaissance, it was still chiefly in male adolescence, as we see, for instance, in Marino's Adone, that the homosexual ideal found expression. After that date, male inversion was for a long period rarely touched in literature, save briefly and satirically, while inversion in women becomes a subject which might be treated in detail and even with complacence. Many poets and novelists, especially in France, might be cited in evidence. Ariosto, it has been pointed out, has described the homosexual attractions of women. Diderot's famous novel La Religieuse, which, when first published, was thought to have been actually written by a nun, deals with the torture to which a nun was put by the perverse lubricity of her abbess, for whom, it is said, Diderot found a model in the abbess of Chelles, a daughter of the regent, and thus a member of a family which for several generations showed a marked tendency to inversion. Diderot's narrative has been described as a faithful description of the homosexual phenomena liable to occur in convents. Feminine homosexuality, especially in convents, was often touched on less seriously in the 18th century. Thus we find a homosexual scene in Les Plaisirs du Cloître, a play written in 1773, Le Théâtre d'Amour en 18 siècles, 1910. Balzac, who treated so many psychological aspects of love in a more or less veiled manner, has touched on this in La Fille aux yeux d'or, in a vague and extravagantly romantic fashion. Gautier made the adventures of a woman who is predisposed to homosexuality and slowly realizes the fact, the central motive of his wonderful romance, Mademoiselle de Maupin, 1835. He approached the subject purely as an artist and poet, but his handling of it shows remarkable insight. Gautier based his romance, to some extent, on the life of Madame Maupin, or, as she preferred to call herself, Mademoiselle Maupin, who was born in 1673, her father's name being Daubigny, dressed as a man, and became famous as a teacher of fencing, afterward as an opera singer. She was apparently of bisexual temperament, and her devotion to women led her into various adventures. She ultimately entered a convent, and died at the age of thirty-four, with a reputation for sanctity. E. C. Clayton, Queens of Song, Volume 1, pages 52-61, to 61. F. Karsch, Mademoiselle Maupin, Jahrbuch für sexuelle Schützenstufen, Volume 5, 1903, pages 694-706. A still greater writer, Flaubert, in Salambeau, 1862, made his heroine homosexual. 
Zola has described sexual inversion in Nona and elsewhere. Some thirty years ago, a popular novelist, A. Bellot, published a novel called Mademoiselle de Giraud, Ma Femme, which was much read. The novelist took the attitude of a moralist who is bound to treat frankly, but with all decorous propriety, a subject of increasing social gravity. The story is that of a man whose bride will not allow his approach, on account of her own liaison, with a female friend continued after marriage. This book appears to have given origin to a large number of novels, some of which touch the question with considerable less affectation of propriety. Among other novelists who have dealt with the matter may be mentioned Guy de Maupassant, La Femme de Paul, Bourget, Crime d'Amour, Catel Mendes, Mephistophela, and Willie in the Claudine series. Among poets who have used the motive of homosexuality in women with more or less boldness may be found Lamartine, Regina, Swinburne, first series of poems and ballads, Verlaine, Parallèlement, and Pierre-Louis, Chanson de Bility. The last named book, a collection of homosexual prose poems, attracted considerable attention on publication, as it was an attempt at mystification, being put forward as a translation of the poems of a newly discovered Oriental Greek poetess. Bility, more usually Belti, is the Syrian name for Aphrodite. Les chansons de Bility are not without charm, but have been severely dealt with by Vilamovich Mullendorf, Sapphon Simonides, 1913, page 63 and further, as a travesty of Hellenism, betraying inadequate knowledge of Greek antiquity. More interesting, as the work of a woman who was not only highly gifted, but herself of homosexual temperament, are the various volumes of poems published by René Vivien. This lady, whose real name was Pauline Tan, was born in 1877. Her father was of Scotch descent, and her mother an American lady from Honolulu. As a child she was taken to Paris, and was brought up as a French girl. She travelled much, and at one time took a house at Mytilene, the chief city of ancient Lesbos. She had a love of solitude, hated publicity, and was devoted to her women friends, especially to one whose early death about 1900 was the great sorrow of Pauline Tan's life. She is described as very beautiful, very simple and sweet-natured, and highly accomplished in many directions. She suffered, however, from nervous overtension and incurable melancholy. Toward the close of her life she was converted to Catholicism, and died in 1909 at the age of 32. She is buried in the cemetery at Passy. Her best verse is by some considered among the finest in the French language. Charles Brun, Pauline Tan, Notes and Queries, 22nd August 1914. The same writer who knew her well has also written a pamphlet, René Vivien, saint Paris 1911. Her chief volumes of poems are Etu et Prélude, 1901, Cendre et Poussière, 1902, Avocations, 1903. A novel, Une femme de ma parue, 1904, is said to be to some extent autobiographical. René Vivien also wrote a volume on Sappho with translations, and a further volume of poems, Les Quitarides, suggested by the fragments which remain of the minor women poets of Greece, followers of Sappho. It is, moreover, noteworthy that a remarkably large proportion of the cases in which homosexuality has led to crimes of violence, or otherwise come under medico-legal observation, has been among women. It is well known that the part taken by women generally in open criminality, and especially in crimes of violence, is small as compared with men. In the homosexual field, as we might have anticipated, the conditions are to some extent reversed. Inverted men, in whom a more or less feminine temperament is so often found, are rarely impelled to acts of aggressive violence, though they frequently commit suicide. Inverted women, who may retain their feminine emotionality, combined with some degree of infantile impulsiveness and masculine energy, present a favourable soil for the seeds of passional crime, under those conditions of jealousy and allied emotions which must so often enter into the invert's life. 
The first conspicuous example of this tendency in recent times is the Memphis case, 1892, in the United States. Arthur MacDonald, Observation de sexualité pathologique féminine, Archive d'anthropologie criminelle, May 1895. See also Kraft Ebbing, Psychopathia sexualis, English translation of 10th edition, page 550. In this case, a congenital sexual invert, Alice Mitchell, planned a marriage with Frieda Ward, taking a male name and costume. This scheme was frustrated by Frieda's sister, and Alice Mitchell then cut Frieda's throat. There is no reason to suppose that she was insane at the time of the murder. She was a typical invert of a very pronounced kind. Her mother had been insane and had homicidal impulses. She herself was considered unbalanced and was masculine in her habits from her earliest years. Her face was obviously unsymmetrical and she had an appearance of youthfulness below her age. She was not vicious and had little knowledge of sexual matters, but when she kissed Frida she was ashamed of being seen, while Frida could see no reason for being ashamed. She was adjudged insane. There have been numerous cases in America more recently. One case, for some details concerning which I am indebted to Dr. J. G. Kernan of Chicago, is that of the Tiller sisters, two quintroons who for many years had acted together under that name in cheap theatres. One, who was an invert with a horror of men dating from early girlhood, was sexually attached to the other, who was without inborn inversion, and was eventually induced by a man to leave the invert. The latter, overcome by jealousy, broke into the apartment of the couple and shot the man dead. She was tried and sent to prison for life. A defense of insanity was made, but for this there was no evidence. In another case, also occurring in Chicago, reported in Medicine, June 1899, and Alienist and Neurologist, October 1899, a trained nurse lived for fourteen years with a young woman who left her on four different occasions, but was each time induced to return. Finally, however, she left and married, whereupon the nurse shot the husband, who was not, however, fatally wounded. The culprit in this case had been twice married, but had not lived with either of her husbands. It was stated that her mother had died in an asylum, and that her brother had committed suicide. She was charged with disorderly conduct and subjected to a fine. In another later case in Chicago, a Russian girl of twenty-two named Anna Rubinovich shot from motives of jealousy another Russian girl to whom she had been devoted from childhood, and then fatally shot herself. The relations between the two girls had been very intimate. Our love affair is one purely of the soul. Anna Rubinovich was accustomed to say, quote, we love each other on a higher plane than that of earth, end quote. I am informed that there were, in fact, physical relationships. The sexual organs were normal. This continued with great devotion on each side until Anna's sweetheart began to show herself susceptible to the advances of a male wooer. This aroused uncontrollable jealousy in Anna, whose father, it may be noted, had committed suicide by shooting some years previously. Homosexual relationships are also a cause of suicide among women. Such a case was reported in Massachusetts early in 1901. A girl of 21 had been tended during a period of nervous prostration, apparently of hysterical nature, by a friend and neighbor, 14 years her senior, married and having children. An intimate friendship grew up, equally ardent on both sides. The mother of the younger woman and the husband of the other took measures to put a stop to the intimacy and the girl was sent away to a distant city. Stolen interviews, however, still occurred. Finally, when the obstacles became insurmountable, the younger woman bought a revolver and deliberately shot herself in the temple in presence of her mother, dying immediately. Though sometimes thought to act rather strangely, she was a great favourite with all, handsome, very athletic, fond of all outdoor sports, an energetic religious worker, possessing a fine voice, and was an active member of many clubs and societies. The older woman belonged to an aristocratic family and was loved and respected by all. In another case in New York in 1905, a retired sailor, Captain John Weed, 
who had commanded transatlantic vessels for many years, was admitted to a home for old sailors, and shortly after became ill and despondent, and cut his throat. It was then found that Captain Weed was really a woman. I am informed that the old sailor's despondency and suicide were due to enforced separation from a female companion. The infatuation of young girls for actresses and other prominent women may occasionally lead to suicide. Thus in Philadelphia, a few years ago, a girl of nineteen, belonging to a very wealthy family, beautiful and highly educated, acquired an absorbing infatuation for Miss Mary Garden, the prima donna, with whom she had no personal acquaintance. The young girl would kneel in worship before the singer's portrait, and studied hairdressing and manicuring in the hope of becoming Miss Garden's maid. When she realized that her dream was hopeless, she shot herself with a revolver. Cases more or less resembling those here brought forward occur from time to time in all parts of the civilized world. Reports, mostly from current newspapers of such cases, as well as of simple transvestism or eonism in both women and men, will be found in the publications of the Berlin Wissenschaftliche Humanitären Komitee, the Monatsberichte, up to 1909, then in the Viertaljahrsberichte, and from 1913 onward in the Jahrbuch für sexuelle Schüssenstufen. Yet, until recently, comparatively little has been known of sexual inversion in women. Even so lately as 1901, after the publication of the first edition of the present study, Kraft Ebbing wrote that scarcely fifty cases had been recorded. The chief monographs devoted but little space to women. Kraft Ebbing himself, in the earlier editions of Psychopathia Sexualis, gave little special attention to inversion in women, although he published a few cases. Moll, however, included a valuable chapter on the subject in his Contraire Sexual Empfindung, narrating numerous cases, and inversion in women also received special attention in the present study. Hirschfeld, however, in his Homosexualität, 1914, is the first authority who has been able to deal with feminine homosexuality as completely coordinate with masculine homosexuality. The two manifestations, masculine and feminine, are placed on the same basis and treated together throughout the work. It is no doubt not difficult to account for this retardation in the investigation of sexual inversion in women. Notwithstanding the severity with which homosexuality in women has been visited in a few cases, for the most part men seem to have been indifferent toward it, when it has been made a crime or a cause for divorce in men, it has usually been considered as no offence at all in women. Another reason is that it is less easy to detect in women. We are accustomed to a much greater familiarity and intimacy between women than between men, and we are less apt to suspect the existence of any abnormal passion. And, allied with this cause, we have also to bear in mind the extreme ignorance and the extreme reticence of women regarding any abnormal or even normal manifestation of their sexual life. A woman may feel a high degree of sexual attraction for another woman without realizing that her affection is sexual, and when she does realize this, she is nearly always very unwilling to reveal the nature of her intimate experience, even with the adoption of precautions, and although the fact may be present to her that, by helping to reveal the nature of her abnormality, she may be helping to lighten the burden of it on other women. Among the numerous confessions voluntarily sent to Kraft Ebbing, there is not one by a woman. There is again the further reason that well-marked and fully developed cases of inversion are probably rarer in women, though a slighter degree may be more common, in harmony with the greater affectability of the feminine organism to slight stimuli, and its lesser liability to serious variation. The same aberrations that are found among men are, however, everywhere found among women. Feminine inversion has sometimes been regarded as a vice of modern refined civilization. Yet it was familiar to the Anglo-Saxons, and Theodore's penitential in the seventh century assigned a penance of three years, considerably less than that assigned to men, or for bestiality, to a woman fornicated with a woman. Among the women of savages in all parts of the world homosexuality is found, though it is less frequently recorded than among men. In New Zealand it is stated on the authority of Murenhout, though I have not been able to find the reference, that the women practiced lesbianism. In South America, where inversion is common among men, we find similar phenomena in women. 
Among Brazilian tribes, Gandavo wrote, quote, There are certain women among these Indians who determine to be chaste and know no man. These leave every womanly occupation and imitate the men. They wear their hair the same way as the men. They go to war with them, or hunting, bearing their bows. They continue always in the company of men, and each has a woman who serves her and with whom she lives. End quote. This has some analogy with the phenomena seen among North American men. Dr. Holder, who has carefully studied the beauté, tells me that he has met no corresponding phenomena in women. There is no doubt, however, that homosexuality among women is well known to the American Indians in various regions. Thus the Salish Indians of British Columbia have a myth of an old woman who had intercourse with a young woman by means of a horn used as a penis. In the mythology of the Assiniboine Indians, of Canada and Montana, and the Fox Indians, of Iowa, there are also legends of feminine homosexuality, supposed to have been derived from the Algonquin Cree Indians, who were closely connected with both. End of chapter 4, part 1《Chapter Four of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume Two by Havelock Ellis. Chapter Four: Sexual Inversion in Women, Part Two. According to the Assiniboine legend, a man's wife fell in love with his sister and eloped with her, a boneless child being the result of the union. The husband pursued the couple, and killed his wife as well as the child. No one cared to avenge her death. The fox legend, entitled Two Maidens Who Played the Harlot with Each Other, runs as follows. It is said that once on a time long ago there were two young women who were friends together. It is told that there were also two youths who tried to woo the two maidens, but they were not able even so much as to talk with them. After a while the youths began to suspect something wrong. So once, during the summer, when the two maidens started away to peel off bark, the youths followed, staying just far enough behind to keep them inside. While the girls were peeling the bark, the youths kept themselves hidden. After a while they no longer heard the sound of the maidens at work, whereupon they began to creep up to where they were. When they drew nigh, behold, the maidens were in the act of taking off their clothes. The first to disrobe flung herself down on the ground and lay there. Pray, what are these girls going to do? was the feeling in the hearts of the youths. And to their amazement, the girls began to lie with each other. Thereupon the youths ran to where the girls were. She who was lying on top instantly fell over backward. Her clitoris was standing out, and had a queer shape. It was like a turtle's penis. Thereupon the maidens began to plead with the youths. Oh, don't tell on us, they said. Truly, it is not of our own free desire that we have done this thing. We have done it under the influence of some unknown being. It is said that afterward one of the maidens became big with child. In the course of time she gave birth, and the child was like a soft-shelled turtle. In Bali, according to Jacobs, as quoted by Ploss and Bartels, homosexuality is almost as common among women as among men, though it is more secretly exercised. The methods of gratification adopted are either digital or lingual, or else by bringing the parts together, tribadism. Bauman, who noted inversion among the male Negro population of Zanzibar, finds that it is also not rare among women. Although oriental manners render it impossible for such women to wear men's clothes openly, they do so in private, and are recognized by other women by their man-like bearing, as also by the fact that women's garments do not suit them. They show a preference for masculine occupations, and seek sexual satisfaction among women who have the same inclinations, or else among normal women, who are won over by presence or other means. In addition to tripodism, or cunilinctus, they sometimes use an ebony or ivory phallus, with a kind of glance at one end, or sometimes at both ends. In the latter case, it can be used by two women at once, and sometimes it has a hole bored through it by which warm water can be injected. 
It is regarded as an Arab invention, and is sometimes used by normal women, shut up in harems and practically deprived of sexual satisfaction. Among the Arab women, according to Koha, homosexual practices are rare, though very common among Arab men. In Egypt, however, according to Godard, Koher, and others, it is almost fashionable, and every woman in the harem has a friend. In Turkey, homosexuality is sometimes said to be rare among women, but it would appear to be found in the harems and women's baths of Turkey, as well as of Islam in general. Bantam, in the 16th century, referred to the lesbianism of Turkish women at the baths, and Leo Africanus in the same century mentioned the tribadism of Moorish women and the formal organization of tribadic prostitution in Fez. There was an Osmanli Sapphic poetess, Mihiri, whose grave is at Amasia, and Vambery and Ahistorides agree as to the prevalence of feminine homosexuality in Turkey. Among the Negroes and mulattoes of French Creole countries, according to Coré, homosexuality is very common. I know a lady of great beauty, he remarks, a stranger in Guadalupe, and the mother of a family who is obliged to stay away from the markets and certain shops because of the excessive admiration of mulatto women and negresses and the impudent invitations which they dare to address to her. He refers to several cases of more or less violent sexual attempts by women on young colored girls of twelve or fourteen, and observes that such attempts by men on children of their own sex are much rarer. In China, according to Matignon, and in Cochin China, according to Lorion, homosexuality does not appear to be common among women. In India, however, it is probably as prevalent among women as it certainly is among men. In the first edition of this study, I quoted the opinion of Dr. Buchanan, the superintendent of the central jail of Bengal at Bagalpur, who informed me that he had never come across a case and that his head jailer had never heard of such a thing in twenty-five years' experience. Another officer in the Indian Medical Service assures me, however, that there cannot be the least doubt as to the frequency of homosexuality among women in India, either inside or outside jails. I am indebted to him for the following notes on this point. That homosexual relationships are common enough among Indian women is evidenced by the fact that the Hindustani language has five words to denote the tribad. 1. Dugana 2. Zanake 3. Sata 4. Chapatai and 5. Chapat bars. The modus operandi is generally what Marshall calls geminus comitere cunus, but sometimes a phallus called sabura is employed. The act itself is called chapat or chapti, and the Hindustani poets Nazir, Rangin, Jan Saheb treat of lesbian love very extensively and sometimes very crudely. Jan Saheb, a woman poet, sings to the effect that intercourse with a woman by means of a phallus is to be preferred to the satisfaction offered by a male lover. The common euphemism employed when speaking of two tribads who live together is that they live apart. So much for the literary evidence as to the prevalence of what, mirable dictu, Dr. Buchanan's jailer was ignorant of. Now for facts, in the jail of R, the superintendent discovered a number of phalli in the females' enclosures. They were made of clay and sun-dried and bore marks of use. In the jail of S, was a woman who, as is usual with tree birds in India, wore male attire, and was well known for her sexual proclivities. An examination revealed the following. Face much lined, mame of masculine type, but nipples elongated and readily erectile. Gluteal and iliac regions quite of masculine type, as also the thighs. Clitoris with enlarged glands, readily erectile. Nymphae thickened and enlarged, vulvar orifice patent, for she had in early youth been a prostitute. The voice was almost contralto. Her partner was of low type, but eminently feminine in configuration and manner. In this case, I heard that the man went to a local ascetic and begged his intercession with the deity, so that she might impregnate her partner. The Hindu medical works mentioned the possibility of a woman uniting with another woman in sexual embraces and begetting a boneless fetus. Short History of Aryan Medical Science, 
page forty four in the town of d there lived apart two women one a brahmin the other a grazier their modus operandi was tribadism as an eye-witness informed me in s i was called in to treat the widow of a wealthy mohammedan i had occasion to examine the pudenda and found what martino would have called the indelible stigmata of early masturbation and later sufism she admitted the impeachment and confessed that she was on the best of terms with her three remarkably well-formed and good-looking handmaidens this lady said that she began masturbation at an early age just like all other women and that sufism came after the age of puberty another mohammedan woman whom i knew and who had a very large clitoris told me that she had been initiated into lesbian love at twelve by a neighbour and had intermittently practised it ever since i might also instance two sisters of the gardener caste both widows who lived apart and indulged in simultaneous sapphism that sometimes the actors in tribadism are most vigorous is shown by the fact that in the central jail of blank swelling of the vulva was admitted to have been caused by the embraces of two female convicts the subordinate who told me this mentioned it quite incidentally while relating his experiences as hospital assistant at this jail when i questioned him he stated that the woman whom he was called to treat told him that she would never satisfy herself with men but only with women he added that tribadism was quite common in the jail the foregoing sketch may serve to show that homosexual practices certainly and probably definite sexual inversion are very widespread among women in very many and various parts of the world though it is likely that as among men there are variations geographical racial national or social in the frequency or intensity of its obvious manifestations thus in the eighteenth century casanova remarked that the women of province are specially inclined to lesbianism in european prisons homosexual practices flourish among the women fully as much it may probably be said as among the men there is indeed some reason for supposing that these phenomena are here sometimes even more decisively marked than among men this prevalence of homosexuality among women in prison is connected with the close relationship between feminine criminality and prostitution the frequency of homosexual practices among prostitutes is a fact of some interest and calls for special explanation for at the first glance it seems in opposition to all that we know concerning the exciting causes of homosexuality regarding the fact there can be no question it has been noted by all who are acquainted with the lives of prostitutes though opinion may differ as to its frequency in berlin moll was told in well-informed quarters the proportion of prostitutes with lesbian tendencies is about twenty five per cent this was almost the proportion at paris many years ago according to parent du chatelet to-day according to chevalier it is larger and bourneville believe that seventy five per cent of the inmates of the parisian venereal hospitals have practised homosexuality hammer in germany has found among sixty six prostitutes that forty one were homosexual hirschfeld thinks that inverted women are specially prone to become prostitutes Ollenberg believes on the other hand that the conditions of their life favour homosexuality among prostitutes a homosexual union seems to them higher purer more innocent and more ideal there is however no fundamental contradiction between these two views they are probably both right in london so far as my inquiries extend homosexuality among prostitutes is very much less prevalent and in a well-marked form is confined to a comparatively small section i am indebted to a friend for the following note from my experience of the parisian prostitute i gather that lesbianism in paris is extremely prevalent indeed one might almost say normal in particular most of the chahou dancers of the moulin rouge casino de paris and the other public balls are notorious for going in couples and for the most part they prefer not to be separated even in their most professional moments with the other sex in london the thing is naturally much less obvious and i think much less prevalent but it is certainly not infrequent a certain number of well-known prostitutes are known for their tendencies in this direction which do not however interfere in any marked way with the ordinary details of their profession 
I do not personally know of a single prostitute who is exclusively lesbian. I have heard vaguely that there are one or two such anomalies, but I have heard a swell cocotte at the Corinthian announce to the whole room that she was going home with a girl, and no one doubted the statement. Her name indeed was generally coupled with that of a fifth-rate actress. Another woman of the same kind has a little clientele of women who buy her photographs in Burlington Arcade. In the lower ranks of the profession, all this is much less common. One often finds women who have simply never heard of such a thing. They know of it in regard to men, but not in regard to women. And they are, for the most part, quite horrified at the notion, which they consider part and parcel of French beastliness. Of course, almost every girl has her friend, and, when not separately occupied, they often sleep together. But while in separate, rare cases, this undoubtedly means all that it can mean, for the most part, so far as one can judge, it means no more than it would mean among ordinary girls. It is evident that there must be some radical causes for the frequency of homosexuality among prostitutes. One such cause doubtless lies in the character of the prostitute's relations with men. These relations are of a professional character, and, as the business element becomes emphasized, the possibility of sexual satisfaction diminishes, at the best also. There lacks the sense of social equality, the feeling of possession, and scope for the exercise of feminine affection and devotion. These the prostitute must usually be forced to find either in a bully or in another woman. Apart from this fact, it must be borne in mind that, in a very large number of cases, prostitutes show in slight or more marked degree many of the signs of neurotic heredity, and it would not be surprising if they present the germs of homosexuality in an unusually high degree. The life of the prostitute may well develop such latent germs, and so we have an undue tendency to homosexuality, just as we have it among criminals and to a much less extent among persons of genius and intellect. Homosexuality is specially fostered by those employments which keep women in constant association, not only by day, but often at night also, without the company of men. This is, for instance, the case in convents, and formerly, at all events, however it may be today, homosexuality was held to be very prevalent in convents. This was especially so in the eighteenth century, when very many young girls, without any religious vocation, were put into convents. The same again is today the case with the female servants in large hotels, among whom homosexual practices have been found very common. Laycock, many years ago, noted the prevalence of manifestations of this kind, which he regarded as hysterical, among seamstresses, lace-makers, and so on, confined for hours in close contact with one another in heated rooms. The circumstances under which numbers of young women are employed during the day in large shops and factories, and sleep in the establishment, two in a room or even two in a bed, are favourable to the development of homosexual practices. In England it is seldom that everyone cares to investigate these phenomena, though they certainly exist. They have been more thoroughly studied elsewhere. Thus in Rome, Nicephoro, who studied various aspects of the lives of the working classes, succeeded in obtaining much precise information concerning the manners and customs of the young girls in dressmaking and tailoring workrooms. He remarks that few of those who see the virtuous daughters of the people, often not more than twelve years old, walking along the streets with a dressmaker's box under their arm, modestly bent head and virginal air, realize the intense sexual preoccupations often underlying these appearances. In the workrooms, the conversation perpetually revolves around sexual subjects in the absence of the mistress or forewoman, and even in her presence, the slang that prevails in the workrooms leads to dialogues with a double meaning. A state of sexual excitement is thus aroused which sometimes relieves itself mentally by psychic onanism, sometimes by some sort of masturbation. One girl admitted to Nicephoro that by allowing her thoughts to dwell on the subject while at work, she sometimes produced physical sexual excitement as often as four times a day. See also volume one of these studies, Autoerotism. Sometimes, however, a vague kind of homosexuality is produced, the girls, excited by their own thoughts and their conversation, being still further excited by contact with each other. In summer, in one workroom, some of the girls wear no drawers and they unbutton their bodices, and work with crossed legs, more or less uncovered. 
in this position the girls draw near and inspect one another some boast of their white legs and then the petticoats are raised altogether for more careful comparison many enjoy this inspection of nudity and experience real sexual pleasure from midday till two p m during the hours of greatest heat when all are in this condition and the mistress in her chemise and sometimes with no shame at the workers presence even without it falls asleep on the sofa all the girls without one exception masturbate themselves the heat seems to sharpen their desires and morbidly arouse all their senses the voluptuous emotions restrained during the rest of the day break out with irresistible force stimulated by the spectacle of each other's nakedness some place their legs together and thus heighten the spasm by the illusion of contact with the man in this way they reach mutual masturbation it is noteworthy however nicephora points out that these couples for mutual masturbation are never lesbian couples tripodism is altogether absent from the factories and workrooms he even believes that it does not exist among girls of the working class he further describes how in another workroom during the hot hours of the day in summer when no work is done some of the girls retire into the fitting-room and having fastened their chemises around their legs and thighs with pins so as to imitate trousers play at being men and pretend to have intercourse with the others i have reproduced these details from nicephorus careful study because although they may seem to be trivial at some points they clearly bring out the very important distinction between a merely temporary homosexuality and true inversion the amusements of these young girls may not be considered eminently innocent or wholesome but on the other hand they are not radically morbid or vicious they are strictly and even consciously play they are dominated by the thought that the true sexual ideal is a normal relationship with a man and they would certainly disappear in the presence of a man it must be remembered that nicephorus observations were made among girls who were mostly young in the large factories where many adult women are employed the phenomena tend to be rarer but of much less trivial and playful character at wolverhampton some forty years ago the case was reported of a woman in a galvanizing store who after dinner indecently assaulted a girl who was a new hand two young women held the victim down and this seems to show that homosexual vice was here common and recognized no doubt this case is exceptional in its brutality it throws however a significant light on the conditions prevailing in factories in spain in the large factories where many adult women are employed especially in the great tobacco factory at seville lesbian relationships seem to be not uncommon here the women work in an atmosphere which in summer is so hot that they throw off the greater part of their clothing to such an extent that a bell is rung whenever a visitor is introduced into a workroom in order to warn the workers such an environment predisposes to the formation of homosexual relationships when i was in spain some years ago an incident occurred at the seville fabrica de tabacos which attracted much attention in the newspapers and though it was regarded as unusual it throws light on the life of the workers one morning as the women were entering the workroom and amid the usual scene of animation changing their manila shawls for the light costume worn during work one drew out a small clasp knife and attacking another rapidly inflicted six or seven wounds in her face and neck threatening to kill anyone who approached both these cigarreras were superior workers engaged in the most skilled kind of work and had been at the factory for many years in appearance they were described as presenting a striking contrast the aggressor who was forty-eight years of age was of muslin air tall and thin with an expression of firm determination on her wrinkled face the victim on the other hand whose age was thirty was plump and good-looking and of pleasing disposition the reason at first assigned for the attack on the younger woman was that her mother had insulted the elder woman's son it appeared however that a close friendship had existed between the two women that latterly the younger woman had formed a friendship with the forewoman of her workroom and that the elder woman animated by jealousy then resolved to murder both this design was frustrated by the accidental absence of the forewoman that day End of chapter four part two chapter four of studies in the psychology of sex volume two 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 4. Sexual Inversion in Women, Part 4. History 34. Miss S., age 38, living in a city of the United States, a businesswoman of fine intelligence, prominent in professional and literary circles. Her general health is good, but she belongs to a family in which there is a marked neuropathic element. She is of rather phlegmatic temperament, well poised, always perfectly calm and self-possessed, rather retiring in disposition, with gentle, dignified bearing. She says she cannot care for men, but that all her life has been glorified and made beautiful by friendship with women, whom she loves as a man loves women. Her character is, however, well disciplined, and her friends are not aware of the nature of her affections. She tries not to give all her love to one person, and endeavors, as she herself expressed it, to use this gift of loving as a stepping stone to high mental and spiritual attainments. She is described by one who has known her for several years as having a high nature and instincts unerringly toward high things. History 35 Miss B. Artist of German ancestry on the paternal side. Among her brothers and sisters, one is of neurotic temperament and another is inverted. She is herself healthy. She has no repugnance to men and would even like to try marriage if the union were not permanent, but she has seldom felt any sexual attraction to a man. In one exceptional instance early in life, realizing that she was not adapted for heterosexual relationships, she broke off the engagement she had formed. Much later in life, she formed a more permanent relationship with a man of congenial tastes. She is attracted to women of various kinds, though she recognizes that there are some women to whom only men are attracted. Many years since, she had a friend to whom she was very strongly attached, but the physical manifestations do not appear to have become pronounced. After that, her thoughts were much occupied by several women to whom she made advances, which were not encouraged to pass beyond ordinary friendship. In one case, however, she formed an intimate relationship with a girl somewhat younger than herself and a very feminine personality, who accepted Miss B's ardent love with pleasure, but in a passive manner, and did not consider that the relationship would stand in the way of her marrying, though she would on no account tell her husband. The relationship for the first time aroused Miss B's latent sexual emotions, she found sexual satisfaction in kissing and embracing her friend's body, but there appeared to be no orgasm. The relationship made a considerable change in her and rendered her radiant and happy. In her behavior toward men, Miss B. reveals no sexual shyness. Men are not usually attracted to her. There is nothing striking in her appearance. Her person and manners, though careless, are not conspicuously manlike. She is fond of exercise and smokes a good deal. History 36. Miss H., age 30. Among her paternal relatives, there is a tendency to eccentricity and to nervous disease. Her grandfather drank. Her father was eccentric and hypochondriacal and suffered from obsessions. Her mother and mother's relatives are entirely healthy and normal in disposition. At the age of four, she liked to see the nates of a little girl who lived near. When she was about six, the nursemaid, sitting in the fields, used to play with her own parts and told her to do likewise, saying it would make a baby come. She occasionally touched herself in consequence, but without producing any effect of any kind. When she was about eight, she used to see various nursemaids uncover the children's sexual parts and show them to each other. She used to think about this when alone, and also about whipping. She never cared to play with dolls, and in her games always took the part of a man. Her first rudimentary sex feelings appeared at the age of eight or nine, and were associated with dreams of whipping and being whipped, which were most vivid between the ages of eleven and fourteen, when they died away on the appearance of affection for girls. She menstruated at twelve. Her earliest affection at the age of thirteen was for a schoolfellow, a graceful, coquettish girl with long golden hair and blue eyes. Her affection displayed itself in performing all sorts of small services for this girl, in constantly thinking about her, and in feeling deliciously grateful for the smallest return. At the age of fourteen, she had a similar passion for a girl cousin. 
she used to look forward with ecstasy to her visits and especially to the rare occasions when the cousin slept with her her excitement was then so great that she could not sleep but there was no conscious sexual excitement at the age of fifteen or sixteen she fell in love with another cousin her experiences with this girl were full of delicious sensations if the cousin only touched her neck a thrill went through her body which she now regards as sexual again at seventeen she had an overwhelming passionate fascination for a schoolfellow a pretty commonplace girl who she idealized and etherealized to an extravagant extent this passion was so violent that her health was to some extent impaired but it was purely unselfish and there was nothing sexual in it on leaving school at the age of nineteen she met a girl of about the same age as herself very womanly but not much attracted to men this girl became very much attached to her and sought to gain her love after some time miss h was attracted by this love partly from the sense of power it gave her and an intimate relation grew up this relation became vaguely physical miss h taking the initiative but her friend desiring such relations and taking extreme pleasure in them they used to touch and kiss each other tenderly especially on the mont veneris with equal ardour they each experienced a strong pleasurable feeling in doing this and sexual erotism but no orgasm and it does not appear that this ever occurred their general behaviour to each other was that of lovers but they endeavoured as far as possible to hide this fact from the world this relation lasted for several years and would have continued had not miss h s friend from religious and moral scruples put an end to the physical relationship miss h had been very well and happy during this relationship the interference with it seems to have exerted a disturbing influence and also to have aroused her sexual desires though she was still scarcely conscious of their real nature soon afterward another girl of exceedingly voluptuous type made love to miss h to which the latter yielded giving way to her feelings as well as to her love of domination she was afterward ashamed of this episode though the physical element in it had remained vague and indefinite her remorse was so great that when her friend repenting her scruples implored her to let their relationship be on the same footing as of old miss h in her return resisted every effort to restore the physical relation she kept to this resolution for some years and sought to divert her thoughts into intellectual channels when she again formed an intimate relationship it was with a congenial friend and lasted for several years she has never masturbated occasionally but very rarely she has had dreams of riding accompanied by pleasurable sexual emotions she cannot recall any actual experience to suggest this though fond of riding she has never had any kind of sexual dreams about a man of late years she has occasionally had erotic dreams about women her feeling toward men is friendly but she has never had sexual attraction toward a man she likes them as good comrades as men like each other she enjoys the society of men on account of their intellectual attraction she is herself very active in social and intellectual work her feeling toward marriage has always been one of repugnance she can however imagine a man whom she could love or marry she is attracted to womanly women sincere reserved pure but courageous in character she is not attracted to intellectual women but at the same time cannot endure silly women the physical qualities that attract her most are not so much beauty of face as a graceful but not too slender body with beautiful curves the women she is drawn to are usually somewhat younger than herself women are much attracted to her and without any effort on her part she likes to take the active part and protecting role with them she is herself energetic in character and with a somewhat neurotic temperament she finds sexual satisfaction in tenderly touching caressing and kissing the loved one's body there is no cunnilinctus which she regards with abhorrence she feels more tenderness than passion there is a high degree of sexual erotism when kissing but orgasm is rare and is produced by lying on the friend or by the friend lying on her without any special contact she likes being herself kissed but not so much as taking the active part she believes that homosexual love is morally right when it is really part of a person's nature and provided that the nature of homosexual love is always made plain to the object of such affection she does not approve of it as a mere makeshift or expression of sensuality in normal women she has sometimes resisted the sexual expression of her feelings once for years at a time but always in vain 
the effect on her of loving women is distinctly good she asserts both spiritually and physically while repression leads to morbidity and hysteria she has suffered much from neurasthenia at various periods but under appropriate treatment it has slowly diminished the inverted instinct is too deeply rooted to eradicate but it is well under control history thirty seven miss m the daughter of english parents both musicians who were both of what is described as intense temperament and there is a neurotic element in the family though no history of insanity or alcoholism and she is herself free from nervous disease at birth she was very small in a portrait taken at the age of four the nose mouth and ears are abnormally large and she wears a little boy's hat as a child she did not care for dolls or for pretty clothes and often wondered why other children found so much pleasure in them as far back as my memory goes she writes i cannot recall a time when i was not different from other children i felt bored when other little girls came to play with me though i was never rough or boisterous in my sports sewing was distasteful to her still she cared little more for the pastimes of boys and found her favourite amusement in reading especially adventures and fairy tales she was always quiet, timid, and self-conscious. The instinct first made its appearance in the latter part of her eighth or the first part of her ninth year. She was strongly attracted by the face of a teacher who used to appear at a side window on the second floor of the school building and ring a bell to some of the children to their classes. The teacher's face seemed very beautiful, but sad, and she thought about her continually, though not coming in personal contact with her. A year later, this teacher was married and left the school and the impression gradually faded away there was no consciousness of sex at this time she wrote no knowledge of sexual matters or practices and the feelings evoked were feelings of pity and compassion and tenderness for a person who seemed to be very sad and very much depressed it is this quality or combination of qualities which has always made the appeal in my own case i may go on for years in comparative peace when something may happen in spite of my busy practical life to call it all out the next feelings were experienced when she was about eleven years of age a young lady came to visit a next-door neighbour and made so profound an impression on the child that she was ridiculed by her playmates for preferring to sit in a dark corner on the lawn where she might watch this young lady rather than to play games being a sensitive child after this experience she was careful not to reveal her feelings to any one she felt instinctively that in these she was different from others her sense of beauty developed early but there was always an indefinable feeling of melancholy associated with it the twilight a dark night when the stars shone brightly this had a very depressing effect upon her but possessed a strong attraction nevertheless and pictures appealed to her at the age of twelve she fell in love with a schoolmate two years older than herself who was absorbed in the boys and never suspected this affection she wept bitterly because they could not be confirmed at the same time but feared to appear undignified and sentimental by revealing her feelings the face of this friend reminded her of one of dolce's madonnas which she loved later on at the age of sixteen she loved another friend very dearly and devoted herself to her care there was a tinge of masculinity among the women of this friend's family but it is not clear if she can be termed inverted this was the happiest period of miss m s life upon the death of this friend who had long been in ill health eight years afterward she resolved never to let her heart go out to any one again specific physical gratification plays no part in these relationships the physical sexual feelings began to assert themselves at puberty but not in association with her ideal emotions in that connection she writes i would have considered such things a sacrilege I fought them, and in a measure successfully. The practice of self-indulgence, which might have become a daily habit, was only occasional. Her image evoked at such times drove away such feelings, for which I felt a repugnance, much preferring the romantic ideal feelings. In this way, quite unconscious of the fact that I was at all different from any other person, I contrived to train myself to suppress, or at least to dominate my physical sensations when they arose that is the reason why friendship and love have always seemed such holy and beautiful things to me 
i have never connected the two sets of feelings i think i am as strongly sexed as any one but i am unable to hold a friend in my arms and experience deep comfort and peace without having even a hint of physical sexual feeling sexual expression may be quite necessary at certain times and right under certain conditions but i am convinced that free expression of affection along sentimental channels will do much to minimize the necessity for it along specifically sexual channels i have gone three months without the physical outlet the only time i was ever on the verge of nervous prostration was after having suppressed the instinct for ten months the other feelings which i do not consider as sexual feelings at all so fill my life in every department love literature poetry music professional and philanthropic activities that i am able to let the physical take care of itself when the physical sensations come it is usually when i am not thinking of a loved one at all i could dissipate them by raising my thought to that spiritual friendship i do not know if this was right and wise i know it is what occurred it seems a good thing to practice some sort of inhibition of the centers and acquire this kind of domination one bad result however was that i suffered much at times from the physical sensations and felt horribly depressed and wretched whenever they seemed to get the better of me i have been able she writes successfully to master the desire for a more perfect and complete expression of my feelings and i have done so without serious detriment to my health i love few people she writes again but in these instances when i have permitted my heart to go out to a friend i have always experienced most exalted feelings and have been made better by them morally mentally and spiritually love is with me a religion with regard to her attitude toward the other sex she writes i have never felt a dislike for men but have good comrades among them during my childhood i associated with both girls and boys enjoying them all but wondering why the girls cared to flirt with boys later in life i have had other friendships with men some of whom cared for me much to my regret for naturally i do not care to marry she is a musician and herself attributes her nature in part to artistic temperament she is of good intelligence and shows remarkable talent for various branches of physical science she is about five feet four inches in height and her features are rather large the pelvic measurements are normal and the external sexual organs are fairly normal in most respects though somewhat small at a period ten years subsequent to the date of this history further examination under anaesthetics by a gynaecologist showed no traces of ovary on one side the general conformation of the body is feminine but with arms palms up extended in front of her with inner sides of hands touching she cannot bring the inner sides of forearms together as nearly every woman can showing that the feminine angle of arm is lost she is left-handed and shows a better development throughout on the left side she is quiet and dignified but has many boyish tricks of manner and speech which seem to be instinctive she tries to watch herself continually however in order to avoid them affecting feminine ways and feminine interests but always being conscious of an effort in so doing miss m can see nothing wrong in her feelings and until at the age of twenty-eight she came across the translation of kraft ebbing's book she had no idea that feelings like mine were under the ban of society as he puts it or were considered unnatural and depraved she would like to help to bring light on the subject and to lift the shadow from other lives i emphatically protest she says against the uselessness and the inhumanity of attempts to cure inverts i am quite sure they have perfect right to live in freedom and happiness as long as they live unselfish lives one must bear in mind that it is the soul that needs to be satisfied and not merely the senses history thirty eight miss v age thirty five throughout early life up to adult age she was a mystery to herself and morbidly conscious of some fundamental difference between herself and other people there was no one she could speak to about this peculiarity in the effort to conquer it or to ignore it she became a hard student and has attained success in the profession she adopted a few years ago she came across a book on sexual inversion which proved to be a complete revelation to her of her own nature and by showing her that she was not an anomaly to be regarded with repulsion brought her comfort and peace 
she is willing that her experiences should be published for the sake of other women who may be suffering as in the past she has suffered i am a teacher in a college for women i am thirty-four years old and of medium size up to the age of thirty i looked much younger and since older than my age until twenty-one i had a strikingly childlike appearance my physique has nothing masculine in it that i am aware of but i am conscious that my walk is mannish and i have very frequently been told that i do things such as sewing just like a man my voice is quite low but not coarse i dislike household work but i am fond of sports gardening and so on when so young that i cannot remember it i learned to whistle a practice at which i am still expert when a young girl i learned to smoke and should still enjoy it several men have been good friends of mine but very few suitors i scarcely ever feel at ease with a man but women i understand and can nearly always make my friends i am of scotch irish descent my father's family were respectable prosperous religious people my mother's family only semi-respectable hard livers shrewd but not intelligent industrious and money-getting but fond of drinking and carousing there were many illegitimates among them both grandmothers though of little education were unusual women of my four maternal uncles three drank heavily when forty-three my mother gave birth to me the youngest of eight children of those who grew to adult years two seem quite normal sexually one is exceedingly erratic entirely unprincipled has been a thief and a forger is a probable bigamist and has betrayed several respectable women aside from his having inordinate desire i know of no sexual abnormality another brother married and a father as a boy was much given to infatuations for men i fancy this never went beyond infatuation and of late years has not been noticeable a third brother single though much courted by women on account of his good looks and personal charm is wholly unresponsive has no gallantry nor was ever to my knowledge a suitor he is however fond of the society of women especially those older than he he has a somewhat effeminate voice and walk though he has begun of late years to smoke and drink a little these habits sit rather oddly upon him when a child one of his favourite make-believe games was to pretend that he was a famous woman singer at school he was always found hanging around the older girls as a child i loved to stay in the fields refused to wear a sunbonnet used to pretend i was a boy climbed trees and played ball i liked to play with dolls but i did not fondle them or even make them dresses when my hair was clipped i was delighted and made everyone call me john i used to like to wear a man's broad-brimmed hat and make corn-cob pipes i was very fond of my father and tried to imitate him as much as possible where animals were concerned i was entirely fearless i think i was not a sexually precocious child though i seemed to have always known in a dim way that there were two sexes very early i had a sense of shame at having my body exposed i remember on one occasion i could not be persuaded to undress before a young girl visitor at that time i must have been about three when i was four a neighbour who had often petted me took me on his lap and clasped my hands around his penis though he was interrupted in a moment this made a lasting impression on me i had no physical sensation nor did i have any conception of the significance of the act yet i had a slight feeling of repulsion and i must have dimly felt that it was wrong for i did not tell my mother i was not accustomed to confide in her for though truthful i was secretive at the age of five i commenced to attend a district school i remember that on my first day i was greatly attracted by a little girl who wore a bright red dress my first definite knowledge of sex came in this way i was attending sabbath school and had become ambitious to read the bible through i had gotten as far as the account of the birth of esau and jacob which aroused my curiosity so i asked my mother the meaning of some word in the passage she seemed embarrassed and evaded my question this attitude stimulated my curiosity further and i re-read the chapter until i understood it pretty well later i was further enlightened by girl playmates i fancy i enjoyed listening to their talk and repeating what i knew on account of the mystery and secrecy with which sex subjects are surrounded rather than any sensual delight i cannot recall any act of mine growing directly from sexual feeling until i was ten years old several other little girls and myself two or three times exposed private parts of our bodies to each other 
In one instance, at least, I was the instigator. This act gave me some pleasure, though no distinct physical sensation. One incident I recall that happened when I was about ten. A girl cousin and myself had been playing house together. I do not recall what immediately led to it, but we began to address each other as boys and try to urinate through long tubes of some sort. I also recall feeling a vague interest in this process in animals and observing them closely in the act. From this time until I was about fourteen I grew ruder, more boisterous, and uncontrollable. Prior to this I had been a quite tractable child. When twelve, I became interested in a boy in my graded school and tried to attract him, but failed. Once, at a children's party, where we were playing kissing games, I tried to get him to kiss me, but he was unresponsive. I do not recall bothering myself about him after that. A year later I had a boy chum, about whom my schoolmaster teased me. I thought this ridiculous. At the age of thirteen I menstruated, a fact that caused me shame and anger. Gradually I grew to feel myself peculiar, why I cannot explain. I did not seem to myself to be like other girls of my acquaintance. I adopted as a defence a brusque and defiant air. I spent a good deal of time playing alone in our backyard, where I made a pair of stilts, practised rope-walking, and such things. At school I felt I was not liked by the nicer girls, and began to associate with girls whom I now believe were immoral, but whom I then supposed did nothing worse than talk in an obscene manner. I copied their conversation and grew more reckless and uncontrollable. The principal of the high school I was attending, I learned afterward, said I was the hardest pupil to control she had ever had. About this time I read a book where a girl was represented as saying she had a boy's soul in a girl's body. The applicability of this to myself struck me at once, and I read the sentence to my mother who disgusted me by appearing shocked. During this period I began to fall in love a practice which clung to me until I was nearly thirty years old. I recall various older women with whom I became much enamoured, and one man. Of this there was only one with whom I became acquainted well enough to show any affection. Another was a teacher, and another was a young married woman, at whom I used to gaze ardently during an entire church service. Toward all my women teachers I had a somewhat sentimental attitude. They stimulated me, while the men gave me a wholly impersonal feeling. This abnormal sentimentality may have been caused, or at least was increased, by the reading of novels, some of a highly voluptuous nature. I began to read novels at seven, and from eleven to fourteen I absorbed a great many undesirable ones. This led to my picturing my future with a lover, fancying myself in romantic scenes and being caressed and embraced. I had always supposed I should marry. When about five, I decided that when I grew up, I would marry a certain young man who used to come to our house. Several years later, he married, to my real disappointment. I had no affection for him, but merely thought he would make a desirable husband. During my unhappy adolescence, I heard that a former playmate was going to visit at my home. I began to look forward to the visit with much eagerness, and at her arrival was much excited. I wished to stay alone with her and to caress her, and when we slept together, I pressed my bed against her in a sensual manner, which act she permitted, but without passion. I was greatly excited and could scarcely sleep. This was the first time I had acted in such a way, and after she left I felt shame and dislike for her. At future meetings there was never the least sensuality. We never refer to the first visit, and are still friends, though not intimate. A diary which I kept during my fourteenth and fifteenth years is filled with romantic sentiments and endearing terms applied successively to three girls of my own age. I had but a speaking acquaintance with them, but I was strongly infatuated with all. One boy was also the object of adoration. During my thirteenth year I became for a time very religious and devoted to religious exercises. This passed, and by my fourteenth year I had become heretical but was still keenly sensitive to religious influences. When barely sixteen, I slept one night with a woman of low morals. She acted toward me in a sensual manner and aroused my sexual feelings. I felt at the time that this was a sin, but I was carried away by passion. Afterward, I hated this woman and despised myself. I then went away to a co-educational boarding school. Here, for the first time, I became happy. 
a girl of my own age of fine character and noticeable refinement fell in love with me and caused me to reciprocate on retrospection i believe this to have been a genuine and beautiful love on both sides after a few months however our relation at my initiative and against my friend's will became a physical one we expressed our affection by mutual caresses close embraces and lying on each other's bodies i sometimes touched her sexual organs sensually all this contact gave me exquisite thrills after three years we had a misunderstanding and separated i was greatly grieved and troubled for many years and came to regret greatly the physical relationship that had existed between us my friend at length fell in love and married i had several other slighter infatuations for women was courted by several men to whom i remained cold and bored except in one instance where i was somewhat touched and finally found elastic friendship with a woman who had fallen deeply in love with me in her school days and had never been able to care for anyone else she is a woman of considerable literary talent and of good general ability and high ideals she is usually much liked by men her love for me is the most real thing in the world for me and seems the most permanent at first my feeling for her was almost purely physical although there were no sexual relations i hated this feeling and have succeeded in overcoming it pretty largely at times after long separations we have embraced with great passion at least on my part this has always had a bad physical effect on me at present however it very rarely occurs we both consider sexual feelings degrading and deleterious of real love whether at any time we have had complete physical satisfaction or gratification i hardly know i have experienced very keen physical pleasure mingled with what i took to be great mental exaltation and quickening of the emotions this condition was brought about by close contact with the body of my friend usually by lying upon it but if by gratification it is meant that desire having been completely satisfied ceases temporarily i think i have never had that experience if i did it was when i was about eighteen when i lived with a girlfriend in intimate relations of late years at any rate it has never happened to me and an embrace however close always leaves me with a desire for a closer union both physical and spiritual so a few years since i came to the conclusion that it was impossible to obtain physical satisfaction through the woman i loved i came to this conclusion because of the bad physical effects of contact my sexual organs became highly sensitive and inflamed and i suffered pain from the inflammation and resulting leucoria should i allow myself to indulge in caresses this condition would return my friend fortunately though very affectionate and demonstrative toward me has very little sexual passion the idea that our relationship is based upon it is very repugnant to her i was at one time a few years since much discouraged and almost hopeless of being able to overcome my appetite and i decided that we could not associate unless i succeeded at present with help i have very largely succeeded in living with my friend on a basis of normal though affectionate and tender companionship i have been helped more and have learned more through this companionship than through anything else the keen pleasure that i have felt when in responsive contact i never experienced in masturbation so far as i remember it never took place till i was well along in my teens and was never an habitual practice except the first summer i was separated from a school friend whom i loved thoughts of her aroused feelings which i attempted to satisfy in this way but the entire sensuality of the act soon led me to refrain and to see that that was not what i wanted a peculiar incident that might have some significance occurred to me about five years ago i was sitting in a small room where a seminar was being conducted the leader of the discussion was a man about fifty whom i looked up to on account of his attainments and respected as a man though i knew him socially very slightly i had lost a night's sleep from toothache and was feeling nervous i was giving my entire attention to the subject in hand when suddenly i felt a very strong physical compulsion toward that man i did not know what i was going to do but i felt on the point of losing all control of myself i was afraid to leave for fear the slightest movement would throw me into a panic the attraction was entirely physical and like nothing i had felt before and i had a strange feeling that its cause was in the man himself that he was willing it i was like a spectator it was some moments before the assemblage broke up when my possession completely disappeared and never recurred regarding dreams i will say 
that not until the past year or two have i been conscious of having clear-cut dreams with definite happenings they seemed usually to leave only vague impressions such as a feeling that i had been riding horseback or trying to perform some hard task sexual dreams i do not recall having had for several years except that occasionally i am awakened by a feeling of uncomfortable sexual desire which seems usually caused by a need to urinate between the ages of seventeen and twenty-two approximately i frequently perhaps several times a month would have vague sexual dreams these always i think occurred when i happened to be sleeping with someone whom in my dream i would mistake for my intimate friend and would awaken myself by embracing my bedfellow with sometimes a slight sometimes considerable degree of passion i have finally arrived at some understanding of my own temperament and am no longer miserable and melancholy i regret that i am not a man because i could then have a home and children End of chapter four part four Chapter Four of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Meilinger. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume Two by Havelock Ellis. Chapter Four: Sexual Inversion in Women, Part Three. In theatres, the abnormal sexuality stimulated by such association in work is complicated by the general tendency for homosexuality to be connected with dramatic aptitude, a point to which I shall have to refer later on. I am indebted to a friend for the following note. Quote, Passionate friendships among girls, from the most innocent to the most elaborate excursions in the direction of Lesbos, are extremely common in theatres, both among actresses and even more among chorus and ballet girls here the pell-mell of the dressing-rooms the wait of perhaps two hours between the performances during which all the girls are cooped up in a state of inaction and of excitement in a few crowded dressing-rooms afford every opportunity for a growth of this particular kind of sentiment in most of the theatres there is a little circle of girls somewhat avoided by the others or themselves careless of further acquaintanceship, who profess the most unbounded devotion to one another. Most of these girls are equally ready to flirt with the opposite sex, but I know certain ones among them who will scarcely speak to a man, and who are never seen without their particular pal or chum, who, if she gets moved to another theatre, will come around and wait for her friend at the stage door. But here again, it is but seldom that the experience is carried very far. The fact is that the English girl, especially of the lower and middle classes, whether she has lost her virtue or not, is extremely fettered by conventional notions. Ignorance and habit are two restraining influences from the carrying out of this particular kind of perversion to its logical conclusions. It is, therefore, among the upper ranks, alike of society and of prostitution, that lesbianism is most definitely to be met with for here we have much greater liberty of action and much greater freedom from prejudices End quote. with girls as with boys it is in the school at the evolution of puberty that homosexuality usually first shows itself it may originate in a way mainly peripheral or mainly central in the first case two children perhaps when close to each other in bed more or less unintentionally generate in each other a certain amount of sexual irritation, which they foster by mutual touching and kissing. This is a spurious kind of homosexuality, and often precocious play of the normal instinct. In the girl who is congenitally predisposed to homosexuality, it will continue and develop. In the majority it will be forgotten as quickly as possible, not without shame, in the presence of the normal object of sexual love. I may quote as fairly typical the following observation supplied by a lady who cannot be called inverted. Quote, like so many other children and girls, I was first taught self-indulgence by a girl at school, and I passed on my knowledge to one or two others, with one of whom I remember once, when we were just sixteen, spending the night sensually. We were horribly ashamed after, and that was the only time. When I was only eight, 
there was a girl of thirteen who liked to play with my body and taught me to play with hers though i rather disliked doing so we slept together and this went on at intervals for six months these things for the sake of getting enjoyment and not with any passion are not uncommon with children but less common i think than people sometimes imagine i believe i could recall without much difficulty the number of times such things happened with me in the case i mentioned when i did for one night feel or try to excite in myself and my girl companion of sixteen sensual passion we had as little children slept together a few times and done these things and meeting after an absence just at that age recalled our childish memories and were carried away by sexual impulse but i never felt any peculiar affection or passion for her even at the time nor she for me we only felt that our sensual nature was strong at the time and had betrayed us into something we were ashamed of and therefore we avoided letting ourselves sleep too close after that day i think we disliked each other and were revolted whenever we thought of that night feeling that each had degraded the other and herself End quote. the cases in which the sorts is mainly central rather than peripheral nevertheless merge into the foregoing with no clear line of demarcation in such cases a girl forms an ardent attachment for another girl probably somewhat older than herself often a schoolfellow sometimes her schoolmistress upon whom she will lavish an astonishing amount of affection and devotion there may or not be any return usually the return consists of a gracious acceptance of the affectionate services the girl who expends this wealth of devotion is surcharged with emotion but she is often unconscious or ignorant of the sexual impulse and she seeks for no form of sexual satisfaction kissing and the privilege of sleeping with the friend are however sought and at such times it often happens that even the comparatively unresponsive friend feels more or less definite sexual emotion pudendal turgescence with secretion of mucus and involuntary twitching of the neighboring muscles though little or no attention may be paid to this phenomenon and in the common ignorance of girls concerning sex matters it may not be understood in some cases there is an attempt either instinctive or intentional to develop the sexual feeling by close embraces and kissing this rudimentary kind of homosexual relationship is i believe more common among girls than among boys and for this there are several reasons one a boy more often has some acquaintance with sexual phenomena and would frequently regard such a relationship as unmanly two the girl has a stronger need of affection and self-devotion to another person than a boy has three she has not under our existing social conditions which compel young women to hold the opposite sex at arm's length the same opportunities of finding an outlet for her sexual emotions while four conventional propriety recognizes a considerable degree of physical intimacy between girls thus at once encouraging and cloaking the manifestations of homosexuality the ardent attachments which girls in schools and colleges form to each other and to their teachers constitute a subject which is of considerable psychological interest and of no little practical importance these girlish devotions on the borderland between friendship and sexual passion are found in all countries where girls are segregated for educational purposes and their symptoms are on the whole singularly uniform though they vary in intensity and character to some extent from time to time and from place to place sometimes assuming an epidemic form they have been most carefully studied in italy where Abici and marcassini an alienist and a psychologist working in conjunction have analyzed the phenomena with remarkable insight and delicacy and much wealth of illustrative material but exactly the same phenomena are everywhere found in english girls schools even of the most modern type and in some of the large american women's colleges they have sometimes become so acute as to cause much anxiety on the whole however it is probable that such manifestations are regarded more indulgently in girls than in boys schools and in view of the fact that the manifestations of affection are normally more pronounced between girls than between boys this seems reasonable the headmistress of an english training college writes quote, my assumption on such matters has been that affection does naturally belong to the body as well as the mind and between two women is naturally and innocently expressed by caresses 
I have never therefore felt that I ought to warn any girl against the physical element in friendship as such. The test I should probably suggest to them would be the same as one would use for any other relation. Was the friendship helping life as a whole, making them keener, kinder, more industrious, etc., or was it hindering it? End quote. Passionate friendships, of a more or less unconsciously sexual character, are common even outside and beyond school life. It frequently happens that a period during which a young woman falls in love at a distance with some young man of her acquaintance alternates with periods of intimate attachment to a friend of her own sex. No congenital inversion is usually involved. It generally happens, in the end, either that relationship with a man brings the normal impulse into permanent play, or the steadying of the emotions in the stress of practical life leads to a knowledge of the real nature of such feelings and the consequent distaste for them. In some cases, on the other hand, such relationships, especially when formed after school life, are fairly permanent. An energetic emotional woman, not usually beautiful, will perhaps be devoted to another who may have found some rather specialized life work, but who may be very impractical and who has probably a very feeble sexual instinct. She is grateful for her friend's devotion, but may not actively reciprocate it. The actual specific sexual phenomena generated in such cases vary greatly. The emotion may be latent or unconscious. It may be all on one side. It is often more or less recognized and shared. Such cases are on the borderland of true sexual inversion, but they cannot be included within its region. Sex in these relationships is scarcely the essential and fundamental element. It is more or less subordinate and parasitic. There is often a semblance of a sex relationship from the marked divergence of the friends in physical and psychic qualities, and the nervous development of one or both the friends is sometimes slightly abnormal. We have to regard such relationships as hypertrophied friendships, the hypertrophy being due to unemployed sexual instinct. The following narrative is written by a lady who holds a responsible educational position. Quote, a friend of mine, two or three years older than myself, I am 31, and living in the same house with me, has been passing through a very unhappy time. Long nervous strain connected with this has made her sleep badly and apt to wake in terrible depression about three o'clock in the morning. In the early days of our friendship, about eight months ago, she occasionally at these times took refuge with me. After a while, I insisted on her consulting a doctor, who advised her, amongst other things, not to sleep alone. Thenceforth, for two or three months, I induced her to share my room. After a week or two, she generally shared my bed for a time at the beginning of the night, as it seemed to help her to sleep. Before this, about the second or third time that she came to me in the early morning, I had been surprised and a little frightened to find how pleasant it was to me to have her, and how reluctant I was that she should go away. When we began regularly to sleep in the same room, the physical part of our affection grew rapidly very strong. It is natural for me generally to caress my friends, but I soon could not be alone in a room with this one without wanting to have my arms around her. It would have been intolerable to me to live with her without being able to touch her, we did not discuss it, but it was evident that the desire was even stronger in her than in me. For some time it satisfied us fully to be in bed together. One night, however, when she had had a cruelly trying day, and I wanted to find all ways of comforting her, I bared my breast for her to lie on. Afterward it was clear that neither of us could be satisfied without this. She groped for it like a child, and it excited me much more to feel that than to uncover my breast and arms altogether at once. Much of this excitement was sexually localized, and I was haunted in the daytime by images of holding this woman in my arms. I noticed also that my inclination to caress my other women friends was not diminished, but increased. All this disturbed me a good deal. The homosexual practices of which I had read lately struck me as merely nasty, I could not imagine myself tempted to them. At the same time, the whole matter was new to me, for I had never wanted anyone even to share my bed before. I had read that sex instinct was mysterious and unexpected, and I felt that I did not know what might come next. I knew only one elder person whom, for wide-mindedness, gentleness and saintlinessness, I could bear to consult, 
and to this person, a middle-aged man, I wrote for advice. He replied by a long letter of the most tender warning. I had better not weaken my influence with my friend, he wrote, by going back suddenly or without her consent, but I was to be wary of going further. There was fire about. I tried to put this into practice by restraining myself constantly in our intercourse, by refraining from caressing her, for instance, when I wanted to caress her, and knew that she wanted it. The only result seemed to be that the desire was more tormenting and constant than ever. If at this point my friend had happened to die or go away, and the incident had come to an end, I should probably have been left nervous in these matters for years to come. I should have faltered in the opinion I always held, that bodily expressions of love between women were as innocent as they were natural, and I might have come nearer than I expected to the doctrine of those convent teachers who forbid their girls to embrace one another for fear an incalculable instinct should carry them to the edge of an abyss. As it was, after a while I said a little on the subject to my friend herself. I had been inclined to think that she might share my anxiety, but she did not share it at all. She said to me that she did not like these thoughts, that she cared for me more than she had ever done for any person except one, now causing most of her unhappiness, and wanted me in all possible ways, and that it would make her sad to feel that I was trying not to want her in one way, because I thought it was wrong. On my part, I knew very well how much she did need and want me. I knew that in relations with others, she was spending the greatest effort in following a course that I urged on her, and was doing what I thought right in spite of the most painful pressure on her to do wrong, and that she needed all the support and comfort I could give her. It seemed to me, after our conversation, that the right path for me lay not in giving way to fears and scruples, but in giving my friends straightforwardly all the love I could, and all the kinds of love I could. I decided to keep my eyes open for danger, but meanwhile to go on. We were living alone together at the time, and thenceforward we did as we liked doing. As soon as we could, we moved to a bed where we could sleep together all night. In the day when no one was there, we sat as close together as we wished, which was very close. We kissed each other as often as we wanted to kiss each other, which was very many times a day. The results of this, as far as I can see, have been wholly good. We love each other warmly, but no temptation to nastiness has ever come, and I cannot see now that it is at all likely to come. With custom, the localized physical excitement has practically disappeared, and I am no longer obsessed by imagined embraces. The spiritual side of our affection seems to have grown steadily stronger and more profitable since the physical side has been allowed to take its natural place. End quote. A class in which homosexuality, while fairly distinct, is only slightly marked, is formed by women to whom the actively inverted woman is most attracted. These women differ in the first place from the normal or average woman, in that they are not repelled or disgusted by lover-like advances from persons of their own sex. They are not usually attractive to the average man, though to this rule there are many exceptions. Their faces may be plain or ill-made, but not seldom they possess good figures, a point which is apt to carry more weight with the inverted woman than beauty of face. Their sexual impulses are seldom well marked, but they are of strongly affectionate nature. On the whole, they are women who are not very robust and well-developed, physically or nervously, and who are not well adapted for childbearing, but who still possess many excellent qualities, and they are always womanly. One may perhaps say that they are the pick of the women whom the average man would pass by. No doubt, this is often the reason why they are open to homosexual advances, but I do not think it is the sole reason. So far as they may be said to constitute a class, they seem to possess a genuine, though not precisely sexual, preference for women over men, and it is this coldness, rather than lack of charm, which often renders men rather indifferent to them. The actively inverted woman usually differs from the woman in the class just mentioned in one fairly essential character, a more or less distinct trace of masculinity. She may not be, and frequently is not, what would be called a mannish woman, for the latter may imitate men on grounds of taste and habit unconnected with sexual perversion, while in the inverted woman the masculine traits are part of an organic instinct which she by no means always wishes to accentuate. The inverted woman's masculine element may, in the least degree, 
consist only in the fact that she makes advances to the woman to whom she is attracted and treats all men in a cool direct manner which may not exclude comradeship but which excludes every sexual relationship whether of passion or merely of coquetry usually the inverted woman feels absolute indifference toward men and not seldom repulsion and this feeling as a rule is instinctively reciprocated by men at the same time bisexual women are at least as common as bisexual men end of chapter four part three chapter four of studies in the psychology of sex volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. studies in the psychology of sex volume two by havelock ellis chapter four sexual inversion in women part five history thirty nine miss d actively engaged in the practice of her profession aged forty heredity good nervous system sound general health on the whole satisfactory development feminine but manner and movement somewhat boyish menstruation scanty and painless hips normal nates small sexual organs showing some approximation toward infantile type with large labia minora and probably small vagina tendency to development of hair on body and especially lower limbs the narrative is given in her own words ever since i can remember anything at all i could never think of myself as a girl and i was in perpetual trouble with this as the real reason when i was five or six years old i began to say to myself that whatever anyone said if i was not a boy at any rate i was not a girl this has been my unchanged conviction all through my life when i was little nothing ever made me doubt it in spite of external appearances i regarded the conformation of my body as a mysterious accident i could not see why it should have anything to do with the matter the things that really affected the question were my own likes and dislikes and the fact that i was not allowed to follow them i was to like the things which belonged to me as a girl frocks and toys and games which i did not like at all i fancy i was more strongly boyish than the ordinary little boy when i could only crawl my absorbing interest was hammers and carpet nails before i could walk i begged to be put on horses backs so that i seemed to have been born with the love of tools and animals which have never left me i did not play with dolls though my little sister did i was often reproached for not playing her games i always chose boys toys tops and guns and horses i hated being kept indoors and was always longing to go out by the time I was seven it seemed to me that everything I liked was called wrong for a girl. I left off telling my elders what I did like. They confused and wearied me by their talk of boys and girls. I did not believe them, and could hardly imagine that they believed themselves. By the time I was eight or nine I used to wonder whether they were dupes or liars or hypocrites, or all three. I never believed or trusted a grown person in consequence. I led my younger brothers in everything. I was not at all a happy little child, and often cried and was made irritable. I was so confused by the talk about boys and girls, I was held up as an evil example to other little girls who virtuously despised me. When I was about nine years old, I went to a day school and began to have a better time. From nine to thirteen I practically shaped my own life. I learned very little at school and openly hated it, but I read a great deal at home and got plenty of ideas. I lived, however, mainly out of doors, whenever I could get out. I spent all my pocket money on tools, rabbits, pigeons, and many other animals. I became an ardent pigeon catcher, not to say thief, though I did not knowingly steal. My brothers were as devoted to the animals as I was. The men were supposed to look after them, but we alone did so. We absorbed, mated, separated, and bred them with considerable skill. We had no language to express ourselves, but one of our own. We were absolutely innocent and sweetly sympathetic with every beast. I don't think we ever connected their affairs with those of human beings, but as I do not remember the time when I did not know all about the actual facts of sex and reproduction, I presume I learned it all in that way, and life never had any surprises for me in that direction though I saw many sights that the child should not have seen while running about wild, I never gave them a thought. 
all animals great and small from rabbits to men had the same customs all natural and right my initiation here was in my eyes as nearly perfect as a child's should be i never asked grown people questions i thought all those in charge of me coarse and untruthful and i disliked all ugly things and suggestions every half-holiday i went out with the boys from my brother's school they always liked me to play with them and though not pleasant-tongued boys were always civil and polite to me i organized games and fortifications that they would never have imagined for themselves led storming parties and instituted some rather dangerous games of a fighting kind i taught my brothers to throw stones sometimes i led adventures such as breaking into empty houses i liked being out after dark in the winter i made and rigged boats and went sailing them and i went rafting and pole leaping i became a very good jumper and climber could go up a rope bowl overhand throw like a boy and whistle three different ways i collected beetles and butterflies and went shrimping and learned to fish i had very little money to spend but i picked things up and i made all traps nets cages and so on myself i learned from every working man i could get hold of the use of all ordinary carpenter's tools and how to weld hot iron pave lay bricks and turf and so on when i was about eleven my parents got more mortified at my behaviour and perpetually threatened me with a boarding school i was told for months how it would take the nonsense out of me shape me tell me into a young lady my going was finally announced to me as a punishment to me for being what i was certainly the horror of going to this school and the cruel and unsympathetic way that i was sent there gave me a shock that i never got over the only thing that reconciled me to going was my intense indignation with those who sent me i appealed to be allowed to learn latin and boys subjects but was laughed at i was so helpless that i knew i could not run away without being caught or i would have run away anywhere from home and school i never cried or fretted but burned with anger and went like a trapped rabbit in no words can i describe the severity of the nervous shock or the suffering of my first year at school the school was noted for its severity and i heard that at one period the elder girls ran away so often that they wore a uniform dress i knew two who had run away the teachers in my time were ignorant self-indulgent women who cared nothing for the girls or their education and made much money out of them there was a suspicious reformatory atmosphere and my money was taken from me and my letters read i was intensely shy i hated the other girls there were no refinements anywhere i had no privacy in my room which was always overcrowded we had no hot water no baths improper food and no education we were not allowed to wear enough clean linen and for five years i never felt clean i never had one moment to myself was not allowed to read anything had even not enough lesson books was taught nothing to speak of except a little inferior music and drawing i never got enough exercise and was always tired and dull and could not keep my digestion in order my pride and self-respect were degraded in innumerable ways I suffered agonies of disgust, and the whole thing was a dreary penal servitude. I did not complain. I made friends with a few of the girls. Some of the older girls were attracted to me. Some talked of men and love affairs to me, but I was not greatly interested. No one ever spoke of any other matters of sex to me or in my hearing, but most of the girls were shy with me and I with them. In about two years' time the teachers got to like me and thought me one of the nicest girls, i certainly influenced them and got them to allow the girls more privileges i lay great stress upon the physical privations and disgust that i felt during these years the mental starvation was not quite so great because it was impossible for them to crush my mind as they did my body that it all materially aided to arrest the development of my body i am certain it is difficult to estimate sexual influences of which as a child i was practically unaware i certainly admired the liveliest and cleverest girls and made friends with them and disliked the common lumpy uneducated type that made two-thirds of my companions the lively girls liked me and i made several nice friends whom i have kept ever since one girl of about fifteen took a violent liking for me and figuratively speaking licked the dust from my shoes i would never take any notice of her when i was nearly sixteen one of my teachers began to notice me and be very kind to me she was twenty years older than i was 
She seemed to pity my loneliness and took me out for walks and sketching, and encouraged me to talk and think. It was the first time in my life that anyone had ever sympathized with me or tried to understand me, and it was a most beautiful thing to me. I felt like an orphan child who had suddenly acquired a mother, and through her I began to feel less antagonistic to grown people, and to feel the first respect I had ever felt for what they said. She petted me into a state of comparative docility, and made the other teachers like and trust me. My love for her was perfectly pure, and I thought of hers as simply maternal. She never roused the least feeling in me that I can think of as sexual. I liked her to touch me, and she sometimes held me in her arms or let me sit on her lap. At bedtime she used to come and say good night and kiss me upon the mouth. I think now that what she did was injudicious to a degree, and I wish I could believe it was as purely unselfish and kind as it seemed to me then. After I had left school, I wrote to her and visited her during a few years. Once she wrote to me that if I could give her employment, she would come and live with me. Once, when she was ill with neurasthenia, her friends asked me to go to the seaside with her, which I did. Here she behaved in an extraordinary way, becoming violently jealous over me with another elderly friend of mine who was there. I could hardly believe my senses, and was so astonished and disgusted that I never went near her again. She also accused me of not being loyal to her. To this day I have no idea what she meant. She then wrote and asked me what was wrong between us and I replied that after the words she had had with me my confidence in her was at an end. It gave me no particular pang, as I had by this time outgrown the simple gratitude of my childish days, and not replaced it by any stronger feeling. All my life I have had the profoundest repugnance to having any words with other women. I was much less interested in sex matters than other children of my age. I was altogether less precautious, though I knew more, I imagined, than other girls. Nevertheless, by the time I was fifteen, social matters had begun to interest me greatly. It is difficult to say how this happened, as I was forbidden all books and newspapers, except in my holidays when I had generally a reading orgy, though not the books I needed or wanted. I had abundant opportunities for speculation, but no materials for any profitable thinking. Dreaming was forced upon me. I dreamed fairy tales by night and social dreams by day. In the night dreams, sometimes in the day dreams, I was always the prince or the pirate, rescuing beauty in distress or killing the unworthy. I had one dream which I had dreamt over and over again, and enjoyed and still sometimes dream. In this I was always hunting and fighting, often in the dark. There was usually a woman or a princess whom I admired, somewhere in the background, but I have never really seen her. Sometimes I was a stowaway on board ship, or an Indian hunter, or a backwoodsman, making a log cabin for my wife, or rather some companion. My day thoughts were not about the women round about me, or even about the one who was so kind to me. They were almost impersonal. I went on, at any rate, from myself to what I thought the really ideal, and built up a very beautiful vision of solid human friendship in which there was everything that was strong and wholesome on either side but very little of sex. To imagine this, in its fullness, I had to imagine all social, family, and educational conditions vastly different from anything I had come across. From this my thoughts ran largely on social matters. In whatever direction my thoughts ran, I always surveyed them from the point of view of a boy. I was trying to wait patiently till I could escape from slavery and starvation, and trying to keep the open mind I have spoken of, though I never opened a book of poetry, or a novel, or a history, but I slipped naturally back into my non-girl's attitude and read it through my own eyes. All my surface life was a sham, and only through books, which were few, did I ever see the world naturally. A consideration of social matters led me to feel very sorry for women, whom I regarded as made by a deliberate process of manufacture into the fools I thought they were, and by the same process that I myself was being made one. I felt more and more that men were to be envied and women pitied. I lay stress on this, for it started in me a deliberate interest in women as women. I began to feel protective and kindly toward women and children, and to excuse women from their responsibility for calamities such as my school career. I never imagined that men required 
or would have thanked me for any sort of sympathy but it came about in these ways and without the least help that i can trace that by the time i was nineteen years of age i was keenly interested in all kinds of questions pity for downtrodden women suffrage questions marriage laws questions of liberty freedom of thought care of the poor views of nature and man and god all these things filled my mind to the exclusion of individual men and women as soon as i left school i made a headlong plunge into books where these things were treated i had the answers to everything to find after a long period of enforced starvation i had to work for my knowledge no books or ideas came near me but what i went in search of another thing that helped me to take an expansive view of life at this time was my intense love of nature all birds and animals affected me by their beauty and grace and i have always kept a profound sympathy with them as well as some subtle understanding which enables me to tame them at times remarkably i not only loved all other creatures but i believed that men and women were the most beautiful things in the universe and i would rather look at them unclothed than on any other thing as my greatest pleasure i was prepared to like them because they were beautiful when the time came for me to leave school i rather dreaded it chiefly because i dreaded my life at home i had a great longing at this time to run away and try my fortune anywhere possibly if i had been stronger i might have done so but i was in a very poor health through the physical crushing i had had and in a very poor spirit through this and my mental repression i still knew myself a prisoner and i was bitterly disappointed and ashamed at having no education i afterward had myself taught arithmetic and other things the next period of my life which covered about six years was not less important to my development and was a time of extreme misery to me it found me on leaving school almost a child this time between eighteen and twenty-four should i think count as my proper period of puberty which probably in most children occupies the end years of their school life it was at this time that i began to make a good many friends of my own and to become aware of physical and sexual attractions i had never come across any theories on the subject but i decided that they must belong to a third sex of some kind i used to wonder if i was like the neuter bees i knew physical and psychical sex feeling and yet i seemed to know it quite otherwise from other men and women i asked myself if i could endure living a woman's life bearing children and doing my duty by them i asked myself what hiatus there could be between my bodily structure and my feelings and also what was the meaning of the strong physical feelings which had me in their grip without choice of my own opening bracket experience of physical sex sensations first began about sixteen in sleep masturbation was accidentally discovered at the age of nineteen abandoned at twenty-eight and then at thirty-four deliberately resumed as a method of purely physical relief closing bracket these three things simply would not be reconciled and i said to myself that i must find a way of living in which there was as little sex of any kind as possible there was something that i simply lacked that i never doubted curiously enough i thought that the ultimate explanation might be that there were men's minds in women's bodies but i was more concerned in finding a way of life than in asking riddles without answers i thought that one day when i had money and opportunity i would dress in men's clothes and go to another country in order that i might be unhampered by sex considerations and conventions i determined to live an honourable upright and simple life i had no idea at first that homosexual attractions in women existed afterward observations on the lower animals put the idea into my head i made no preparation in my mind for any sexual life though i thought it would be a dreary business repressing my body all my days my relations with other women were entirely pure my attitude toward my sexual physical feelings was one of reserve and repression and i think the growing conviction of my radical deficiency somewhere would have made intimate affection for anyone with any demonstration in it a kind of impropriety for which i had no taste however between twenty one and twenty four other things happened to me during these few years i saw plenty of men and plenty of women as regards the men i liked them very well but i never thought the man would turn up with whom i should care to live several men were very friendly with me and three in particular used to write me letters and give me much of their confidence i invited two of them to visit at my house 
all these men talked to me with freedom and even told me about their sexual ideas and doings one asked me to believe that he was leading a good life the other two owned that they were not one discussed the question of homosexuality with me he has never married i liked one of them a good deal being attracted by his softness and gentleness and almost feminine voice it was hoped that i would take to him and he very cautiously made love to me i allowed him to kiss me a few times and wrote him a few responsive letters wondering what i liked in him someone then commented on the acquaintance and said marriage and i woke up to the fact that i did not really want him at all i think he found the friendship too insipid and was glad to be out of it all these men were a trifle feminine in characteristics and too played no games i thought it odd that they should all express admiration for the very boyish qualities in me that other people disliked a fourth man something of the same type told another friend that he always felt surprised at how freely he was able to talk to me but that he never could feel that i was a woman two of these were brilliantly clever men two were artists at the same period or earlier i made a number of women friends and of course saw more of them i chose out some and some chose me i think i attracted them as much as or even more than they attracted me i do not quite remember if this was so though i can say for certain it was so at school there were three or four bright clever young women whom i got to know then with whom i was great friends we were interested in books social theories politics art sometimes i visited them or we went on exploring expeditions to many country places or towns they all in the end either had love affairs or married i know that in spite of all our free conversations they never talked to me as they did to each other we were always a little shy with each other but i got very fond of at least four of them i admired them and when i was tired and worried i often thought how easily if i had been a man i could have married and settled down with one or the other i used to think it would be delightful to have a woman to work for and take care of my attraction to these women was very strong but i don't think they knew it i seldom even kissed them but i should often have cheerfully given them a good hugging and kissing if i had thought it a right or proper thing to do i never wanted them to kiss me half so much as i wanted to kiss them in these years i felt this with every woman i admired occasionally i experienced slight erections when close to other women i am sure that no deliberate thought of mine caused them and as i had them at other times too when i was not expecting them i think it may have been accidental what i felt with my mind and what i felt with my body always at this time seemed apart i cannot accurately describe the interest and attraction that women then were to me i only know i never felt anything like it for men all my feelings of desire to do kindnesses to give presents to be liked and respected and all such natural small matters referred to women not to men and at this time both openly and to myself i said unhesitatingly that i liked women best it must be remembered that at this time a dislike for men was being forced in me by those who wanted me to marry and this must have counted for more than i now remember as regards my physical sexual feelings which were well established during these few years i don't think i often indulged in any erotic imaginations worth estimating but so far as i did at all i always imagined myself as a man loving a woman i cannot recall ever imagining the opposite but i seldom imagined anything at all and i suppose ultimate sex sensations know no sex but as time went on and my physical and psychical feelings met at any rate in my own mind i became fully aware of the meaning of love and even of homosexual possibilities i should probably have thought more of this side of things except that during this time i was so worried by the difficulty of living in my home under the perpetual friction of comparison with other people my life was a sham i was an actor never off the boards i had to play at being a something i was not from morning till night and i had no cessation of the long fatigue i had had at school in addition i had sex to deal with actively and cautiously looking back on these twenty-four years of my life i only look back on a round of misery the nervous strain was enormous and so was the moral strain instead of a child i felt myself whenever i desired to please anyone else a performing monkey 
my pleasures were stolen or i was snubbed for taking them i was not taught and was called a fool my hand was against everybody's how it was that with my high spirits and vivid imagination i did not grow up a moral imbecile full of perverted instincts i do not know i describe myself as a docile child but i was full of temptations to be otherwise there were times when i was silent before people but if i had had a knife in my hand i could have stuck it into them if it had been desired to make me a thoroughly perverted being i can imagine no better way than the attempt to mould me by force into a particular pattern of girl looking at my instincts in my first childhood and my mental confusion over myself i do not believe the most sympathetic and scientific treatment would have turned me into an average girl but i see no reason why proper physical conditions should not have induced a better physical development and that in its turn have led to tastes more approximate to those of the normal woman that i do not even now desire to be a normal woman is not to the point instead of any such help i suffered during the time that should have been puberty from a profound mental and physical shock which was extended over several years and in addition i suffered from the outrage of every fine and wholesome feeling i had these things by checking my physical development gave i am perfectly convinced a traumatic impetus to my general abnormality and this was further kept up by demanding of me at the dawn of my real sexual activity and when still practically a child an interest in men and marriage which i was no more capable of feeling than any ordinary boy or girl of fifteen if you had taken a boy of thirteen and given him all my conditions bound him hand and foot when you became afraid of him petted him into docility and then placed him in the world and while urging normal sexuality upon him on the one hand made him disgusted with it on the other what would have been the probable result looking back i can only say i think the results in my own case were marvellously good and that i was saved from worse by my own innocence and by the physical backwardness which nature probably in mercy bestowed upon me i find it difficult to sum up the way in which i affect other women and they me i can only record my conviction that i do affect a large number whether abnormally or not i don't know but i attract them and it would be easy for some of them to become very fond of me if i gave them a chance they are also i am certain more shy with me than they are with other women i find it difficult also to sum up their effect on me i only know that some women attract me and some tempt me physically and have done ever since i was about twenty-two or twenty-three i know that physically i have always been more interested in women than in men but have not considered them the best companions or confidants i feel protective towards them never feel jealous of them and hate having differences with them and i feel always that i am not one of them if there had been any period in my life when health and temptation and money and opportunity had made homosexual relations easy i cannot say how i should have resisted i think that i have never had any such relations simply because i have in a way been safeguarded from them for a long time i thought i must do without all actual sexual relations and acted up to that if i had thought any relations right and possible i think i should have striven for heterosexual experiences because of the respect that i had cultivated indeed i think always had for the normal and natural if i had thought it right to indulge any sort of gratification which was within my reach i think i might probably have chosen the homosexual as being perhaps more satisfying and more convenient i always wanted love and friendship first later i should have been glad of something to satisfy my sex hunger too but by that time i could have done without it or i thought so at a period rather later than that dealt with in this narrative the subject of it became strongly attracted to a man who was of somewhat feminine and abnormal disposition but on consideration she decided that it would not be wise to marry him End of chapter four part five Chapter Four of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume Two by Havelock Ellis. Chapter Four: Sexual Inversion in Women, Part Six. The commonest characteristic of the sexually inverted woman is a certain degree of masculinity or boyishness as i have already pointed out transvestism 
in either women or men by no means necessarily involves inversion in the volume of women adventurers edited by mrs norman for the adventure series there is no trace of inversion in most of these cases indeed love for a man was precisely the motive for adopting male garments and manners again colley sibber's daughter charlotte chark a boyish and vivacious woman who spent much of her life in men's clothes and ultimately wrote a lively volume of memoirs appears never to have been attracted to women though women were often attracted to her believing her to be a man it is indeed noteworthy that women seem with special frequency to fall in love with disguised persons of their own sex there is however a very pronounced tendency among sexually inverted women to adopt male attire when practicable in such cases male garments are not usually regarded as desirable chiefly on account of practical convenience nor even in order to make an impression on other women but because the wearer feels more at home in them thus moll mentions the case of a young governess of sixteen who while still unconscious of her sexual perversion used to find pleasure when every one was out of the house in putting on the clothes of a youth belonging to the family cases have been recorded of inverted women who spent the greater part of their lives in men's clothing and been generally regarded as men i may cite the case of lucian slater alias the rev joseph lobdell recorded by wise alienist and neurologist eighteen eighty three she was masculine in character features and attire in early life she married and had a child but had no affection for her husband who eventually left her as usual in such cases her masculine habits appeared in early childhood she was expert with a rifle lived the life of a trapper and hunter among the indians and was known as the female hunter of long eddy she published a book regarding those experiences i have not been able to see it but it is said to be quaint and well written she regarded herself as practically a man and became attached to a young woman of good education who had also been deserted by her husband the affection was strong and emotional and of course without deception it was interrupted by her recognition and imprisonment as a vagabond but on the petition of her wife she was released i may be a woman in one sense she said but i have peculiar organs which make me more a man than a woman she alluded to an enlarged clitoris which she could erect she said as a turtle protrudes its head but there was no question of its use in coitus she was ultimately brought to the asylum with paroxysmal attacks of exaltation and erotomania without self-abuse apparently and corresponding periods of depression and she died with progressive dementia i may also mention the case briefly recorded in the lancet february twenty second eighteen eighty four of a person called john coulter who was employed for twelve years as a labourer by the belfast harbour commissioners when death resulted from injuries caused in falling downstairs it was found that this person was a woman she was fifty years of age and had apparently spent the greater part of her life as a man when employed in early life as a man-servant on a farm she had married her mistress's daughter the pair were married for twenty-nine years but during the last six years lived apart owing to the husband's dissipated habits no one ever suspected her sex she was of masculine appearance and good muscular development the wife took charge of the body and buried it a more recent case of the same kind is that of mary hall who died in new york in eighteen o one her real name was mary anderson and she was born at govan in scotland early left an orphan on the death of her only brother she put on his clothes and went to edinburgh working as a man her secret was discovered during an illness and she finally went to america where she lived as a man for thirty years making money and becoming somewhat notorious as a tammany politician a rather riotous man about town the secret was not discovered till her death when it was a complete revelation even to her adopted daughter she married twice the first marriage ended in separation but the second marriage seemed to have been happy for it lasted twenty years when the wife died she associated much with pretty girls and was very jealous of them she seems to have been slight and not very masculine in general build with a squeaky voice but her ways attitude and habits were all essentially masculine she associated with politicians drank somewhat to excess though not heavily swore a great deal smoked and chewed tobacco sang ribald songs could run dance and fight like a man and had divested herself of every trace of feminine daintiness she wore clothes that were always rather too large in order to hide her form 
baggy trousers and an overcoat even in summer she is said to have died of cancer of the breast i quote from an account which appears to be reliable contained in the weekly scotsman february the ninth nineteen o one another case described in the london papers is that of catherine coombe who for forty years successfully personated a man and adopted masculine habits generally she married a lady's maid with whom she lived for fourteen years having latterly adopted a life of fraud her case gained publicity as that of the man woman in nineteen o one the death on board ship was recorded of miss caroline hall of boston a water-colour painter who had long resided in milan three years previously she discarded female dress and lived as husband to a young italian lady also an artist whom she had already known for seven years she called herself mr hall and appeared to be a thoroughly normal young man able to shoot with a rifle and fond of manly sports the officers of the ship stated that she smoked and drank heartily joked with the other male passengers and was hail fellow well met with every one death was due to advanced tuberculosis of the lungs hastened by excessive drinking and smoking ellen gled alias ellis gland a notorious swindler who came prominently before the public in chicago during nineteen o five was another man-woman of large and masculine type she preferred to dress as a man and had many love escapades with women she can fiddle as well as anyone in the state said a man who knew her can box like a pugilist and can dance and play cards in seville a few years ago an elderly policeman who had been in attendance on successive governors of that city for thirty years was badly injured in a street accident he was taken to the hospital and the doctor there discovered that the policeman was a woman she went by the name of fernando mackenzie and during the whole of her long service no suspicion whatever was aroused as to her sex she was french by birth born in paris in eighteen thirty six but her father was english and her mother was spanish she assumed her male disguise when she was a girl and served her time in the french army then emigrated to spain at the age of thirty-five and contrived to enter the madrid police force disguised as a man she married there and pretended that her wife's child was her own son she removed to seville still serving as a policeman and was engaged there as cook and orderly at the governor's palace she served seven successive governors in consequence of the discovery of her sex she has been discharged from the police without the pension due to her her wife had died two years previously and fernando spent all she possessed on the woman's funeral mackenzie had a soft voice a refined face with delicate features and was neatly dressed in male attire when asked how she escaped detection so long she replied that she always lived quietly in her own house with her wife and did her duty by her employers so that no one meddled with her in chicago in nineteen o six much attention was attracted to the case of nikolai de Raylan, confidential secretary to the russian consul who at death of tuberculosis at the age of thirty-three was found to be a woman she was born in russia and was in many respects very feminine small and slight in build but was regarded as a man and even as very manly by both men and women who knew her intimately she was always very neat in dress fastidious in regard to shirts and ties and wore a long waisted coat to disguise the lines of her figure she was married twice in america being divorced by the first wife after a union lasting ten years on the ground of cruelty and misconduct with chorus girls the second wife a chorus girl who had been previously married and had a child was devoted to her husband both wives were firmly convinced that their husband was a man and ridiculed the idea that he could be a woman i am informed that de raylan wore a very elaborately constructed artificial penis in her will she made careful arrangements to prevent detection of sex after death but these were frustrated as she died in a hospital in st louis in nineteen o nine the case was brought forward of a young woman of twenty-two who had posed as a man for nine years her masculine career began at the age of thirteen after the galveston flood which swept away all her family she was saved and left texas dressed as a boy she worked in livery stables in a plough factory and as a bill poster at one time she was the adopted son of the family in which she lived and had no difficulty in deceiving her sisters by adoption as to her sex on coming to st louis in nineteen o two she made chairs and baskets at the american rotten works associating with fellow workmen on a footing of muscle inequality one day a workman noticed the extreme smallness and dexterity of her hands gee bill you should have been a girl 
"'How do you know I'm not?' she retorted. In such ways, her ready wit and good humour always disarmed suspicions to her sex. She shunned no difficulties in her work or in her sports, we are told, and never avoided the severest tests. She drank, she swore, she courted girls, she walked as hard as her fellows, and fished and camped. She told stories with the best of them, and she did not flinch when the talk grew strong. She even chewed tobacco. Girls began to fall in love with a good-looking boy at an early period, and she frequently boasted of her feminine conquests. With one girl who worshipped her there was a question of marriage. On account of lack of education she was restricted to manual labour, and she often chose hard work. At one time she became a boilermaker's apprentice, yielding a hammer and driving in hot rivets. Here she was very popular and became local secretary of the International Brotherhood of Boiler Makers. In physical development she was now somewhat of an athlete. She could outrun any of her friends on a sprint. She could kick higher, play baseball, and throw the ball overhand like a man. And she was fond of football. As a wrestler she could throw most of the club members. The physician who examined her for an insurance policy remarked, You are a fine specimen of physical manhood, young fellow take care of yourself. Finally, in a moment of weakness, she admitted her sex and returned to the garments of womanhood. In London, in 1912, a servant girl of 23 was charged in the Acton Police Court with being disorderly and masquerading, having assumed man's clothes and living with another girl, taller and more handsome than herself, as husband and wife. She had had slight brain trouble as a child and was very intelligent, with a too active brain. In her spare time she had written stories for magazines. The two girls became attached through doing Christian social work together in their spare time and resolved to leave as husband and wife to prevent any young man from coming forward. The husband became a plumber's mate and displayed some skills at fisticuffs when at length discovered by the wife's brother. Hence her appearance in the police court. Both girls were sent back to their friends in situations found for them as day servants. But as they remained devoted to each other, arrangements were made for them to live together. Another case that may be mentioned is that of Cora Anderson, the man-woman of Milwaukee, who posed for thirteen years as a man and during that period lived with two women as her wives, without her disguise being penetrated. Her confessions were published in the Day Book of Chicago during May 1914. It would be easy to bring forward other cases, a few instances of marriage between women, will be found in The Alienist and Neurologist, November 1902, page 497. In all such cases, more or less, fraud has been exercised. I know of one case, probably unique, in which the ceremony was gone through, without any deception on any side. A congenitally inverted English woman of distinguishable intellectual ability, now dead, was attached to the wife of a clergyman who, in full cognizance of all the facts of the case, privately married the two ladies in his own church. When they still retain female garments, these usually show some traits of masculine simplicity, and there is nearly always a disdain for the petty feminine artifices of the toilet. Even when this is not obvious, there are all sorts of instinctive gestures and habits which may suggest to female acquaintances the remark that such a person ought to have been a man. The brusque, energetic movements, the attitude of the arms, the direct speech, the inflections of the voice, the masculine straightforwardness and sense of honour, and especially the attitude toward men, free from any suggestion other of shyness or audacity, will often suggest the underlying psychic abnormality to a keen observer. In the habit not only is there frequently pronounced taste for smoking cigarettes, often found in quite feminine women, but also a decided taste and toleration for cigars. There is also a dislike and sometimes incapacity for needlework and other domestic occupations, while there is often some capacity for athletics. As regards the general bearing of the inverted woman, in its most marked and undisguised form, I may quote an admirable description by Professor Zuccarelli of Naples of an unmarried middle-class woman of thirty-five. While retaining feminine garments, her bearing is as nearly as possible a man's. She wears her thin hair thrown carelessly back a la Umberto and fastened in a simple knot at the back of her head. The breasts are little developed and compressed beneath a high corset. Her gown is narrow without the expansion demanded by fashion. Her straw hat with broad plates is perhaps adorned by a feather or she wears a small hat like a boy's. She does not carry an umbrella or sunshade 
and walks out alone refusing the company of men or she is accompanied by a woman as she prefers offering her arm and carrying the other hand at her waist with the air of a fine gentleman in a carriage her bearing is peculiar and unlike that habitual with women seated in the middle of the double seat her knees being crossed or else the legs well separated with a virile air and careless easy movements she turns her head in every direction finding an acquaintance here and there with her eye saluting men and women with a large gesture of the hand as a businessman would in conversation her pose is similar she gesticulates much is vivacious in speech with much power of mimicry and while talking she arches the inner angles of her eyebrow making vertical wrinkles at the centre of her forehead her laugh is open and explosive and uncovers her white rows of teeth with men she is on terms of careless equality inversione congenita dell'istinto sessuale in una donna l'anomalo february eighteen eighty nine the inverted woman hirschfeld truly remarks the homosexualität page one hundred fifty eight is more full of life of enterprise of practical energy more aggressive more heroic more apt for adventure than either the heterosexual woman or the homosexual man sometimes he adds her mannishness may approach reckless brutality and her courage becomes rashness this author observes however in another place page two hundred seventy two that in addition to this group of inverted women with masculine traits there is another group not less large of equally inverted women who are outwardly as thoroughly feminine as are normal women this is not an observation which i am able to confirm it appears to me that the great majority of inverted women possess some masculine or boyish traits even though only as slight as those which may occasionally be revealed by normal women extreme femininity in my observation is much more likely to be found in bisexual than in homosexual women just as extreme masculinity is much more likely to be found in bisexual than in homosexual men end of chapter four part six chapter four of studies in the psychology of sex volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org studies in the psychology of sex volume two by havelock ellis chapter four sexual inversion in women part seven while inverted women frequently though not always convey an impression of mannishness or boyishness there are no invariable anatomical characteristics associated with this impression there is for instance no uniform tendency to a masculine distribution of hair nor must it be supposed that the presence of a beard in a woman indicates a homosexual tendency bearded women as hirschfeld remarks are scarcely ever inverted and it would seem that the strongest reversal of secondary sexual characters less often accompany homosexuality than slighter modifications of these characters a faint moustache and other slight manifestations of hypertrichosis also by no means necessarily indicate homosexuality to some extent it is a matter of race thus in the para district of constantinople weisenberg among nearly seven hundred women between about eighteen and fifty years of age noted that ten per cent showed hair on the upper lip they were most often armenians the greeks coming next there has been some dispute as to whether apart from homosexuality hypertrichosis in a woman can be regarded as an indication of a general masculinity this is denied by max bartels in his elaborate study Uber abnorme beharung beim menschen Zeitschrift für Ethnologie, 1876, page 127, 1881, page 219, and, as regards insanity, by L. Harris Liston, Cases of Bearded Women, British Medical Journal, June 2, 1894. On the other hand, J. H. Claiborne, Hypertrichosis in Women, New York Medical Journal, June 13, 1914, believes that hair on the face and body in a woman is a sign of masculinity women with hypertrichosis possess masculine traits there seems to be very little doubt that fully developed bearded women are in most possibly not all cases decidedly feminine in all other respects a typical instance is furnished by annie jones the esau lady of virginia she belonged to a large and entirely normal family but herself possessed a full beard with thick whiskers and moustache of an entirely masculine type she also showed short dark hair on arms and hands resembling a man 
Apart from this heterogeny, she was entirely normal and feminine. At the age of twenty-six, when examined in Berlin, the hair of the head was very long, the expression of the face entirely feminine, the voice also feminine, the figure elegant, the hands and feet entirely of feminine type, the external and internal genitalia altogether feminine. Annie Jones was married. Max Bartels, who studied Annie Jones and published her portrait, Zeitschrift für Ethnologie, 1891, Heft 3, page 243, remarks that in these respects Annie Jones resembles other bearded women. They marry half children and are able to suckle them. A beard in women seems, as Dupre and Duflos believe, Revue Neurologique, August 30th, 1901, to be more closely correlated with neuropathy than with masculinity. Comparing a thousand sane women with a thousand insane women in Paris, they found an unusual degree of hair or down on the face in 23% of the former and 50% of the latter. But even the sane bearded women frequently belong to neuropathic families. A tendency to slight widely diffused hypertrichosis of the body generally, not localized or highly developed on the face, seems much more likely than a beard to be associated with masculinity, even when it occurs in little girls. Thus, Virchow once presented to the Berlin Anthropological Society a little girl of five of this type who also possessed a deep and rough voice. Zeitschrift für Ethnologie, 1891, Heft 4, page 469. A typical example of slight hypertrichosis in a woman associated with general masculine traits is furnished by a description and figure of the body of a woman of 56 in an anatomical institute, furnished by C. Strauch. Zeitschrift für Ethnologie, 1901, heft 6, page 534. In this case there was a growth of hair around both nipples, and a line of hair extended from the pubes to the navel. Both these two dispositions of hair are very rare in women. In Vienna, among nearly 700 women, Co. only found a tendency to hair distribution toward the navel in about 1%. While the hair in this subject was otherwise fairly normal, there were many approximations to the muslin type in other respects. The muscles were strongly developed, the bones massive, the limbs long, the joints powerful, the hands and feet large, the thorax well developed, the lower jaw massive. There was an absence of feminine curves on the body, and the breasts were scarcely perceptible. At the same time the genital organs were normal, and there had been childbirth. It was further notable that this woman had committed suicide by self-strangulation, a rare method which requires great resolution and strength of will, as at any moment of the process the pressure can be removed. There seems little doubt that inverted women frequently tend to show minor anomalies of the piliferous system, and especially slight hypertrichosis and a muslin distribution of hair. Thus, in a very typical case of inversion in an Italian girl of 19 who dressed as a man and ran away from home, the down on the arms and legs was marked to an unusual extent, and there was very abundant hair in the armpits and on the pubes, with a tendency to the muslin distribution. Of the three cases described in this chapter, which I am best acquainted with, one possesses an unusually small amount of hair on the pubes and in the axilla, oligotrichosis terminalis, approximating to the infantile type, while another presents a complex and very rare piliferous heterogeny. There is a marked dark down on the upper lip, the pubic hair is thick, and there is hair on toes and feet and legs to umbilicus. There are also a few hairs around the nipples. A woman physician in the United States who knows many female inverts similarly tells me that she has observed the tendency to growth of hair on the legs. If, as is not improbable, inversion is associated with some abnormal balance in the internal secretions, it is not difficult to understand this tendency to piliferous anomalies, and we know that the thyroid secretion, for instance, and much more the testicular and ovarian secretions, have a powerful influence on the hair. Ballantyne, some years ago, in discussing congenital hypertrichosis, Manual of Antenatal Pathology, 1902, pages 321-6, to concluded that the theory of arrested development is best supported by the facts. Persistence of lanugo is such an arrest, and hypertrichosis may largely be considered a persistence of lanugo. Such a conclusion is still tenable, though it encounters some difficulties and inconsistencies, and it largely agrees with what we know of the condition as associated with inversion in women. But we are now beginning to see that this arrested development may be definitely associated with anomalies in the internal secretions, and even with special chemical defects in these secretions. Viral strength has always been associated with hair, as the story of Samson bears witness. 
Amon found among Baden conscripts, L'Anthropologie, 1896, page 285, that when the men were divided into classes according to the amount of hair on body, the first class with least hair have the smallest circumference of testicles, the fewest number of men with glance penis uncovered, the largest number of infantile voices, the largest proportion of blue eyes and fair hair, the smallest average height, weight and chest circumference, while in all these respects the men with hairy bodies were at the other extreme. It has been known from antiquity that in men early castration affects the growth of hair. It is now known that in women the presence or absence of the ovary and other glands affects the hair as well as sexual development. Thus, Heger, by Trege zur Geburtshilfe und Gynäkologie, Volume 1, page 111, 1898, described a girl with pelvis of infantile type and uterine malformation who had been unusually hairy on face and body from infancy with masculine arrangement of hair on pubes and abdomen. Menstruation was scanty, breasts atrophic, the hair was of lanugo type. We see here how in women infantile and masculine characteristics are associated with, and both probably dependent on, defects in the sexual glands. Plant, Central Blood Fjord Gynecology, number 9, 1896, described another girl with very small ovaries, rudimentary uterus, small vagina, and prominent nymphae, in whom menstruation was absent hair on head long and strong, but hair absent in armpits and scanty on mons veneris. These two cases seem inconsistent as regards hair, and we should now wish to know the condition of the other internal glands. The thyroid, for instance, it is now known, controls the hair, as well as do the sexual glands, and the thyroid, as Gautier has shown, Académie de Médecine, July 24, 1900, elaborates arsenic and iodine, which nourish the skin and hair. He found that the administration of sodium cacodylate to young women produced abundant growth of hair on head. Again, the kidneys, and especially the adrenal glands, influence the hair. It has long been known that in girls with congenital renal tumors, there is an abnormally early growth of auxiliary and pubic hair. Goldschwind, Präger Medizinische Wochenschrift, Numbers 37 and 38, 1910 has described the case of a woman of 39 with small ovaries and adrenal tumor in whom hair began to grow on chin and cheeks. See also C. T. Ewart, Lancet, May 19, 1915. Once more, the glans hypothesis also affects hair growth, and it has been found by Levy, quoted in Archives d'Anthropologie Criminelle, August-September, 1912, page 711 that the administration of hypotheses extract to an infantile hairless woman of twenty-seven without sexual feeling produced a general tendency to growth of hair such facts not only help to explain the anomalies of hair development but also indicate the direction in which we may find an explanation of the anomalies of the sexual impulse apart from the complicated problems presented by the hair there are genuine approximations to the masculine type the muscles tend to be everywhere firm with a comparative absence of soft connective tissue so that an inverted woman may give an unfeminine impression to the sense of touch. A certain tonicity of the muscles has indeed often been observed in homosexual women. Hirschfeld found that two-thirds of inverted women are more muscular than normal women, while, on the other hand, he found that among inverted men the musculature was often weak. Not only is the tone of the voice often different, but there is reason to suppose that this rests on a basis of anatomical modification. At Moll's suggestion, Flateau examined the larynx in a large number of inverted women and found in several a very decidedly masculine type of larynx, or an approach to it, especially in cases of distinctly congenital origin. Hirschfeld has confirmed Flateau's observations on this point. It may be added that inverted women are very often good whistlers. Hirschfeld even notes two who are public performers in whistling. It is scarcely necessary to remark that while the old proverb associates whistling in a woman with crowing in a hen, Whistling in a woman is no evidence of any general physical or psychic inversion. As regards the sexual organs, it seems possible, so far as my observations go, to speak more definitely of inverted women than of inverted men. In all three of the cases concerning whom I have precise information, among those whose histories are recorded in the present chapter, there is more or less arrested development and infantilism. 
In one, a somewhat small vagina and prominent nymphae with local sensitiveness are associated with oligotrichosis. In another, the sexual parts are in some respects rather small, while there is no trace of ovary on one side. In the third case, together with hypertrichosis, the nates are small, the nymphae large, the clitoris deeply hooded, the hymen thick and the vagina probably small. These observations, though few, are significant and they accord with those of other observers. Kraft Ebbing well described a case which I should be inclined to regard as typical of many. Sexual organs feminine in character, but remaining at the infantile stage of a girl of ten, small clitoris, prominent coxcomb-like nymphae, small vagina scarcely permitting normal intercourse and very sensitive. Hirschfeld agrees in finding common an approach to the type described by Kraft Ebbing. Atrophic anomalies he regards as more common than hypertrophic, and he refers to thickness of hymen and a tendency to notably small uterus and ovaries. The clitoris is more usually small than large. Women with a large clitoris, as Parent du Chatelet long since remarked, seem rarely to be of masculine type. Notwithstanding these tendencies, however, sexual inversion in a woman is, as a rule, not more obvious than in a man. At the same time, the inverted woman is not usually attractive to men. She herself generally feels the greatest indifference to men, and often cannot understand why a woman should love a man, though she easily understands why a man should love a woman. She shows, therefore, nothing of that sexual shyness and engaging air of weakness and dependence which are an invitation to men. The man who is passionately attracted to an inverted woman is usually of rather a feminine type. For instance, in one case present to my mind, he was of somewhat neurotic heredity, of slight physical development, not sexually attractive to women, and very domesticated in his manner of living. In short, a man who might easily have been passionately attracted to his own sex. While the inverted woman is called, or at most comradely, in her bearing toward men, she may become shy and confused in the presence of attractive persons of her own sex, even unable to undress in their presence, and full of tender ardor for the woman whom she loves. Homosexual passion in women finds more or less complete expression in kissing, slipping together, and close embraces, as in what is sometimes called lying spoons, when one woman lies on her side with her back turned to her friend and embraces her from behind, fitting her thighs into the bend of her companion's legs, so that her moans veneris is in close contact with the other's buttocks, and slight movement then produces mild erethism. One may also lie on the other's body, or there may be mutual masturbation. Mutual contact and friction of the sexual parts seem to be comparatively rare, but it seems to have been common in antiquity, for we owe to it the term tribadism, which is sometimes used as a synonym of feminine homosexuality, and this method is said to be practiced today by the southern Slav women of the Balkans. The extreme gratification in Canilinctus is oral stimulation of the feminine sexual organs, not usually mutual, but practiced by the more active and masculine partner. This act is sometimes termed, by no means satisfactorily, sophism and lesbianism. An enlarged clitoris is but rarely found in inversion, and plays a very small part in the gratification of feminine homosexuality. Kirner refers to a case occurring in America in which an inverted woman, married and a mother, possessed a clitoris, which measured two and a half inches when erect. Casanova described an inverted Swiss woman, otherwise feminine in development, whose clitoris in excitement was longer than his little finger and capable of penetration. The older literature contains many similar cases. In most such cases, however, we are probably concerned with some form of pseudo-hermaphroditism, and the clitoris may more properly be regarded as a penis. There is thus no inversion involved. While the use of the clitoris is rare in homosexuality, the use of an artificial penis is by no means uncommon and very widespread. In several of the modern cases, in which inverted women have married women, such as those of Charlotte Ave and de Raylan, the belief of the wife in the masculinity of the husband has been due to an appliance of this kind used in intercourse. The artificial penis, the olisbos or baubon, was well known to the Greeks and is described by Herondas. Its invention was ascribed by Swedes to the Miletian women, and Miletus, according to Aristophanes, in the Lysistrata, was the chief place of its manufacture. It was still known in medieval times, and in the twelfth century, Bishop Burkhardt of Worms speaks of its use as a thing which some women are accustomed to do. 
In the early 18th century, Margareta Lincoln, again in Germany, married another woman with the aid of an artificial male organ. The artificial penis is also used by homosexual women in various parts of the world. Thus we find it mentioned in legends of the North American Indians, and it is employed in Zanzibar and Madagascar. The various phenomena of sadism, masochism, and fetishism, which are liable to arise spontaneously or by suggestion in the relationships of normal lovers, as well as of male inverts, may also arise in the same way among inverted women, though probably not often in a very pronounced form. Moll, however, narrates a case, Contrere Sexualempfindung, 1899, pages 565 to 70, in which various minor but very definite perversions were combined with inversion. A young lady of 26, of good heredity, from the age of six, had only been attracted to her own sex, and even in childhood had practiced mutual cunnilinctus. She was extremely intelligent and of generous and good-natured disposition, with various masculine tastes, but on the whole of feminine build and with completely feminine larynx. During seven years she lived exclusively with one woman. She found complete satisfaction in active cunnilinctus. During the course of this relationship various other methods of excitement and gratification arose, it seems for the most part spontaneously. She found much pleasure in urolagnic and coprolagnic practices. In addition to these and similar perversions, the subject liked being bitten, especially in the lobule of the ear, and she was highly excited when whipped by her friend, who should, if possible, be naked at the time. Only the nates must be whipped, and only a birch rod be used, or the effect would not be obtained. These practices would not be possible to her in the absence of extreme intimacy and mutual understanding, and they only took place with the one friend. In this case, the perverse phenomena were masochistic rather than sadistic. Many homosexual women, however, display sadistic tendencies in a more or less degree. Thus, Dr. Kinnon tells me of an American case, with which he was professionally concerned with Dr. Moyer. See also paper by Kiernan and Moyer in Alienist and Neurologist, May 1907, of a sadistic inverted woman in a small Illinois city, married and with two young children. She was of undoubted neuropathic stock, and there was a history of premarital masturbation and bestiality with a dog. She was a prominent club woman in her city, and a leader in religious and social matters. As is often the case with sadists, she was pruriently prudish, and there was strong testimony to her chaste and modest character by clergymen, club women, and local magnates. The victim of her sadistic passion was a girl she had adopted from a home, but whom she half starved. On this girl she inflicted over three hundred wounds. Many of these wounds were stabbed with forks and scissors, which merely penetrated the skin. This was especially the case with those inflicted on the breasts, labia, and clitoris. During the infliction of these, she experienced intense excitement, but this excitement was under control, and when she heard anyone approaching, she instantly desisted. She was found sane and responsible at the time of these actions, but the jury also found that she had since become insane, and she was sent to an insane hospital, after recovery to serve a sentence of two years in prison. The alleged insanity, Dr. Kiernan adds, was of the dubious manic and depressive variety, and perhaps chiefly due to wounded pride. The inverted woman is an enthusiastic admirer of feminine beauty, especially of the statuesque beauty of the body, unlike, in this, the normal woman, whose sexual emotion is but faintly tinged by aesthetic feeling. In her sexual habits, we perhaps less often find the degree of promiscuity which is not uncommon among inverted men, and we may perhaps agree with more that homosexual women are more often apt to love faithfully and lastingly than homosexual men. Hirschfeld remarks that inverted women are not usually attracted in childhood by the autoerotic and homosexual vices of school life, and nearly all the women whose histories I have recorded in this chapter felt a pronounced repugnance to such manifestations and cherished lofty ideals of love. Inverted women are not rarely married. Moll, from various confidences which he has received, believes that inverted women have not the same horror of normal coitus as inverted men. This is probably due to the fact that the woman under such circumstances can retain a certain passivity. In other cases, there is some degree of bisexuality, although, as among inverted men, the homosexual instinct seems usually to give the greater relief and gratification. 
it has been stated by many observers in america in france in germany and in england that homosexuality is increasing among women there are many influences in our civilization today which encourage such manifestations the modern movement of emancipation the movement to obtain the same rights and duties as men the same freedom and responsibility the same education and the same work must be regarded as on the whole a wholesome and inevitable movement but it carries with it certain disadvantages women are very justly coming to look upon knowledge and experience generally as their right as much as their brother's right but when this doctrine is applied to the sexual sphere it finds certain limitations intimacies of any kind between young men and young women are as much discouraged socially now as ever they were as regards higher education the mere association of the sexes in the lecture room or the laboratory or the hospital is discouraged in england and in america while men are allowed freedom the sexual field of women is becoming restricted to trivial flirtation with the opposite sex and to intimacy with their own sex having been taught independence of men and disdain for the old theory which places women in the moated grange of the home to sigh for a man who never comes a tendency develops for women to carry this independence still further and to find love where they find work these unquestionable influences of modern movements cannot directly cause sexual inversion but they develop the germs of it and they probably cause a spurious imitation this spurious imitation is due to the fact that the congenital anomaly occurs with special tendency in women of high intelligence who voluntarily or involuntarily influence others Corella, Bloch, and others believe that the woman movement has helped to develop homosexuality. See, for example, I. Bloch, Beiträge zur Etiologie der Psychopathia Sexualis, 1902, Volume 1, page 248. Various feminine string birds of the woman movement, as they have been termed, displayed marked hostility to men. Anna Rulling claims that many leaders of the movement, from the outset until today, have been inverted. Hirschfeld, however, Die Homosexualität, page 400, after giving special attention to the matter, concludes that, alike among English suffragettes and in the German Verein für Frauenstimmrecht, the percentage of inverts is less than 10%. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Ziegler. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2 by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 5. The Nature of Sexual Inversion, Part 1. Before stating briefly my own conclusions as to the nature of sexual inversion, I propose to analyze the facts brought out in the histories which I have been able to study. Race. All my cases, 80 in number, are British and American, 20 living in the United States and the rest being British. Ancestry, from the point of view of race, was not made a matter of special investigation. It appears, however, that at least 44 are English, or mainly English. At least 10 are Scotch or of Scotch extraction. Two are Irish, and four others largely Irish. Four have German fathers or mothers. Another is of German descent on both sides, while two others are of remote German extraction. Two are partly, and one entirely French. Two have a Portuguese strain, and at least two are more or less Jewish. Except the apparently frequent presence of the German element, there is nothing remarkable in this ancestry. Heredity. It is always difficult to deal securely with the significance of heredity, or even to establish a definite basis of facts. I have by no means escaped this difficulty, for in some cases I have not even had an opportunity of cross-examining the subjects whose histories I have obtained. Still, the facts, so far as they emerge, have some interest. I possess some record of heredity in 62 of my cases. Of these, not less than 24, or in the proportion of nearly 39%, assert that they have reason to believe that other cases of inversion have occurred in their families, and while in some it is only a strong suspicion, in others there is no doubt whatever. 
In one case, there is reason to suspect inversion on both sides. Usually the inverted relatives have been brothers, sisters, cousins, or uncles. In one case, a bisexual son seems to have had a bisexual father. This heredity character of inversion, which was denied by Nicky, is a fact of great significance, and, as it occurs in cases which I am well acquainted, I can have no doubt concerning the existence of the tendency. The influence of suggestion may often be entirely excluded, especially when the persons are of different sex. Both Kraft Ebing and Mall noted a similar tendency. Von Rumer states that in one-third of his cases there was inversion in other members of the family. Hirschfeld also found that there is a relatively high proportion of cases of family inversion. Twenty-six, so far as can be ascertained, belong to reasonably healthy families. Minute investigation would probably reduce the number of these, and it is noteworthy that even in some of the healthy families there was only one child born of the parent's marriage. In 28 cases there is more or less frequency of morbidity or abnormality, eccentricity, alcoholism, neurasthenia, insanity or nervous disease, on one or both sides, in addition to inversion or apart from it. In some of these cases the inverted offspring is the outcome of the union of a very healthy with a thoroughly morbid stock. In some others there is a minor degree of abnormality on both sides. General Health It is possible to speak with more certainty of the health of the individual than that of his family. Of the 80 cases, 53, or about two-thirds, may be said to enjoy good and sometimes even very good health, though occasionally there is some slight qualification to be made. In 22 cases the health is delicate, or at best only fair. In these cases there is sometimes a tendency to consumption, and often marked neurasthenia, and a more or less unbalanced temperament. Four cases are morbid to a considerable degree. The remaining case had had insane delusions which required treatment in an asylum. A considerable proportion included among those as having either good or fair health may be described as of extremely nervous temperament, and in most cases they so describe themselves. A certain proportion of these combine great physical and especially mental energy with this nervousness. All these are doubtless of neurotic temperament. Very few can said to be conspicuously lacking in energy. On the whole, therefore, a large proportion of these inverted individuals are passing through life in an unimpaired state of health, which enables them to do at least their fair share of work in the world. In a considerable proportion of my cases, that work is of highly intellectual value. Only in five cases, it will be seen, or at most six, can the general health be said to be distinctly bad. This result may, perhaps, seem surprising. It must, however, be remembered that my cases do not, on the whole, represent the class which alone the physician is usually able to bring forward. For example, the sexual inverts who are suffering from a more or less severe degree of complete nervous breakdown. There is no frequent relationship between homosexuality and insanity, and such homosexuality as is found in asylums is mostly of a spurious character. This point was especially emphasized by Nagy, Homosexualität und Psychose, Zeitschrift für Psychiatrie, Volume 68, Number 3, 1911. He quoted the opinions of various distinguished alienists as to the rarity with which they had met genuine inverts and recorded his own experiences. He had never met a genuine invert in the asylum throughout his extensive experience, although he was quite willing to admit that there may be unrecognized inverts in asylums, and one patient informed him after leaving that he was inverted and had attracted the attention of the police both before and afterward though nothing happened in the asylum. Among 1,500 patients in the asylum during one year, active pedicatio occurred in about 1% of cases, these patients being frequently idiots or imbeciles, and at the same time masturbators, solitary or mutual. Hirschfeld informed Nagy that among homosexual persons, hysterical conditions, not usually on hereditary basis, are fairly common, 
and neurasthenia of high degree decidedly frequent, but though stages of depression are common, he had never seen pure melancholia and very seldom mania, but paranoic delusional ideas frequently, and he agreed with Byron of Broadmoor that religious delusions are not uncommon. General paralysis occurs, but it is comparatively rare, and the same may be said of dementia praecox. On the whole, although Hirschfeld was unable to give precise figures, there was no reason whatever to suppose an abnormal prevalence of insanity. This was Nakey's own view. It is quite true, Nakey concluded, that homosexual actions occur in every form of psychosis, especially in congenital and secondary demence, and at periods of excitement. But we are here more concerned with pseudo-homosexuality than with true inversion. Hirschfeld finds that 75% inverts are of sound heredity. This seems too large a proportion. In any case, allowance must be made for differences in method and minuteness of investigation. I am fairly certain that thorough investigation would very considerably enlarge the proportion of cases with morbid heredity. At the same time, this enlargement would be chiefly obtained by bringing minor abnormalities to the front, and it would then have to be shown how far the families of average or normal persons are free from such abnormalities. The question is sometimes asked, what family tree is free from neuropathic taint? At present, it is difficult to answer this question precisely. There is good ground to believe that a fairly large portion of families are free from such taint. In any case, it seems probable that the families to which the inverted belong do not usually present such profound signs of nervous degeneration as we were formerly led to suppose. What we vaguely call eccentricity is common among them. Insanity is much rarer. First Appearance of Homosexual Instinct Out of 72 cases, in 8, the instinct veered round to the same sex in adult age, or at all events after puberty. In three of these, there had been a love disappointment with a woman. No other cause than this can be assigned for the transition. But it is noteworthy that in at least two of these cases the sexual instinct is undeveloped or morbidly weak, while a third individual is of somewhat weak physique, and another has long been in delicate health. In a further case, also somewhat morbid, the development was rather more complicated. In 64 cases, or in a proportion of 88%, the abnormal instinct began early in life, without previous attraction to the opposite sex. In 27 of these, it dates from about puberty, usually beginning at school. In 39 cases, the tendency began before puberty, between the ages of 5 and 11, usually between 7 and 9, sometimes as early as the subject can remember. It must not be supposed that, in these numerous cases of the early appearance of homosexuality, the manifestations were of a specifically physical character, although erections were noted in a few cases. For the most part, sexual manifestation at this early age, whether homosexual or heterosexual, are purely psychic. Sexual Precocity and Hyperthesia It is a fact of considerable interest and significance that in so large a number of my cases there was distinct precocity of the sexual emotions, both on the physical and psychic sides. There can be little doubt that, as many previous observers have found, Inversion tends strongly to be associated with sexual precocity. I think it may be further said that sexual precocity tends to encourage the inverted habit where it exists. Why this should be so is obvious. If we believe, as there is some reason for believing, that at an early age the sexual instinct is comparatively undifferentiated in its manifestations, the precocious accentuation of the sexual impulse leads to definite crystallization of the emotions at a premature stage. It must be added that precocious sexual energy is likely to remain feeble, and that a feeble sexual energy adapts itself more easily to homosexual relationships, in which there is no definite act to be accomplished than to normal relationships. It is difficult to say how many of my cases exhibit sexual weakness. In six or seven, it is evident, 
and it may be suspected in many others, especially in those who are and often describe themselves as sensitive or nervous, as well as in those whose sexual development was very late. In many cases there is marked hyperesthesia or irritable weakness. Hyperesthesia simulates strength, and while there can be little doubt that some sexual inverts, and more especially bisexuals, do not possess unusual sexual energy, in others it is but apparent. The frequent repetition of seminal emissions, for example, may be the result of weakness as well as of strength. It must be added that this irritability of the sexual center is, in a considerable proportion of inverts, associated with marked emotional tendencies to affection and self-sacrifice. In the extravagance of his affection and devotion, it is frequently observed the male invert resembles any normal woman. Suggestion and Other Exciting Causes of Inversion in 18 of my cases, it is possible that some event or special environment in early life had more or less influence in turning the sexual instinct into homosexual channels or in calling out a latent inversion. In three cases, a disappointment in normal love seems to have produced a profound nervous and emotional shock, acting, as we seem bound to admit, on a predisposed organism and developing a fairly permanent tendency to inversion. In eight cases, there was seduction by an older person, but in at least four or five of these, there was already a well-marked predisposition. In at least eight other cases, example, usually at school, may probably be regarded as having exerted some influence. It is noteworthy that in very few of my cases can we trace the influence of any definite suggestion as asserted by Shrik Notzing, who believes that, in the causation of sexual inversion, as undoubtedly in the causation of erotic fetishism, we must give the first place to accidental factors of education and external influence. He records the case of a little boy who innocently gazed in curiosity at the penis of his father who was urinating, and had his ears boxed, whence arose a train of thought and feeling which resulted in complete sexual inversion. In two of the cases I have reported, we have parallel incidents, and here we see clearly that the homosexual tendency already existed. I do not question the occurrence of such incidents, but I refuse to accept them as supplying the causation of inversion, and in doing so I am supported by all the evidence I am able to obtain. I am in agreement with a correspondent who wrote, Considering that all the boys are exposed to the same order of suggestion, sight of a man's naked organs, sleeping with a man, being handled by a man, and that only a few of them become sexually perverted, I think it reasonable to conclude that those few were previously constituted to receive the suggestion. In fact, suggestion seems to play exactly the same part in the normal and abnormal awakening of sex. I would go so far as to assert that for normal boys and girls the developed sexual organs of the adult man or woman, from their size, hairiness, and the mystery which envelopes them, nearly always exert a certain fascination, whether of attraction or horror. But this has no connection with homosexuality, and scarcely with sexuality at all. Thus in one case known to me, a boy of six or seven took pleasure in caressing the organs of another boy, twice his own age, who remained passive and indifferent. Yet this child grew up without ever manifesting any homosexual instinct. The seed of suggestion can only develop when it falls on suitable soil. If it is to act on a fairly normal nature, the perverted suggestion must be very powerful or iterated and even then its influence will probably only be temporary, disappearing in the presence of the normal stimulus. Not only is suggestion unnecessary to develop a sexual impulse already rooted in the organism, but when exerted in an opposite direction, it is powerless to divert that impulse. We see this illustrated in several of the cases whose history I have presented. Thus, in one case, a boy was seduced by the housemaid at the age of fourteen, and even derived pleasure from the girl. Yet, nonetheless, the native homosexual instinct asserted itself a year later. In another case, heterosexual suggestions were offered and accepted in early life, 
yet notwithstanding the homosexual attraction was slowly evolved from within i have therefore but little to say of the influence of suggestion which was formerly exalted to a position of the first importance in books on sexual inversion this is not because i underestimate the great part played by suggestion in many fields of normal and abnormal life it is because i have been able to find but few decided traces of it in sexual inversion in many cases doubtless there may be some slight elements of suggestion in developing the inversion though they cannot be traced their importance seems usually questionable even when they are discovered take shrek notzing's case of the little boy whose ears were boxed for what his father considered improper curiosity i find it difficult to realize that a mighty suggestion can thereby be generated unless a strong emotion exists for it to unite with in that case the seed falls on prepared soil is the wide prevalence of normal sexuality due to the fact that so many little boys have had their ears boxed for taking naughty liberties with women if so i am quite prepared to accept shrink notzing's explanation as a complete account of the matter i know of one case indeed in which an element of what may fairly be called suggestion can be detected it is that of a physician who had always been on very friendly terms with men but had sexual relations exclusively with women finding fair satisfaction until the confessions of an inverted patient one day came to him as a revelation thereafter he adopted inverted practices and ceased to find any attraction in women but even in this case as i understand the matter suggestion merely served to reveal his own nature to the man for a physician to adopt the perverted habits which the visit of a chance patient suggests to him can scarcely be a phenomenon of pure suggestion we have no reason to suppose that this physician practiced every perversion he heard of from patients he adopted that which fitted his own nature in another case homosexual advances were made to a youth and accepted but he had already been attracted to men in childhood again in another case there were homosexual influences in the boyhood of a subject who became bisexual but as the subject's father was of similar bisexual temperament we can attach no potency to the mere suggestions in another case we find homosexual influence in childhood but the child was already delicate shy nervous and feminine clearly possessing a temperament predestined to develop in a homosexual direction the irresistible potency of the inner impulse is well illustrated in a case presented by hirschfeld and buchard my daughter emma said the subject's mother showed boyish inclinations at the age of three and they increased from year to year she never played with dolls only with tin soldiers and guns and castles she would climb trees and jump ditches she made friends with the drivers of all the carts that came to our house and they would place her on the horse's back the annual circus was a joy to her for all the year even as a child of four she was so fearless on horseback that lookers-on shouted bravo and all declared she was a born horsewoman it was her greatest wish to be a boy she would wear her elder brother's clothes all day notwithstanding her grandmother's indignation cycling gymnastics boating swimming were her passion and she showed skill in them as she grew older she hated prettily adorned hats and clothes i had much trouble with her for she would not wear pretty things the older she grew the more her masculine and decided ways developed this excited much outcry and offence people found my daughter unfeminine and disagreeable but all my trouble and exhortations availed nothing to change her now this young woman whom all the influences of a normal feminine environment failed to render feminine was not physiologically a woman at all the case proved to be the unique instance of an individual possessing all the external characteristics of a woman combined with the internal tescular tissue capable of emitting true masculine semen through the feminine urethra no suggestions of the environment could suffice to overcome this fundamental fact of internal constitution hirschfeld and buchard spermaskrischen aus einer weiblichen hanrohr deutsche medizinische wochenschrift number fifty two nineteen eleven i may here quote three american cases not previously published 
for which I am debted to Professor Frank Lidston of Chicago. They seem to me to illustrate the only kind of suggestions which play much part in the evolution of inversion. I give them in Dr. Lidston's words. Case 1. A man, 45 years of age, attracted by the allusion to my essay on social perversion, contained in the English translation of Kraft Ebing's Psychopathia Sexualis, consulted me regarding the possible cure of his condition. This individual was a finely educated, very intelligent man, who was an excellent linguist. He had considerable music ability, and was in the employ of a firm whose business was such as to demand on part of its employees considerable legal acumen, clerical ability, and knowledge of real estate transactions. This man stated that at the age of puberty, without any knowledge of perversity of sexual feeling, he was thrown intimately in contact with males of more advanced years, who took various means to excite his sexual passions, the result being that perverted sexual practices were developed, which were continued for a number of years. He thereafter noticed an aversion to women. At the solicitations of his family, he finally married, without any very intelligent idea as to what, if anything, might be expected of him in the marital relation. Absolute impotence, indeed repugnance for association with his wife, was the lamentable sequence. A divorce was in contemplation when, fortunately for all parties concerned, the wife suddenly died. Being a man of more than ordinary intelligence, this individual, prior to seeking my aid, had sought vainly for some remedy for his unfortunate condition. He stated that he believed there was an element of heredity in his case, his father having been a dipsomaniac and one brother having died insane. He nevertheless stated it to be his opinion that notwithstanding the hereditary taint, he would have been perfectly normal from a sexual standpoint had it not been for acquired impressions at or about the period of puberty. This man presented a typical neurotic type of physique, complained of being intensely nervous, was prematurely gray, of only fair stature, and had an uncontrollable nystagmus, which he said had existed for some fifteen years. As might be expected, treatment in this case was of no avail. I began the use of hypnotic suggestion at the hands of an expert professional hypnotist. The patient, being called out of the state, finally gave up treatment, and I have no means of knowing what his present condition is. Case 2. A lady patient of mine who happened to be an actress, and consequently a woman of the world, brought to me for an opinion some correspondence which had passed between her younger brother and a man living in another state with whom he was on quite intimate terms. In one of these letters, various flying trips to Chicago for the purpose of meeting the lad, who, by the way, was only seventeen years of age, were alluded to. It transpired also, as evidenced by the letters, that on several occasions the young lad had been taken on trips in Pullman cars by his friend, who was a prominent railroad official. The character of the correspondence was such as the average healthy man would address to a woman with whom he was enamored. It seemed that the author of the correspondence had applied to this boy affinity the name Cinderella, and the protestations of passionate affection that were made towards Cinderella certainly would have satisfied the most exacting woman. The young lad subsequently made a confession to me, and I put myself in correspondence with his male friend, with the result that he called upon me and I obtained a full history of the case. The method of indulgence in this case was the usual one of oral masturbation, in which the lad was the passive party. I was unable to obtain any definite data regarding the family history of the elder individual in this case, but understand that there was a taint of insanity in his family. He himself was a robust, fine-looking man, above middle age, who was well educated and very intelligent, as he necessarily must have been, because of the prominent position he held with an important railway company. I will state, as a matter of interest, that the lad in this case, who is now twenty-three years of age, has recently consulted me for impotentia coeundi, manifesting a frigidity for women, 
and from the young man's statements I am convinced that he is well on the road to confirm sexual perversion. An interesting point in this connection is that the young man's sister, the actress already alluded to, has recently had an attack of acute mania. I have other unpublished cases that might be of interest, but these two are somewhat classical, and typify to a greater or less degree the majority of other cases. I will, however, mention one other case occurring in a woman. Case 3. A married woman, 40 years of age. She has been deserted by her husband because of her perverted sexuality. Neurotic history on both sides of the family and several cases of insanity on the mother's side. In this case, affinity for the same sex and perverted desire for the opposite sex existed, a combination by no means infrequent. Hypnotic suggestion tried, but without success. Cause was evidently suggestion and example on the part of another female pervert with whom she associated before her marriage. Marriage was late at the age of 35. In all these cases there was an element of what may be called suggestion. But it was really much more than this. It was probably in each case active seduction by an elder person of a predisposed younger person. It will be observed that in each case there was, at the least, an organic neurotic basis for suggestion and seduction to work on. I cannot regard these cases as entitled to modify our attitude towards suggestion. End of chapter 5, part 1. Chapter 5 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 5, The Nature of Sexual Inversion, Part 2. Masturbation. Moreau believed that masturbation was a cause of sexual inversion and Kraft Ebing looked upon it as leading to all sorts of sexual perversions. The same opinion was currently repeated by many writers. It is not now accepted. Moll emphatically rejected the idea that masturbation can be the cause of inversion. Nakey repeatedly denies that masturbation, any more than seduction, can ever produce true inversion. Hirschfeld attaches to it no etiological significance. Many years ago, I gave special attention to this point and reached a similar conclusion, that masturbation, especially at an early age, may sometimes enfeeble the sexual activities and aid the manifestations of inversion, I certainly believe. Beyond this, there is little in the history of my male cases to indicate masturbation as a cause of inversion. It is true that 44 out of 51 admit that they have practiced masturbation, at all events, occasionally, or at some period in their lives, and it is possible that this proportion is larger than that found among normal people. Even if so, however, it is not difficult to account for, bearing in mind that the fact that the homosexual person has not the same opportunities as has the heterosexual person to gratify his instincts, and that masturbation may sometimes legitimately appear to him as the lesser of two evils. Not only has masturbation been practiced at no period in at least seven of the cases, for concerning several I have no information, but in several others it was never practiced until long after the homosexual instinct had appeared. In one case, not till the age of 40, and then only occasionally. In at least eight, it was only practiced at puberty. In at least eight, however, it began before the age of puberty. At least nine left off about the age of 20. Unfortunately, as yet, we have little definite evidence as to the prevalence and extent of masturbation among normal individuals. Among the women, masturbation is found in at least five cases out of seven. In one case, there was no masturbation until comparatively late in life, and then only at rare intervals and under exceptional circumstances. In another case, some years after the homosexual attraction had been experienced, it was practiced, though not in excess, from the age of puberty for about four years, and then abandoned. 
During these years, the physical sexual feelings were more imperative than they were afterward felt to be. In two cases, masturbation was learned spontaneously soon after puberty, and in one of these, practiced in excess before the manifestations of inversion became definite. In all cases, the subjects are emphatic in asserting that this practice neither led to, nor was caused by, the homosexual attraction, which they regard as a much higher feeling, and it must be added that the occasional practice of masturbation is very far from rare among fairly normal women. While this is so, I am certainly inclined to believe that an early and excessive indulgence in masturbation, though not an adequate cause, is a favoring condition for the development of inversion, and that this is especially so in women. The sexual precocity indicated by early and excessive masturbation doubtless sometimes reveals an organism already predisposed to homosexuality. But, apart from this, when masturbation arises spontaneously at an early age on a purely physical basis, it seems to tend to produce a divorce between the physical and the psychic aspects of sexual love. The sexual manifestations are all diverted into this physical direction, and the child is ignorant that such phenomena are normally allied to love. Then, when a more spiritual attraction appears with adolescent development, this divorce is perpetuated. Instead of the physical and psychic feelings appearing together when the ego for sexual attraction comes, the physical feelings are prematurely twisted from their natural end, and it becomes abnormally easy for a person of the same sex to step in and take the place rightfully belonging to a person of the opposite sex. This has certainly seemed to me the course of events in some cases I have observed. Attitude Toward the Opposite Sex In 17 cases, of whom five are married and others proposing to marry, there is a sexual attraction to both sexes, a conditionally formally called psychosexual hermaphroditism, but now more usually bisexuality. In such cases, although there is pleasure and satisfaction in relationship with both sexes, there is usually a greater degree of satisfaction in connection with one sex. Most of the bisexual prefer their own sex, it is curiously rare to find a person, whether man or woman, who by choice exercises relationships with both sexes and prefers the opposite sex. This would seem to indicate that the bisexual may really be inverts. In any case, bisexuality emerges imperceptibly into simple inversion. In at least 16 of 52 cases of simple inversion in men, there has been connection with women in some instances only once or twice, in others during several years, but it was always with an effort, or from a sense of duty and anxiety to be normal. They never experienced any real pleasure in the act, or sense of satisfaction after it. Four of these cases are married, but marital relationships usually cease after a few years. At least four others were attracted to women when younger, but are not now. Another once felt sexually attracted to a boyish woman, but never made any attempt to obtain any relationships with her. Three or four others, again, have tried to have connection with women, but failed. The largest portion of my cases have never had any sexual intimacy with the opposite sex, and some of these experience what, in the case of the male invert, is sometimes called or femina. But while woman as an object of sexual desire is in such cases disgusting to them, and it is usually difficult for a genuine invert to have connection with a woman except by setting up images of his own sex, for the most part inverts are capable of genuine friendships, irrespective of sex. It is perhaps not difficult to account for the horror, much stronger than normally felt toward a person of the same sex with which the invert often regards the sexual organs of persons of the opposite sex. It cannot be said that the sexual organs of either sex, under the influence of sexual excitement, are aesthetically pleasing. They only become emotionally desirable through the parallel excitement of the beholder. When the absence of parallel excitement is accompanied in the beholder by the sense of unfamiliarity, as in childhood, or by a neurotic hypersensitiveness, the conditions are present for the production of intense horror femina, or horror masculus, as the case may be. 
It is possible that, as Otto Rank argues in his interesting study, De Noctite im Saga und Dichtun, this horror of the sexual organs of the opposite sex, to some extent felt even by normal people, is embodied in the Melusine type of legend. Erotic Dreams Our dreams follow, as a general rule, the impulses that stir our waking psychic life. The normal man or woman in sexual vigor dreams of loving a person of the opposite sex. The inverted man dreams of loving a man, the inverted woman of loving a woman. Dreams thus have a certain value in diagnosis, more especially since there is less unwillingness to confess to a perverted dream than to a perverted action. Ulrichs first referred to the significance of the dreams of inverts. At a later period, Mull pointed out that they have some value in diagnosis when we are not sure how far the inverted tendency is radical. Then Nagy repeatedly emphasized the importance of dreams as constituting, he believed, the most delicate test we possess in the diagnosis of homosexuality. This was an exaggerated view which failed to take into account the various influences which may deflect dreams. Hirschfeld has made the most extensive investigation on this point and found that among 100 inverts, 87 had exclusively homosexual dreams, while most of the rest had no dreams at all. Among my cases, only four definitely state that there are no erotic dreams, while 31 acknowledge that the dreams are concerned more or less with persons of the same sex. Of these, at least 16 assert or imply that their dreams are exclusively of the same sex. Two, though apparently inverted congenitally, have had erotic dreams of women, in one case more frequently than of men. These two exceptions have no apparent explanation. Another appears to have sexual dreams of a nightmare character, in which women appear. In another case, there were always at first dreams of women, but this subject had sometimes had connection with prostitutes, and is not absolutely indifferent to women, while another, whose dreams remain heterosexual, had in early life some attraction to girls. In the cases of distinct bisexuality, there is no anonymity. Two dream of their own sex, two dream of both sexes. One usually dreams of the opposite sex, and one man, while dreaming of both, dislikes those dreams in which women figure. In at least three cases, dreams of sexual character begin at the age of eight or earlier. The phenomena presented by erotic dreams, alike in normal and abnormal persons, are somewhat complex. The dreams are by no means a sure guide to the dreamer's real sexual attitude. The fluctuation of dream imagery may be illustrated by the experiences of one of my subjects, who thus indirectly summarizes his own experiences. When he was quite a child, he used to be haunted by gross and grotesque dreams of naked adult men, which must have been erotic. At the age of puberty, he dreamed in two ways, but always about males. One species of vision was highly idealistic. A radiant and lovely young man's face with floating hair appeared to him on a background of dim shadows. The other was obscene, being generally the sight of a groomer's or carter's genitals in a state of violent erection. He never dreamed erotically or sentimentally about women, but when the dream was frightful, the terror-making personage was invariably female. In ordinary dreams, women of his family or acquaintance played a trivial part. At the age of twenty-four, having determined to conquer his homosexual passions, he married, found no difficulty in cohabitating with his wife, and begat several children, although he took little passionate delight in the sexual act. He still continued to dream exclusively of men for several years, and the obscene visions became more frequent than the idealistic. Gradually, coarse and uninteresting erotic dreams of women began to haunt his mind in sleep. A curious particular regarding the new type of vision was that he never dreamed of whole females, only of their sexual parts, seen in a blur, and the seminal emissions which attended the mental pictures left a feeling of fatigue and disgust. In course of time, his wife and he agreed to live separately so far as sexual relations are concerned. He then indulged his passion for males, 
and wholly lost those rudimentary female dreams which had been developed during the period of nuptial cohabitation not only is it possible for the genuine invert to be trained into heterosexual erotic dreams but homosexual dreams may occasionally be experienced by persons who are and always have been exclusively heterosexual i could bring forward much evidence on this point autoerotism in volume one of these studies both men and women who have always been of pronounced heterosexual tendency without a trace of inversion are liable to rare homosexual dreams not necessarily involving orgasm or even definite sexual excitement and sometimes accompanied by a feeling of repugnance as an example i may present a dream which had no known origin of an exclusively heterosexual lady aged forty-two she dreamed she was in bed with another woman unknown to her and lying on her own stomach while with her right hand stretched out she was feeling the other's sexual parts she could distinctly perceive the clitoris vagina etc she felt a sort of disgust with herself for what she was doing but continued until she awoke she then found herself lying on her stomach as in the dream and at first thought she must have been touching herself but realized that this could not have been the case. Nisforo, who believes that inversion may develop out of masturbation, considers that the dreams of masturbation by association of ideas may take on an inverted character. Lipsico Pesi Swala, 1897, page 3569. This, however, must be rare and will not account for most of the dreams in question. Nakey and Colin Scott, some years ago, independently referred to cases in which normal persons were liable to homosexual dreams and ferrer revue de medicine december eighteen ninety eight referred to a man who had a horror of women but appeared only to manifest homosexuality in his dreams archive for criminal anthropology nineteen o seven half one and two calls dreams which represent a reaction of opposition to the dreamer's ordinary life contrast dreams hirschfeld who accepts nakey's contrast dreams in relation to homosexuality considers that they indicate a latent bisexuality we may admit this is so in the same sense in which a complementary color image called up by another color indicates the possibility of perceiving that color in most cases however it seems to me that homosexual dreams in normal persons may be simply explained as due to the ordinary confusion and transition of dream imagery see ellis the world of dreams especially chapter two methods of sexual relationship the exact mode in which an inverted instinct finds satisfaction is frequently of importance from the medical legal standpoint from a psychological standpoint it is of minor significance being chiefly of interest as showing the degree to which the individual has departed from the instinctive feelings of his normal fellow beings taking fifty-seven inverted men of whom i have definite knowledge i find that twelve restrained by moral or other considerations have never had any physical relationship with their own sex in some twenty-two cases the sexual relationship rarely goes beyond close physical contact and fondling or at most mutual masturbation and intercrural intercourse in ten or eleven cases of fellatio oral excitation frequently in addition to some form of mutual masturbation and usually though not always as the active agency is the form preferred in fourteen cases actual pedicchio usually active not passive has been exercised in these cases however pedicatio is by no means always the habitual or even the preferred method of gratification it seems to be the preferred method in about seven cases several who have never experienced it including some who have never practiced any form of physical relationship state that they feel no objection to pedicatio some have this feeling in regard to active others in regard to passive pedicatio the proportion of inverts who practice or have at some time experienced pedicatio thus revealed nearly twenty five per cent is large in germany hirschfeld finds it to be only eight per cent and mertzbach only six 
I believe, however, that a wider induction from a larger number of English or American cases would yield a proportion much nearer to that found in Germany. Pseudosexual Attraction It is sometimes supposed that in homosexual relationships one person is always active, physically and emotionally, the other passive. Between men, at all events, this is very frequently not the case and the invert cannot tell if he feels like a man or like a woman. Thus one writes, In bed with my friend I feel as if he feels, and he feels as I feel. The result is masturbation, and nothing more or desire for more on my part. I get it over to as soon as possible, in order to come to the best, sleeping arms around each other, or talking so. It remains true, however, that there may usually be traced what it is possible to call pseudosexual attraction, by which I mean a tendency for the invert to be attracted toward persons unlike himself, so that in his sexual relationships there is a certain semblance of sexual opposition. Numa Praetorius considers that in homosexuality the attraction of opposites, the attraction for soldiers and other primitive vigorous types, plays a greater part than among normal lovers. This pseudo-sexual attraction is, however, as Hirschfeld points out, and as we see by the histories here presented, by no means invariable. M. N. writes, To me it appears that the female element must, of necessity, exist in the body that desires the male, and that nature keeps her law in the spirit, though she breaks it in the form. The rest is all a matter of individual temperament and environment. The female nature of the invert, hampered though it is by its disguise of flesh, is still able to exert an extraordinary influence and calls incessantly upon the male. This influence seems called into action most violently in the presence of males possessed of strong sexual magnetism of their own. Such men are generally more or less conscious of the influence and the result is either a vague appreciation which will make the male wonder why he gets on so well with the invert, or else the influence will be realized to be something incongruous and unnatural, and will be resented accordingly. Sometimes, indeed, the reciprocated feeling, circumstance and opportunity permitting, will prove strong enough to induce sexual relations Reason will then generally overpower instinct, and the feeling, aroused unaware, will probably be changed into repulsion. Further, the influence reacts in the same way on women, who particularly, if they are strongly sexual, experience involuntary sensations of dislike or antagonism on association with inverts. There is, however, one terrible reality for the invert to face, no matter how much he may wish to avoid it and seek to deceive himself. There exists for him an almost absolute lack of any genuine satisfaction either in the way of affections or desires. His whole life is passed in vainly seeking and desiring the male, the antithesis of his nature, and in consorting with inverts he must perforce be content with the male in form only the shadow without the substance. Indeed, one invert necessarily regards another as being of the same undesired female sex as himself, and for this reason it will be found that while friendships between inverts frequently exist, and these are characteristically feminine, unstable, and liable to betrayal, love attachments are less common, and when they occur must naturally be based upon considerable self-deception. Venal gratifications are always, of course, as possible as they are unsatisfactory, and here perhaps some of the peculiarities of taste accompanying inversion may admit of elucidation. In considering the peculiar predilection shown by inverts for youths of inferior social position, for the wearers of uniforms, and for extreme physical development and virility not necessarily accompanied by intellectuality, Regard must be had to the probable conduct of women placed in a position of complete irresponsibility combined with absolute freedom of action and every opportunity for promiscuity. It seems to me that the importance of recognizing the underlying female element in inversion cannot be too strongly insisted upon.
the majority of inverts writes z differ in no detail of their outward appearance their physique or their dress from normal men they are athletic masculine in habit frank in manner passing through society year after year without arising a suspicion of their inner temperament were it not so society would long ago have had its eyes open to the amount of perverted sexuality it harbors these lines were written not in opposition to the more subtle distinctions pointed out above but in refutation of the vulgar error which confuses the typical invert with the painted and petticoated features who appear in police courts from time to time and whose portraits are presented by lombroso legludic etc on another occasion the same writer remarked while expressing general agreement with the idea of a pseudo-sexual attraction the liaison is by no means always sought and begun by the person who is abnormally constituted i mean that i can cite cases of decided males who have made up to inverts and have found their happiness in the reciprocated passion one pronounced male of this sort again once said to me men are so much more affectionate than women precisely the same words were used by one of my subjects also the liaison springs up now and then quite accidentally through juxtaposition when it is difficult to say whether either at the outset had an inverted tendency of any marked quality in these cases the sexual relation seems to come on as a heightening of comradely affection and is found to be pleasurable sometimes i think discovered to be safe as well as satisfying on the other hand so far as i know it is extremely rare to observe a permanent liaison between two pronounced inverts the tendency to pseudo-sexual attraction in the homosexual would thus seem to involve a preference for normal persons how far this is the case it seems difficult to state positively usually one may say an invert falls in love exactly as in the case of a normal person without any intellectual calculation as to the temperamental ability to return the affection which the object of his love may possess naturally however there cannot be any adequate return of the affection in the absence of an actual or latent homosexual disposition on this point an american correspondent h c with a wide knowledge of inversion in many lands writes one of your correspondents declares that inverts long for sexual relations with normal men rather than with one another if this be true i have never once found it exemplified in all my wide experience of inverts and i have submitted his assertion to more than fifty these have been replied invariably that unless a man is himself homosexual nearly all the pleasure of fellatio is absent the fact is the majority of inverts flock together not from exigency but from choice the mere sexual act is if anything far less the sole object between inverts than it is between normal men and women why should the invert sigh for intercourse with normal men where mutual confidences and sympathies and love would be out of the question personally i decline to commit fellatio with a man who is given to women the thought of it is repugnant to me and this is the attitude with every invert i have questioned the nearest approach to confirmation of your correspondence theory has been when an extremely feminine invert here and there has admitted the wish that a certain normal man were inverted indeed the temperamental gamut of inversion is itself broad enough to embrace the most widely divergent ideals as my furthest reaching demands attain fruition in the gentle and pretty boy so his own robuster affinity resides in me if inverts were actually women then indeed the normal male would be their ideal but inverts are not women inverts are males capable of passionate friendship and their ideal is the male who will give them passionate friendship in return in at least twenty-four probably many more of my male cases there is a marked contrast and in still a larger number a less marked contrast between the subject and the individuals he is attracted to either he is of somewhat feminine and sensitive nature and admires more simple and virile natures or he is fairly vigorous and admires boys who are often of a lower social class inverted women are also attracted to more clinging feminine persons a sexual attraction for boys is no doubt as mall points out 
that form of inversion which comes nearest to normal sexuality, for the subject of it usually approaches nearer to the average man in physical and mental disposition. The reason of this is obvious. Boys resemble women, and therefore it requires a less profound organic twist to become sexually attracted to them. Anyone who has watched private theatricals in boys' schools will have observed how easy it is for boys to personate women successfully, and it is well known that until the middle of the 17th century, women's parts on stage were always taken by boys, whether or not with injury to their own or other people's morals. It is also worthy of note that in Greece, where homosexuality flourished so extensively, and apparently with so little accompaniment of neurotic degeneration, it was often held that only boys under 18 should be loved, so that the love of boys emerged into love of women. About 18 of my cases are most strongly attracted to youths, preferably about the age of 18 to 20, and they are, for the most part, among the more normal and healthy of the cases. A preference for older men, or else a considerable degree of indifference to age alone, is more common, and perhaps indicates a deeper degree of perversion. Putting aside the age of the object desired, it must be said that there is a distinctly general, though not universal, tendency for sexual inverts to approach the feminine type, either in psychic disposition or physical constitution or both. I cannot say how far this is explained by the irritable nervous system and delicate health, which are so often associated with inversion, though this is certainly an important factor. Although the invert himself may stoutly affirm his masculinity, and although this femininity may not be very obvious, its wide prevalence may be asserted with considerable assurance, and by no means only among the small minority of inverts who take an exclusive passive role, though in these it is usually most marked. In this I am confirmed by Q who writes, in all or certainly most cases, the cases of congenital male inverts, excluding psychosexual hermaphrodites, that I know there has been a remarkable sensitiveness and delicate sentiment, sympathy, and an intuitive habit of mind, such as we generally associate with the feminine sex, even though the body might be quite masculine in its form and habit. When, however, a distinguished invert said to Mole, we are all women, that we do not deny. He put the matter into extreme form. The feminine traits of the homosexual are not usually of a capricious nature. I believe that inverts of plainly feminine nature are rare exceptions, wrote Nakey. And that statement may be accepted even by those who emphasize the prevalence of feminine traits among inverts. In inverted women, some degree of masculinity or boyishness is equally prevalent and it is not usually found in the women to whom they are attracted. Even in inversion, the need for a certain sexual opposition, the longing for something which the lover himself does not possess, still prevails. It expresses itself sometimes in an attraction between persons of different race and color. I am told that in American prisons for women, lesbian relationships are especially frequent between white and black women. A similar affinity is found among the Arabs, says Coker, and if an Arab woman has a lesbian friend, the latter is usually European. In Cochin, China, too, according to Lorian, while the Chinese are chiefly pederasts, the Anamites are chiefly passive. It must, however, be remembered that in normal love, homogamy, the attraction of the like, prevails over heterogamy and the attraction of the unlike, which is chiefly confined to those features which belong to the sphere of the secondary sexual characters. The same appears to be true in inversion, and the homosexual are probably, on the whole, more attracted by the traits which they seem to themselves to possess than by those which are foreign to themselves. End of chapter 5, part 2《Chapter 5 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 5, The Nature of Sexual Inversion, Part 3. Physical Abnormalities the circumstances under which many of my cases were investigated often made information under this head difficult to obtain or to verify. In at least four cases the penis is very large, while in at least three it is small and undeveloped, with small and flabby testes. It seems probable that variations in these two directions are both common, but it is doubtful whether they possess as much significance as the tendency to infantilism or the sexual organs in inverted women seems to possess. Hirschfeld considers that the genital organs of inverts resemble those of normal people. He finds, however, that phimosis is rather common. More significant, perhaps, than specifically genital peculiarities are the deviations found in the general conformation of the body. In at least two cases there are well-developed breasts, in one of the breasts swelling and becoming red. In one case there are menstrual phenomena, physical and psychic, recurring every four weeks. In several cases the hips are broad and the arms rounded, while some are skillful in throwing a ball. One was born with a double squint. At least two were seven months children. In the previous chapter, I have referred to the tendency to hypertrichnosis and occasionally oligotrichnosis among inverted women. Among the men, it is the latter condition which seems more common, and in several cases the bodies are hairless or with but scanty hair. A few are left-handed, though not perhaps an abnormal proportion. The sexual characters of the handwriting are in some cases clearly inverted, the men writing a feminine hand and the women a masculine hand. A high feminine voice is sometimes found. A marked characteristic of many inverts, though one is not easy of precise definition, is their youthful appearance and frequently childlike faces, equally in both sexes. This has often been remarked and is pronounced among many of my subjects. The frequent inability of male inverts to whistle was first pointed out by Ulrich, and Hirschfeld has found it in 23%. Many of my cases confess to this inability, while some of the women inverts can whistle admirably. Although this inability of male inverts is only found among a minority, I am quite satisfied that it is well marked among a considerable minority. One of my correspondents, M.N., writes to me, With regard to the general inability of inverts to whistle, I am not able to do so myself. Their fondness for green, my favorite color, their feminine calligraphy, skill at female occupations, etc., these all seem to me but indication of the one principle. To go still farther and include trivial things, few inverts even smoke in the same manner and with the same enjoyment as a man. They have seldom the male facility at games, cannot throw at a mark with precision, or even spit. Nearly all these peculiarities indicate a minor degree of nervous disturbance and lead to modification, as my correspondent points out, in a feminine direction. It is scarcely necessary to add that they by no means necessarily imply inversion. Shelley, for instance, was unable to whistle, though he never gave an indication of inversion, but he was a person of somewhat abnormal and feminine organization, and he illustrates the tendency of these apparently very insignificant functional anomalies to be correlated with other and more important psychic anomalies. The greater part of these various anatomical peculiarities and functional anomalies point, more or less clearly, to the prevalence among inverts of a tendency to infantilism, combined with feminism in men and masculinism in women. This tendency is denied by Hirschfeld, but it is often well indicated among the subjects whose history I have been able to present, and is indeed suggested by Hirschfeld's own elaborate results, so that it can scarcely be passed over. I regard it as highly significant, and it is in harmony with all that we are learning to know regarding the important part played by the internal secretions, alike in inversion and the general bodily modifications in an infantile, feminine, and masculine direction. If we are justified in believing that there is a tendency for inverted persons to be somewhat arrested in development, 
approaching the child type, we may connect this fact with the sexual precocity sometimes marked in inverts, for precocity is commonly accompanied by rapid arrest of development. A correspondent who is himself inverted furnishes the following notes of cases he is well acquainted with. I quote them here as they illustrate the anomalies commonly found. 1. A male, eldest child of a typically neurotic family. Three children in all, two male and one female. The other two are somewhat eccentric, unsocial, and sexually frigid, one in a marked degree. The curious point about this case is that A, the only one of the family possessed of mental ability and social qualifications should be inverted. Parents' marriage was very ill-assorted and inharmonious, the father being of great stature and the mother abnormally small and of highly nervous temperament, both of feeble health. Ancestry unfortunate, especially on the mother's side. 2. B. Male invert. Younger of two sons, no other children has extremely feminine disposition and appearance, of considerable personal attraction, and has great musical talent. Penis is very small and marked breast development. 3. C. Male, invert, younger of two sons, no other children. Interval of six years between first and second son. Parents' marriage, one of great affection, but degenerate ancestry on mother's side, cancer, and scrofula in family. 4. D. Male. Invert. Second child of six. Remainder girls. Of humble social position. Considerable depravity evinced by all the members of this family, with the exception of D., who alone proved steady, honest, and industrious. 5. E. Male. Invert. Second son of family of three. The youngest child being a girl, stillborn. Of extreme neurotic temperament, fostered by upbringing effeminate in build and disposition, musically gifted. 6. F. Male, invert, second child of family of five. Eldest child, a girl. Died in youth. After F., a boy G. A girl age, and another girl still born. Parents badly matched. Mother of considerable mental and physical strength. Father last representative of moribund stock. The result of intermarriage. Children all resembling father in appearance and mother in disposition. Drink tendency in both boys, to which F's death at the age of 30 was mainly due. G committed suicide some years later. The girl H, married into a family with worse ancestry than her own, has two children. 7. I and J, boy and girl, both inverted as far as I am able to judge. The boy was born with some deformity of the feet and ankles is of effeminate taste and appearance. Boy resembles mother, and girl, who is of great physical development, resembles father. The same correspondent adds, I have noticed little abnormal with regard to the genital formation of inverts. These are, however, frequent abnormalities of proportion in their figures, the hands and feet being noticeably smaller and more shapely, the waist more marked, the body softer and less muscular. Almost invariably, there is either cranial malformation or the head approaches the feminine in type and shape. Artistic and other aptitudes. All avocations are represented among inverts. Among the subjects here dealt with are found, at one end of the scale, numerous manual workers, and at the other end an equal number, sometimes of aristocratic family, who exercise no profession at all. There are twelve physicians nine men of letters, at least seven are engaged in commercial life, six are artists, architects, or composers, four are or have been actors. These figures cannot give any clue to the relative extent of inversion in various occupations, but they indicate that no class of occupation furnishes a safeguard against inversion. There are, however, certain avocations which inverts seem especially called, one of the chief of these is literature. The apparent predominance of physicians is easily explicable. The frequency with which literature is represented is probably more genuine. Here, indeed, inverts seem to find the highest degree of success and reputation. At least half a dozen of my subjects are successful men of letters, and I could easily add others by going outside the group of histories included in this study. 
they especially cultivate those regions of bellus literis which lie on the borderland between prose and verse though they do not usually attain much eminence in poetry they are often very accomplished writers of verse they may be attracted to history but rarely attempt tasks of great magnitude involving much patient labor though to this rule there are exceptions pure science seems to have relatively little attraction for the homosexual an examination of my histories reveals the interesting fact that forty-five of the subjects or in proportion of fifty-six per cent possess artistic aptitudes of varying degree galton found from the investigation of nearly one thousand persons that the average showing artistic tastes in england was only about thirty per cent it must also be said that my figures are probably below the truth as no special point was made of investigating the matter and also that in some cases the artistic ability is of high order it is suggested that alder's theory of mender verticite according to which we react strenuously against our congenital organic defects and fortify them into virtues may be applied to the invert's requirement of artistic abilities g rosenstein die torin der organmeinder verticheit und die bisexualität jahrbuch für psychoanalytische forschungen volume two nineteen ten page three ninety eight this theory is in some cases of valuable application but it seems doubtful to me whether it is very profitable in the present connection the artistic aptitudes of inverts may be better regarded as part of their organic tendencies than as a reaction against those tendencies in this connection i may quote the remarks of an american correspondent himself a homosexual regarding the connection between inversion and artistic capacity so far as i can see the temperament of every invert seems to strive to find artistic expression crudely or otherwise inverts as a rule seek the paths of life that lie in pleasant places their resistance to opposing obstacles is elastic their work is never strenuous if they can help it and their accomplishments hardly ever of practical use this is all true of the born artist as well both inverts and artists are inordinately fond of praise both yearn for a life where admiration is the reward for little energy in a word they seem to be born tired begotten by parents who were tired too hirschfeld de homosexualität page sixty six gives a list of pictures and sculptures which especially appeal to the homosexual prominent among them are representations of saint sebastian gainsborough's blue boy van dyke's youthful men the hermes of praxiteles michael angelo's slave rodin's and Meunier's working men types as regards music my cases reveal the aptitude which has been marked by others as peculiarly common among inverts it has been extravagantly said that all musicians are inverts it is certain that various famous musicians among the dead and the living have been homosexual ingignero speaks of a genito musical synesthesia analogous to color hearing in this connection calicia states archivo di psychiatria 1900 page 209 that 60 percent inverts are musicians hirschfeld de homosexualitat page 500 regards this estimate as excessive but he himself elsewhere states page 175 that 98 percent of male inverts are greatly attracted to music the women being decidedly less attracted oppenheim in a paper summarized in the neurologische centralblatt for june first nineteen ten and the alienist and neurologist for november nineteen ten well remarks that the musical disposition is marked by a great emotional instability and this instability is a disposition to nervousness it is thus that neurasthenia is so common among musicians the musician has not been rendered nervous by the music but he owes his nervousness as also it may be added his disposition to homosexuality to the same disposition to which he owes his musical aptitude moreover the musician is frequently one-sided in his gifts and the possession of a single hypertrophied aptitude is itself closely related to the neurophatic and psychophatic diathesis the tendency to dramatic aptitude 
found among a large portion of my subjects who have never been professional actors, has attracted the attention of previous investigators in this field. Thus Mall refers to the frequency of artistic, and especially dramatic, talent among inverts, and remarks that the case is doubtful. After pointing out that the lie which they have to be perpetually living renders inverts always actors, he goes on to say, Apart from this, it seems to me that the capacity and the inclination to conceive situations and to represent them in a masterly manner corresponds to an abnormal predisposition of the nervous system, just as does sexual inversion, so that both phenomena are due to the same source. I am in agreement with this statement. The congenitally inverted may, I believe, be looked upon as a class of individuals exhibiting nervous characters which, to some extent, approximate them to persons of artistic genius. The dramatic and artistic aptitudes of inverts are therefore partly due to the circumstances of the invert's life, which render him necessarily an actor, and in some few cases lead him into a love of deception comparable with that of a hysterical woman, and partly, it is probable, to a congenital nervous predisposition allied to the predisposition to dramatic aptitude. One of my correspondents has long been interested in the frequency of inversion among actors and actresses. He knew an inverted actor who told him he adopted the profession because it would enable him to indulge his proclivity. But on the whole, he regards this tendency as due to hitherto unconsidered imaginative flexibilities and curiosities in the individual. The actor, ex hypothesis is one who works himself by sympathy, intellectual and emotional, into states of psychological being that are not his own. He learns to comprehend, nay, to live himself into, relations which were originally alien to his nature. The capacity for doing this, what makes a born actor, implies a faculty for extending his artistically acquired experience into life. In the process of his trade, therefore, he becomes at all points sensitive to human emotions, and sexuality being the most intellectual undetermined of the appetites after hunger, the actor might discover himself in a sort of sexual indifference, out of which a sexual aberration could easily arise. A man devoid of this imaginative flexibility could not be a successful actor. The man who possesses it would be exposed to divagations of the sexual instinct under aesthetical or merely wanton influences. Something of the same kind is applicable to musicians and artists, in whom sexual inversion prevails beyond the average. They are conditioned by their aesthetical faculty and encouraged by the circumstances of their life to feel and express the whole gamut of emotional experience. Thus they get an environment which, unless they are sharply otherwise differentiated, leads easily to experiments in passion. All this joins on to what you call the variational diathesis of men of genius. But I should seek the explanation of the phenomena less in the original sexual constitution than in the exercise of sympathetic, assimilative emotional qualities, powerfully stimulated and acted on by the conditions of the individual's life. The artist, the singer, the actor, the painter, are more exposed to the influences out of which sexual differentiation in an abnormal direction may arise. Some persons are certainly made abnormal by nature. Others, of this sympathetic artistic temperament, may become so through their sympathies plus their conditions of life. It is possible there may be some element of truth in this view, which my correspondent regarded as purely hypothetical. In this connection I may, perhaps, mention a moral quality, which is very often associated with dramatic aptitude, and also with minor degrees of nervous degeneration, and that is vanity and the love of applause. While among a considerable section of inverts it is not more marked than among the non-inverted, if not indeed less marked, among another section it is found in an exaggerated degree. In at least one of my cases, vanity and delight in admiration, both as regards personal qualities and artistic productions, reach an almost morbid extent, and the quotations from letters written by various others of my subjects show a curious complacency in the description of their personal physical characters, markedly absent in other cases. 
It is suggested by Alexander Schmid on the basis of Alder's views that this vanity, which sometimes in the inverted artist becomes an exalted pride, as of a guardian of sacred mysteries, may be regarded as an effort to secure a compensation for the consciousness of feminine defect. The extreme type of this preoccupation with personal beauty is represented by the history of himself sent by a young Italian of good family to Zola, in the hope, itself a sign of vanity, that the distinguished novelist would make it the subject of one of his works. The history is reproduced in the Archives de Anthropologie Criminelle, 1894, and in La Homosexualité et les Types Homosexuels, 1910, by Dr. Laups, G. St. Paul. I quote the following passage. At the age of 18 I was, with few differences, what I am now at 23. I am rather below the medium height, 1.65 meters, well-proportioned, slender, but not lean. My torso is superb. A sculptor would find nothing against it, and would not find it very different from that of Antonitis. My back is very arched, perhaps too much so, and my hips are very developed. My pelvis is broad, like a woman's. My knees slightly approximate. My feet are small. My hands superb. The fingers curved back with glistening nails, rosy and polished, cut squarely like those of ancient statues. My neck is long and round, the nap charmingly adorned with downy hairs. My head is charming, and at eighteen was more so. The oval of it is perfect and strikes all by its infantine form. At twenty-three I am to be taken for seventeen at most. My complexion is white and rosy, deepening at the faintest emotion. The forehead is not beautiful. It recedes slightly and is hollow at the temples but fortunately it is half covered by long hair of a dark blonde which curls naturally. The head is a perfect form because of the curly hair, but on examination there is an enormous protuberance at the occiput. My eyes are oval of a gray-blue, with dark chestnut eyelashes and thick arched eyebrows. My eyes are very liquid, but with dark circles and blistered, and they are subject to slight temporary inflammation. My mouth is fairly large, with thick red lips, the lower pendant. They tell me I have the Austrian mouth. My teeth are dazzling, though three are decayed and stopped. Fortunately, they cannot be seen. My ears are small and with very colored lobes. My chin is very fat, and at eighteen it was smooth and velvety as a woman's. At present there is a slight beard, always shaved. Two beauty spots, black and velvety, on my left cheek contrast with my blue eyes. My nose is thin and straight, with delicate nostrils and a slight, almost insensible curve. My voice is gentle, and people always regret that I have not learned to sing. This description is noteworthy as a detailed portrait of a sexual invert of a certain type. The whole history is interesting and instructive. Certain peculiarities in taste as regards costume have rightly or wrongly been attributed to inverts. Apart from the tendency of a certain group to adopt feminine habits, and may here be mentioned, Tardieu, many years ago, referred to the taste for keeping the neck uncovered. This peculiarity may occasionally be observed among inverts, especially the more artistic among them. The cause does not appear to be precisely vanity so much as that physical consciousness which is so curiously marked with inverts and induces the more feminine among them to cultivate feminine grace of form and the more masculine to emphasize the masculine athletic habit. It has also been remarked that inverts exhibit a preference for green garments. In Rome, Cinetti were for this reason called galbanati. Chevalier remarks that some years ago a band of pederasts at Paris wore green cravats as a badge. This decided preference for green is well marked in several of my cases of both sexes, and in some at least the preference certainly arose spontaneously. Green, as Yastro and others have shown, is very rarely the favorite color of adults of the Anglo-Saxon race, though some inquirers have found it to be more commonly a preferred color among children especially girls, and it is more often preferred by women than by men. The favorite color among normal women, and indeed very often among normal men, 
though here not so often as blue, is red, and it is notable that of recent years there has been a fashion for a red tie to be adopted by inverts as their badge. This is especially marked among the fairies, as a fellerator is there termed, in New York. It is red, writes an American correspondent, himself inverted. That has become almost a synonym for sexual inversion, not only in the minds of inverts themselves, but in the popular mind. To wear a red necktie on the street is to invite remarks from newsboys and others, remarks that have the practices of inverts for their theme. A friend told me once that when a group of street boys caught sight of the red necktie he was wearing, they sucked their fingers in imitation of fellatio. Male prostitutes who walk the streets of Philadelphia and New York almost invariably wear red neckties. It is the badge of all their tribe. The rooms of many of my inverted friends have red as the prevailing color in decorations. Among my classmates at the medical school, few ever had the courage to wear a red tie. Those who did never repeated the experiment. Moral Attitude of the Invert There is some interest in tracing the invert's own attitude toward his anomaly and his estimate of its morality. As my cases are not patients seeking to be cured of their perversion, this attitude cannot be taken for granted. I have noted the moral attitude in 57 cases. In eight, the subjects loathe themselves and have fought in vain against their perversion which they often regard as a sin. Nine or ten are doubtful, and have little to say in justification of their condition, which they regard as perhaps morbid, a moral disease. One, while thinking it right to gratify his natural instincts, admits that they may be vices. The remainder, a large majority including all the women are, on the other hand, emphatic in their assertion that their moral position is precisely the same as that of the normally constituted individual, on the lowest ground a matter of taste, and at least two state that homosexual relationship should be regarded as sacramental, a holy matrimony. Two or three even regard inverted love as nobler than ordinary sexual love. Several add the proviso that there should be consent and understanding on both sides, and no attempt at seduction. The chief regret of two or three is the double life they are obliged to lead. When inverts have clearly faced and realized their own natures, it is not so much, it seems, their conscience that worries them, or even the fear of the police, as the attitude of the world. An American correspondent writes, it is the fear of public opinion that hangs above them like the sword of Damocles. This fear is the heritage of all of us. It is not the fear of conscience, and it is not engendered by a feeling of wrongdoing. Rather, it is a silent submission to prejudices that meet us on every side. The normal attitude of the sexual invert, and I have known hundreds, with regards to his particular passion, is not essentially different from that of the normal man with regard to his. It is noteworthy that even when the condition is regarded as morbid, and even when a life of chastity has, on this account, been deliberately chosen, it is very rare to find an invert expressing any wish to change his sexual ideals. The male invert cannot find, and has no desire to find, any sexual charm in a woman, for he finds all possible charms united in a man. And a woman invert writes, I cannot conceive a sadder fate than to be a woman, an average woman reduced to the necessity of loving a man. It will be seen that my conclusions under this head are in striking contrast to those of Westfall, who believe that every invert regarded himself as morbid, and probably show a much higher proportion of self-approving inverts than any previous series. This is largely due to the fact that the cases were not obtained from the consulting room, and that they represent in some degree the intellectual aristocracy of inversion, including individuals who, often not without severe struggles, have found consolation in the example of the Greeks or elsewhere, and have succeeded in attaining a modus vivendi with the moral world, as they have come to conceive it. End of chapter 5 Recording by Kirk Ziegler, Ogden, Utah VoiceOversByKirk.com Chapter 6 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis. Chapter 6. The Theory of Sexual Inversion, Part 1. The analysis of these cases leads directly up to a question of the first importance. What is sexual inversion? Is it, as many would have us believe, an abominably acquired vice to be stamped out by the prison? Or is it, as a few assert, a beneficial variety of human emotion which should be tolerated or even fostered? Is it a diseased condition which qualifies its subject for the lunatic asylum? Or is it a natural monstrosity, a human sport, the manifestations of which must be regulated when they become antisocial? There is probably an element of truth in more than one of these views. Very widely divergent views of sexual inversion are largely justified by the position and attitude of the investigator. It is natural that the police official should find that his cases are largely mere examples of disgusting vice and crime. It is natural that the asylum superintendent should find that we are chiefly dealing with a form of insanity. It is equally natural that the sexual invert himself should find that he and his inverted friends are not so very unlike ordinary persons. We have to recognize the influence of professional and personal bias and the influence of environment. There have been two main streams of tendency in the views regarding sexual inversion, one seeking to enlarge the sphere of the acquired, represented by Binet, who, however, recognized predisposition, schrank notzing and recently the Freudians, the other seeking to enlarge the sphere of the congenital, represented by Kraft Ebing, Moll, Ferré, and today by the majority of authorities. There is, as usually happens, truth in both these views, but inasmuch as those who represent the acquired view often deny any congenital element, we are called upon to discuss the question. The view that sexual inversion is entirely explained by the influence of early association or of suggestion is an attractive one and at first sight it seems to be supported by what we know of erotic fetishism by which a woman's hair or foot or even clothing becomes the focus of a man's sexual aspirations. But it must be remembered that what we see in erotic fetishism is merely the exaggeration of a normal impulse. Every lover is to some extent excited by his mistress' hair, a foot, or clothing. Even here, therefore, there is really what may fairly be regarded as a congenital element, and, moreover, there is reason to believe that the erotic fetishist usually displays the further congenital element of hereditary neurosis. Therefore, the analogy with erotic fetishism does not bring much help to those who argue that inversion is purely acquired. It must also be pointed out that the argument for acquired or suggested immersion logically involves the assertion that normal sexuality is also acquired or suggested. If a man becomes attracted to his own sex simply because the fact of the image of such attraction is brought before him, then we are bound to believe that a man becomes attracted to the opposite sex only because the fact or the image of such attraction is brought before him. Such a theory is unworkable. In nearly every country of the world men associate with men and women with women. If association and suggestion were the only influential causes, then inversion, instead of being the exception, ought to be the rule throughout the human species, if not indeed throughout the whole zoological series. We should, moreover, have to admit that the most fundamental human instinct is so constituted as to be equally well adapted for sterility as for that propagation of the race which, as a matter of fact, we find dominant throughout the whole of life. We must, therefore, put aside entirely the notion that the direction of the sexual impulse is merely a suggested phenomenon. Such a notion is entirely opposed to observation and experience, and will with difficulty fit into a rational biological scheme. The Freudians, alike of the orthodox and the heterodox schools, have sometimes contributed, unintentionally or not, to revive the now antiquated conception of homosexuality as an acquired phenomenon and that by insisting that its mechanism is a purely psychic though unconscious process which may be readjusted to the normal order by psychoanalytic methods freud first put forth a comprehensive statement of his view of homosexuality in the original and pregnant little book drei abhandlungen zur sexualtheorie in nineteen hundred five and has elsewhere frequently touched on the subject as have many other psychoanalysts including Alfred Adler and Steckel, who no longer belong to the orthodox Freudian school. When inverts are psychoanalytically studied, Freud believes, it is found that in early childhood they go through a phase of intense but brief fixation on a woman, usually the mother, or perhaps sister. Then, 
an internal censure inhibiting this incestuous impulse they overcome it by identifying themselves with women and take refuge in narcissism the self becoming the sexual object finally they look for youthful males resembling themselves whom they love as their mothers love them the pursuit of men is thus determined by their flight from women this view has been set forth not only by freud but by sedger steckel and many others freud himself however is careful to state that this process only represents one type of standard sexual activity and that the problem of inversion is complex and diversified this view may be said to assume a bisexual constitution as normal and homosexuality arises by the suppression owing to some accident of the heterosexual component and the path through an autoerotic process of narcissism to homosexuality on this general freudian conception of homosexuality numerous variations have been based and separate features specially emphasized by individual psychoanalysts thus Sacher considers that beneath the male individual love by the invert a female is concealed and that this fact may be revealed by psychoanalysis which removes the upper layer of the psychic palimpsest he believes that this disposition of the invert is favored by the frequent mixture of male and female traits in his near relatives it is not man whom the homosexual man loves and desires but man and woman together in one form the heterosexual element is later suppressed and then pure inversion is left further developing freud's view of the importance of anal eroticism freud sammlung kleiner schriften zur neurosenlehre volume zwei Satcher thinks that it is even the rule for a passive invert to have experienced anal eroticism in childhood and been frequently subjected to animals which have led to the desire for the anal intromission of the penis medizinische Klinik, 1909 number two Jekylls pushes this doctrine further and declares that all inverts are really passive the invert is in his love he states both subject and object he identifies himself with his mother and sees in the object of his love his own youthful person and what Jekylls asks is the aim of this mental arrangement it can scarcely be other he replies than in the part of the mother to stimulate the anal region of the object which has now become himself and to procure the same pleasure which in childhood he experienced when his mother satisfied his anal eroticism Jekylls regards this view as the continuation and concretization of freud's interpretation and the main point in homosexuality even when apparently passive becomes the craving for anal erotic satisfaction l Jekylls, einige bemerkungen zur trieblehre internationale zeitschrift für ärztliche psychoanalyse september 1913 most psychoanalysts are cautious in denying a constitutional or continental basis to inversion though they leave it in the background ferenci in an interesting attempt to classify the homosexual internationale zeitschrift für ärztliche psychoanalyse march 1914 remarks psychoanalytic investigation shows that under the name of homosexuality the most various psychic states are thrown together on the one hand true constitutional anomalies inversion or subject homoeroticism on the other hand psychoneurotic obsessional conditions object homoeroticism or obsessional homoeroticism the individual of the first kind essentially feels himself a woman who wishes to be loved by a man while the other represents a neurotic flight from women rather than sympathy to men the constitutional basis is very definitely accepted by rudolf ortwey who points out internationale zeitschrift für ärztliche psychoanalyse january 1914 that the biological doctrine of recessives and dominance in heredity helps to make clear the emergence or suppression of homosexuality on a bisexual disposition infantile events he adds which according to freud decide the sexual relations of adults can only exert the operation on the foundation of an organic predisposition infantile impressions being determined by hereditary predispositions isador coriat on the other hand while recognizing two forms of inversion incomplete and complete boldly asserts that it is never congenital and never transmitted through heredity it is always originated through a defined unconscious mechanism Coriat, homosexuality new york medical journal march twenty second nineteen thirteen Ada's view of homosexuality as of other elite conditions differs from that of most psychoanalysts by insisting on the presence of an original organic defect which the subject seeks to fortify into a point of strength he accepts two chief components of inversion a vagueness as to sexual differences and a process of self-assurance in the form of rebellion and defiance and even the feminism of the invert 
may become a method of gaining power. A. Adler über die Neurosen Charakter, 1912, page 21. The mechanism of the genesis of homosexuality put forward by Freud need not be dismissed offhand. Freud has often manifested the insight of genius and he refrains from moulding his conceptions in those inflexible shapes which have sometimes been adopted by the more dogmatic psychoanalysts who have followed him. Nor need we be unduly shocked by the incestuous air of the Oedipus complex, as it is commonly called, which figures as a component of the process. The word incest, though it has been used by Freud himself, seems scarcely a proper word to apply to the vague and elementary feelings of children, especially when those feelings scarcely pass beyond the stage of non-localized and therefore really pre-sexual feelings, in the ordinary use of the term sexual, which may be regarded as natural and normal. The Freudian conception is misrepresented and prejudiced by the statement that it involves incest. When a child loves its mother with an entire love, the love necessarily involves the germs which in later life become separated and developed into sexual love, but it is inaccurate to term this love of the child incestuous. It is quite easily conceivable that the psychic mechanism of the establishment of homosexuality has in some cases corresponded to the cause described by Freud. It may also be admitted that, as psychoanalysts claim, the pronounced horror feminine occasionally found in male inverts may plausibly be regarded as the reversal of an early and disappointed feminine attraction. But it is impossible to regard this mechanism as invariable or even frequent. It is quite true, and I have found ample evidence of the fact that inverts are often very closely attached to their mothers, even to a greater degree, indeed, than is the rule among normal children, and often like to be in constant association with their mothers. But this attraction is quite misunderstood if it is regarded as a peculiarly sexual attraction. Indeed, the whole point of the attraction is that the inverted boy vaguely feels his own feminine disposition and so shuns the uncongenial amusements and society of his own sex for the sympathy and community of tastes which he finds concentrated in his mother. So far from such association being evidence of sexual attraction, it might more reasonably be regarded as evidence of its absence. Just as the association of boys among themselves and of girls among themselves, even co-educational schools, is proof of the prevalence of heterosexual rather than homosexual feeling. Confirmation of this point of view may be found in the fact, overlooked and sometimes even denied by psychoanalysts, that frequently, even early childhood and simultaneously with this community of feeling, with his mother, the homosexual boy is already experiencing the predominant fascination of the male. He feels it long before the age at which narcissism is apt to occur, or at which self-consciousness has become sufficiently developed to allow the internal censure on unpermitted emotions to operate, or any flight from them to take place. Moreover, while most authorities have rarely been able to find any clear evidence of the sexual attraction of male inverts in childhood to mother or sister, an attraction of this kind to father or brother seems less difficult to find, and if found, it is incompatible with the typical Freudian process. In my own observation, among the histories here recorded, there are at least two clear examples of such an attraction in childhood. It must further be said that any theory of the etiology of homosexuality which leaves out of account the hereditary factor in aversion cannot be admitted. The evidence for the frequency of homosexuality among the near relatives of the inverted is now indisputable. I have traced it in a considerable proportion of cases, and in many of these the evidence is unquestionable and altogether independent of the statement of the subject himself, whose opinion may be held to be possibly biased or unreliable. This hereditary factor seems indeed to be called for by the Freudian theory itself. On that theory we need to know how it is that the subject passes through the psychic phases and reaches an emotional disposition so unlike that of normal persona. The existence of a definite hereditary tendency in a homosexual direction removes that difficulty. Freud himself recognizes this and clearly asserts congenital psychosexual constitution which must involve predisposition. On a general survey, therefore, it would appear that, on a psychic side, we may accept the reality of unconscious dynamic processes, which in particular cases may be of the Freudian or similar type. But while the study of such mechanisms may illuminate the psychology of homosexuality, they leave untouched the fundamental organic factors now accepted by most authorities. The rational way of regarding the normal sexual instinct is as an inborn organic impulse, reaching full development about the time of puberty. 
during the period of development suggestions and associations may come in to play a part in defining the object of the emotion the soil is now ready but the variety of seeds likely to thrive in it is limited that there is a greater indefiniteness in the aim of sexual impulse at this period we may believe this is shown not only by occasional tentative signs of sexual emotion directed toward the same sex in childhood but by the frequently ideal and unlocalized character of the normal passion even at puberty but the channel of sexual emotion is not thereby turned into an abnormal path whenever this happens we are bound to believe and we have many grounds for believing that we are dealing with an organism which from the beginning is abnormal the same seed of suggestion is sown in various soils in the many it dies out in the few it flourishes the cause can only be difference in the soil if we must postulate a congenital abnormality in order to account satisfactorily for at least a large proportion of sexual inverts wherein does that abnormality consist ulrichs explained the matter by saying that in sexual inverts a male body coexists with a female soul anima mulebris in corpore virile inclusa even writers of scientific eminence like magnan and clay have adopted this phrase in a modified form considering that in version a female brain is combined with a male body or male glands this is however not an explanation it merely crystallizes into an epigram the superficial impression of the matter we can probably grasp the nature of the abnormality better if we reflect on the development of the sexes and on the latent organic bisexuality in each sex at an early stage of development the sexes are indistinguishable and throughout life the traces of this early community of sex remain the hen fowl retains in a rudimentary form the spurs which are so large and formidable in her lord and sometimes she develops a capacity to crow or puts on male plumage among mammals the male possesses useless nipples which occasionally even develop into breasts and the female possesses a clitoris which is merely a rudimentary penis and may also develop the sexually inverted person does not usually possess any gross exaggeration of these signs of community with the opposite sex but as we have seen there are a considerable number of more subtle approximations in the opposite sex in inverted persons both on the physical and the psychic side putting the matter in a purely speculative shape it may be said that at conception the organism is provided with about fifty per cent of male germs and about fifty per cent of female germs and that as development proceeds either the male or the female germs assume the upper hand until in a maturely developed individual only a few aborted germs of the opposite sex are left in the homosexual however and in the bisexual we may imagine that the process has not proceeded normally on account of some peculiarity in the number or character of either the original male germs or female germs or both the result being that we have a person who is organically twisted into a shape that is more fitted for the exercise of the inverted than of the normal sexual impulse or else equally fitted for both end of chapter six part one recording by Jule niedermeyer Chapter six of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume two, by Havelock Ellis. Chapter six The Theory of Sexual Inversion, Part two. The conception of the latent bisexuality of all males and females cannot fail to be fairly obvious to intelligent observers of the human body it emerges at an early period in the history of philosophic thought and from the first was occasionally used for the explanation of homosexuality plato smith in the banquet and the hermaphroditic statues of antiquity show how acute minds working ahead of science exercise themselves with these problems for a fully illustrated study of the ancient conception of hermaphroditism in sculpture see l s a m von römer über die androgynische idee des lebens jahrbuch für sexuelle zwischenstufen Volume 5, 1903, pages 711 to 939. Parmenides, following Alcmeon, the philosophic physician who discovered that the brain is the central organ of intellect, remarks Gompertz, Greek thinkers, English translation, volume 1, page 183, used the idea of variation in the proportion of male and female generative elements to account for idiosyncrasies of sexual character. After an immense interval, Hursley, the inverted Swiss man-milliner, in his Eros, 1838, 
put forth the greek view anew schopenhauer again from the philosophical side recognized the bisexuality of the human individual see julius burger allgemeine zeitschrift für psychiatrie 1912 page 630 and ulrichs from 1862 onward adopted a similar doctrine on a platonic basis to explain the uranian constitution after this the idea began to be more precisely developed from the scientific side though not at first with reference to homosexuality and more especially by the great pioneers of the doctrine of evolution darwin emphasized the significance of the facts on this point as later weismann while heckel who was one of the earliest darwinians has in recent years clearly recognized the bearing on the interpretation of homosexuality of the fact that the ancestors of the vertebrates were hermaphrodites as vertebrates themselves still are in the embryonic disposition heckel in jahrbuch für sexuelle zwischenstufen april 1913 pages 262 3 and 287 this view had however been set forth at an earlier date by individual physicians notably in america by kiernan american lancet 1884 and medical standard november and december 1888 and lidston philadelphia medical and surgical reporter september 1889 and addresses and essays 1892 in 1893 in his la version sexuelle chevalier a pupil of la cassagne who had already applied the term hermaphrodism moral to this anomaly explained congenital homosexuality by the idea of latent bisexuality dr g de letamendi dean of the faculty of medicine of madrid in a paper read before the international medical congress at rome in eighteen ninety four set forth a principle of pan hermaphroditism a hermaphroditic bipolarity which involved the existence of latent female germs in the male latent male germs in the female which latent germs may strive for and sometimes obtain the mastery in february eighteen ninety six the first version of the present chapter setting forth the conception of inversion as a psychic and somatic development on the basis of a latent bisexuality was published in the zentralblatt für nervenheilkunde und psychiatrie corella i b i d may eighteen ninety adopted a somewhat similar view even arguing that the invert is a transitional form between the complete man or woman and the hermaphrodite in germany a patient of kraft ebbing had worked out the same idea connecting inversion with fetal bisexuality eighth edition psychopathia sexualis page two hundred twenty seven kraft ebbing himself at first simply asserted that whether congenital or acquired there must be belastung inversion is a degenerate phenomenon a functional sign of degeneration kraft ebbing zur erklärung der konträren sexualempfindung jahrbuch für psychiatrie 1894 in the later editions of psychopathia sexualis however 1896 and onward and notably in jahrbuch für sexuelle zwischenstufen volume 3 1901 he went farther adopting the explanation on the lines of original bisexuality english translation of tenth edition pages 336 and 7 in much the same language as i have used he argued that there has been a struggle in the centers homosexuality resulting when the center antagonistic to that represented by the sexual gland conquers and psychosexual hermaphroditism resulting when both centers are too weak to obtain victory in either case such disturbance not being a psychic degeneration or disease but simply an anomaly comparable to a malformation and quite consonant with psychic health this is the view now widely accepted by investigators of sexual inversion much material bearing on the history of this conception has been brought together by hirschfeld in die homosexualität chapter nineteen and previously in vom wesen der liebe jahrbuch für sexuelle zwischenstufen volume eight nineteen o six pages one hundred eleven to one hundred thirty three a similar allied view is now constantly met within writers of scientific authority who are only incidentally concerned with the study of sexual inversion thus halban die entstehung des geschlechtscharaktere archiv für gynäkologie 1903 regards hermaphroditism which he would extend to the psychic sphere as a state in which a double sexual impulse determines the cause of fetal and later development shattock and seligman true hermaphroditism in the domestic fowl remarks on allopterotism transactions of pathological society of london volume seven part one nineteen o six pointing out that mere atrophy of the ovary 
cannot account for the appearance in the hand-bird of male characters which are not retrogressive but progressive argues that such birds are really bisexual or hermaphrodite either by the single ovary being really bisexual as was the case with a fowl they examined or that the sexual glands are paired one being male and the other female or else that there is misplaced male tissue in a neighbouring viscous like the adrenal or kidney the male elements asserting themselves when the female elements degenerate hermaphroditism they conclude far from being a phenomenon altogether abnormal amongst the higher vertebrates should be viewed rather as a reversion to the primitive ancestral phase in which bisexualism was the normal disposition true hermaphroditism in man being established the question arises whether lesser grades do not occur remote evidence of bisexuality in the human subject may perhaps be afforded by the psychical phenomenon of sexual perversion and inversion similarly in a case of unilateral secondary male character in an otherwise female pheasant c j bond has more recently shown section of zoology birmingham meeting of british medical association british medical journal september twenty nineteen thirteen that an ovitestis was present with degenerating ovarian tissue and developing testicular tissue and such islands of actively growing male tissue can frequently be found he states in the degenerating ovaries of female birds which have put forth male plumage sir john bland sutton referring to the fact that the external conformation of the body affords no positive certainty as to the nature of the internal sexual glands adds british medical journal october thirty nineteen o nine it is a fair presumption that some examples of sexual frigidity and sex perversion may be explained by the possibility that the individuals concerned may possess sexual glands opposite in character to those indicated by the external configuration of their bodies looking at the matter more broadly and fundamentally in its normal aspects heap declares proceedings of the cambridge philosophical society volume fourteen part two nineteen o seven that there is no such thing as a pure male or female animal but that all contain a dominant and recessive sex except those hermaphrodites in which both sexes are equally represented there seems to me ample evidence for the conclusion that there is no such thing as a pure male or female f h a marshall again in the standard manual the physiology of reproduction nineteen ten page six hundred fifty five at sequence is inclined to accept the same view if it be true he remarks that all individuals are potentially bisexual and that changed circumstances leading to a changed metabolism may in exceptional circumstances even adult life cause the development of the recessive characters it would seem extremely probable that the dominance of one set of sexual characters over the other may be determined in some cases at an early stage of development in response to stimulus which may be either internal or external so also barry hart a typical male and female sex ensembles a paper read before edinburgh obstetrical society british medical journal june twenty nineteen fourteen page thousand three hundred fifty five regards the normal male or female as embodying a maximum of the potent organs of his or her own sex with a minimum of non-potent organs of the other sex with secondary sex traits congruent any increase in the minimum gives a diminished maximum and non congruence of the secondary characters we thus see that the ancient medico-philosophic conception of organic bisexuality put forth by the greeks as the key to the explanation of sexual inversion after sinking out of sight for two thousand years was arrived early in the nineteenth century by two amateur philosophers who were themselves inverted hösli ulrichs as well as by a genuine philosopher who was not inverted schopenhauer then the conception of latent bisexuality independently of homosexuality was developed from the purely scientific side by darwin and evolutionists generally in the next stage this conception was adopted by the psychiatric and other scientific authorities on homosexuality kraft ebbing and the majority of other students finally embryologists physiologists of sex and biologists generally not only accept the conception of bisexuality but admit that it probably helps to account for homosexuality in this way the idea may be said to have passed into current thought we cannot assert that it constitutes an adequate explanation of homosexuality but it enables us in some degree to understand what for many is a mysterious riddle and it furnishes a useful basis for the classification not only of homosexuality but of the other mixed or intermediate sexual anomalies in the same group the chief of these intermediate sexual anomalies are first 
physical hermaphroditism in its various stages second gynandromorphism or unicoidism in which men possess characters resembling those of males who have been early castrated and women possess similarly masculine characters third sexo aesthetic inversion or ionism hirschfeld's transvestism or cross-dressing in which outside the specifically sexual emotions men possess the tastes of women and women those of men hirschfeld has discussed these intermediate sexual stages in various works especially in geschlechtsübergänge 1905 die transvestiten 1910 and chapter 11 of die homosexualität hermaphroditism the reality of which has only of late been recognized and is still disputed and pseudo hermaphroditism in the physical variations are fully dealt with in a great work richly illustrated hermaphroditismus bei menschen by f l von neugebauer of warschau neugebauer published an earlier and briefer study of the subject in the jahrbuch für sexuelle zwischenstufen volume four nineteen o two pages one to one hundred seventy six with a bibliography in volume eight nineteen o six of the same Jahrbuch, pages 685 to 700. Hirschfeld emphasizes the fact that neither hermaphroditism nor unicoidism is commonly associated with homosexuality and that a large portion of the cases of transvestism, as defined by him, are heterosexual. True inversion seems, however, to be not infrequently found among pseudohermaphrodites. Neugebauer records numerous cases. Magnan has published a case in a girl brought up as a youth Gazette Medicale de Paris, March 31, 1911, and La Pointe, a case in a man put up as a girl. Revue de Psychiatrie, 1911, page 219. Such cases may be accounted for by the training and association involved by the early era in recognition of sex, and perhaps still more by a really organic predisposition of homosexuality although the sexual psychic characters are not necessarily bound up with the coexistence of corresponding sexual clans halban archiv für gynecologie 1903 goes so far as to class the homosexual as real pseudo hermaphrodites exactly comparable to a man with a female breast or a woman with a beard and proposes to term homosexuality pseudo hermaphroditus masculinus psychicus this however is an unnecessary and scarcely satisfactory confusion to place the group of homosexual phenomena among other intermediate groups on the organic bisexual basis is a convenient classification it can scarcely be regarded as a complete explanation it is probable that we may ultimately find a more fundamental source of these various phenomena in the stimulating and inhibiting play of the internal secretions our knowledge of the intimate association between the hormones and sexual phenomena is already sufficient to make such an explanation intelligible the complex interaction of the glandular internal secretions and the liability to varying disturbance in balance may well suffice to account for the complexity of the phenomena it would harmonize with what we know of the occasional delayed manifestations of homosexuality and would not clash with the congenital nature for we know that the disordered state of thymus for instance may be hereditary and it is held that status lymphaticus may be either inborn or acquired normal sexual characters seem to depend largely upon the due coordination of the internal secretions and it is reasonable to suppose that sexual deviations depend upon the incoordination if a man is a man and a woman a woman because in pleabel's phrase of the totally of the internal secretions the intermediate stages between the man and the woman must be due to redistribution of these internal secretions we know that various internal secretions possess an influential sexual effect thus the atrophy of the thymus seems to be connected with sexual development at puberty the thyroid reinforces the genital glands adrenal overdevelopment can produce in a female the secondary characteristics of the male as well as cause precocious development of maleness etc an alteration in the metabolism as f h a marshall suggests even in comparatively late life may initiate changes in the direction of the opposite sex metabolic chemical processes may thus be found to furnish a key to complex and subtle sexual variations alike somatic and psychic although we must still regard such processes as arising on an inborn predisposition whatever its ultimate explanation 
sexual inversion may thus fairly be considered a sport or variation one of those organic aberrations which we see throughout living nature in plants and in animals it is not here asserted as i would carefully point out that an inverted sexual instinct or organ for such instinct is developed in early embryonic life such a notion is rightly rejected as absurd what we may reasonably regard as formed at an early stage of development is strictly a predisposition that is to say such a modification of the organism that it becomes more adapted than the normal or average organism to experience sexual attraction to the same sex the sexual invert may thus be roughly compared to the congenital idiot to the instinctive criminal to the man of genius who are all not strictly concordant with the usual biological variation because this is of a less subtle character but who becomes somewhat more intelligible to us if we bear in mind the affinity to variations simmons compared inversion to the color blindness and such a comparison is reasonable just as the ordinary color blind person is congenitally insensitive to those red green rays which are precisely the most impressive to the normal eye and gives an extended value to the other colors finding that blood is the same color as grass and the florid complexion blue as the sky so the invert fails to see emotional values patent to normal persons transferring those values to emotional associations which for the rest of the world are utterly distinct or we may compare inversion to such a phenomenon as color hearing in which there is not so much defect as an abnormality of nervous tracts producing new and involuntary combinations just as the color hearer instinctively associates colors with sounds like the young japanese lady who remarked when listening to singing boy's voice is red so the invert has his sexual sensations brought into relationship with objects that are normally without sexual appeal and inversion like color hearing is found more commonly in young subjects tending to become less marked or to die out after puberty color hearing while an abnormal phenomenon it must be added cannot be called a diseased condition and it is probably much less frequently associated with other abnormal or degenerative stigmata than is inversion there is often a congenital element shown by the tendency to hereditary transmission while the associations are developed in very early life and are too regular to be the simple result of suggestion all such organic variations are abnormalities it is important that we should have a clear idea as to what an abnormality is many people imagine that what is abnormal is necessarily diseased that is not the case unless we give the word disease an inconveniently and illegitimately wide extension it is both inconvenient and inexact to speak of color blindness criminality and genius as diseases in the same sense as we speak of scarlet fever or tuberculosis or general paralysis as diseases every congenital abnormality is doubtless due to a peculiarity in the sperm or oval elements or in the mingling or to some disturbance in the early development but the same may doubtless be said of the normal dissimilarities between brothers and sisters it is quite true that any of these aberrations may be due to antenatal disease but to call them abnormal does not beg that question if it is thought that any authority is needed to support this view we can scarcely find a weightier than that of Biotrop, who repeatedly insisted on the right use of the word anomaly and who taught that though an anomaly may constitute a predisposition to disease the study of anomalies pathology as he called it teratology as we may perhaps prefer to call it is not the study of disease which he termed nosology the study of the abnormal is perfectly distinct from the study of the morbid Virchow considers that the region of the abnormal is the region of pathology and that the study of disease must be regarded distinctly as nosology whether we adopt this terminology or whether we consider the study of the abnormal as part of teratology is a secondary matter not affecting the right understanding of the term anomaly and its due differentiation from the term disease at the innsbruck meeting of the german anthropological society in eighteen ninety four virchow thus expressed himself in old days an anomaly was called pathos and in this sense every departure from the norm is for me a pathological event if we have ascertained such a pathological event we are further led to investigate what pathos was the special cause of it this cause may be for example an external force or a chemical substance or a physical agent producing in the normal condition of the body a change 
an anomaly, Paphos. This can become hereditary under some circumstances, and then become the foundation for certain small hereditary characters which are propagated in a family. In themselves they belong to pathology, even although they produce no injury. For I must remark that pathological does not mean harmful. It does not indicate disease. Disease in Greek is nosos, and it is nosology that is concerned with disease. The pathological under some circumstances can be advantageous. Korrespondenzblatt Deutsche Gesellschaft für Anthropologie, 1894. These remarks are of interest when we are attempting to find the wider bearings of such an anomaly as sexual inversion. This same distinction has more recently been emphasized by Professor Aschoff, Deutsche Medizinische Wochenschrift, February 3rd, 1910, British Medical Journal, April 9th, 1910, page 892, as against Ribert and others who would unduly narrow the conception of pathos. Aschoff points out that, not merely for the sake of precision and uniformity of terminology, but of clear thinking, it is desirable that we should retain a distinction in regard to which Garland and the ancient physicians were very definite. They use pathos as the wider term involving affection, affectio, in general, not necessarily impairment of vital tissue. When that was involved, there was nosos, disease. A word may be said as to the connection between sexual inversion and degeneration. In France especially, since the days of Morel, the stigmata of degeneration are much spoken of. Sexual inversion is frequently regarded as one of them, i.e. as an episodic syndrome of hereditary disease, taking its place beside other psychic stigmata such as kleptomania and pyromania. Kraft Ebing long so regarded inversion. It is the view of Magnan, one of the earliest investigators of homosexuality, and it was adopted by Möbius. Strictly speaking, the invert is degenerate. He has fallen away from the genus. So is a colorblind person. But Morel's conception of degenerescence has unfortunately been coarsened and vulgarized. As it now stands, we gain little or no information by being told that a person is a degenerate. It is only, as Nicky constantly argued, when we find a complexus of well-marked abnormalities that we are fairly justified in asserting that we have to deal with a condition of degeneration. Inversion is sometimes found in such a condition. I have, indeed, already tried to suggest that a condition of diffused minor abnormality may be regarded as a basis of congenital inversion. In other words, inversion is bound up with a modification of the secondary sexual characters, but these anomalies and modifications are not invariable, and are not usually of a serious character. Inversion is rare in the profoundly degenerate. It is undesirable to call these modifications stigmata of degeneration, a term which threatens to disappear from scientific terminology to become a mere term of literary and journalistic abuse. So much may be said concerning a conception or a phrase of which far too much has been made in popular literature. At the best, it remains vague and unfitted for scientific use. It is now widely recognized that we gain little by describing inversion as a degeneration. Necker, who attached significance to the stigma of degeneration, when numerous, was especially active in pointing out that inverts are not degenerate, and frequently returned to this point. Löwenfeld, Freud, Hirschfeld, Bloch, Rohleder, all rejected the conception of sexual inversion as a degeneracy. Molly is still unable to abandon altogether the position that since inversion involves a disharmony between psychic disposition and physical conformation, we must regard it as morbid. But he recognizes, like Kraft Ebbing, that it is properly viewed as being on the level of a deformity, that is, an abnormality comparable to physical hermaphroditism. A. Moll, Sexuelle Zwischenstufen, Zeitschrift für ärztliche Fortbildung, number 24, 1904. Necker repeatedly emphasizes the view that inversion is a continuous, non-morbid abnormality. Thus, in the last year of his life he wrote Zeitschrift für die gesamte Neurologie und Psychiatrie, volume 15, heft 5, 1913, we must not conceive of homosexuality as a degeneration or a disease, but at most an abnormality due to a disturbance of development. Löwenfeld, always a cautious and sagacious clinical observer, agreeing with Necker and Hirschfeld, regards inversion as certainly an abnormality, but not therefore morbid. It may be associated with disease and degeneration, but is usually simply a variation from the norm not to be regarded as morbid or degenerate and not diminishing the value of the individual as a member of society. Löwenfeld über die sexuelle Konstitution, 1911, page 166, also Zeitschrift für Sexualwissenschaft, February 1908, 
and Sexualprobleme, April 1908. A Letrino of Amsterdam pushes the view that inversion is a non-morbid abnormality to an undue extreme by asserting that the uranist is a normal variety of the species Homo sapiens. Uranism et Degenerescence, Archive d'Anthropologie Criminelle, August to September 1908. Inversion may be regarded as, in the correct sense of the word here adopted, a pathological abnormality, but not as an anthropological human variety comparable to the Negro or the Mongolian man. For further opinions in favor of inversion as an anomaly, see Hirschfeld, Die Homosexualität, page 388, its sequence. Sexual inversion, therefore, remains a congenital anomaly to be classed with other congenital abnormalities which have psychic concomitants. At the very least, such congenital abnormality usually exists as a predisposition to inversion. It is probable that many persons go through the world with a congenital predisposition to inversion which always remains latent and unroused. In others, the instinct is so strong that it forces its own way in spite of all obstacles. In others, again, the predisposition is weaker, and a powerful exciting cause plays the predominant part. We are thus led to the consideration of the causes that excite the latent predisposition. A great variety of causes has been held to excite the sexual inversion. It is only necessary to mention those which I have found influential. The first to come before us is our school system, with its segregation of boys and girls apart from each other during the periods of puberty and adolescence. Many inverts have not been to school at all, and many who have been pass through school life without forming any passionate or sexual relationship. But there remain a large number who date the development of homosexuality from the influences and examples of school life. The impressions received at the time are not less potent because they are often purely sentimental and without any obvious sensual admixture. Whether they are sufficiently potent to generate permanent inversion alone may be doubtful, but if it is true that in early life the sexual instincts are less definitely determined than when adolescence is complete, it is conceivable, though unproved, that a very strong impression, acting even on a normal organism, may cause a rest of sexual development on the psychic side. Another exciting cause of inversion is seduction. By this I mean the initiation of the young boy or girl by some older and more experienced person in whom inversion is already developed and who is seeking the gratification of the abnormal instinct. This appears to be a not uncommon incident in the early history of sexual inverts. That such seduction, sometimes an abrupt and inconsiderate act of mere sexual gratification, could by itself produce a taste for homosexuality is highly improbable. In individuals, not already predisposed, it is far more likely to produce disgust, as it did in the case of the youthful Rousseau. He only can be seduced, as Moll puts it, who is capable of being seduced. No doubt it frequently happens in these, as so often in more normal seductions, that the victim has offered a voluntary or involuntary invitation. Another exciting cause of inversion, to which little importance is usually attached, but which I find to have some weight, is disappointment in normal love. It happens that a man in whom the homosexual instinct is yet only latent, or at all events held in a state of repression, tries to form a relationship with a woman. This relationship may be ardent on one or both sides, but often, doubtless, from the latent homosexuality of the lover, it comes to nothing. Such love disappointments in a more or less acute form occur at some time or another to nearly everyone. But in these persons the disappointment with one woman constitutes motives strong enough to disgust the lover with the whole sex and to turn his attention toward his own sex. It is evident that the instinct which can thus be turned round can scarcely be strong, and it seems probable that in some of these cases the episode of normal love simply serves to bring home to the invert the fact that he is not made for normal love. In other cases, it seems, especially those that are somewhat feeble-minded and unbalanced, a love disappointment really does poison the normal instinct, and a more or less impotent love for women becomes an equally impotent love for men. The prevalence of homosexuality among prostitutes may be, to a large extent, explained by a similar and better-founded disgust with normal sexuality. These three influences, therefore, example at school, seduction, disappointment in normal love, all of them drawing the subject away from the opposite sex and concentrating him on his own sex, are exciting causes of inversion. But they require a favorable organic predisposition to act on, while there are a large number of cases in which no exciting cause at all can be found, but in which, from earliest childhood, 
the subject's interest seemed to be turned on his own sex and continues to be so turned throughout life at this point i conclude the analysis of the psychology of sexual inversion as it presents itself to me i have sought only to bring out the more salient points neglecting minor points neglecting also those groups of inverts who may be regarded as of secondary importance the average inward moving in ordinary society is a person of average general health though very frequently with hereditary relationships that are markedly neurotic he is usually the subject of a congenital predisposing abnormality or complexes of minor abnormalities making it difficult or impossible for him to feel sexual attraction to the opposite sex and easy to feel sexual attraction to his own sex this abnormality either appears spontaneously from the first by development or arrest of development or it is called into activity by some accidental circumstance End of chapter 6 Recorded by Julia Niedermeyer Chapter 7 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 2, by Havelock Ellis, Chapter 7, Conclusions, Part 1. Having now completed the psychological analysis of the sexual invert, so far as I have been able to study him, it only remains to speak briefly of the attitude of society and the law. First, however, a few words as to the medical and hygienic aspects of inversion. The preliminary question of the prevention of homosexuality is in too vague a position at present to be profitably discussed. So far as the really congenital invert is concerned, prevention can have but small influence. But sound social hygiene should render difficult the acquisition of homosexual perversity, or what has been termed pseudo-homosexuality. It is the school which is naturally the chief theatre of immature and temporary homosexual manifestations, partly because school life largely coincides with the period during which the sexual impulse frequently tends to be undifferentiated, and partly because in the traditions of large and old schools an artificial homosexuality is often deeply rooted. Homosexuality in English schools has already been briefly referred to in Chapter 3. As a precise and interesting picture of the phenomena in French schools, I may mention a story by Albert Nortal, Les Adolescents Passionnés, 1913, written immediately after the author left college, though not published until more than twenty-five years later, and clearly based on personal observation and experience. As regards German schools, see, for example, Moll, Untersuchungen über die Libido Sexualis, page 449 and following, and for sexual manifestations in early life generally, the same author's Sexual Life of the Child. Also, Hirschfeld, Jahrbuch für sexuelle Schüssenstufen, volume 5, 1903, page 47 and further, and for references, Hirschfeld, Die Homosexualität, page 46 and further. While much may be done by physical hygiene and other means to prevent the extension of homosexuality in schools, it is impossible, and even undesirable, to repress absolutely the emotional manifestations of sex in either boys or girls who have reached the age of puberty. It must always be remembered that profoundly rooted organic impulses cannot be effectually combated by direct methods. Writing of a period two centuries ago, Casanova, relating his early life as a seminarist trained to the priesthood, describes the precautions taken to prevent the youths entering each other's beds, and points out the folly of such precautions. As that master of the human heart remarks, such prohibitions intensify the very evil they are intended to prevent by invoking in its aid the impulse to disobedience natural to every child of Adam and Eve, and the observation has often been repeated by teachers since. We probably have to recognize that a way to render such manifestations wholesome, as well as to prepare for the relationships of later life, is the adoption, 
so far as possible, of the method of co-education of the sexes, not, of course, necessarily involving identity of education for both sexes, since a certain amount of association between the sexes helps to preserve the healthiness of the sexual-emotional attitude. Association between the sexes will not, of course, prevent the development of congenital inversion. In this connection it is pointed out by Beth that it was precisely in Sparta and Lesbos where homosexuality was most ideally cultivated, that the sexes, so far as we know, associated more freely than in any other Greek state. The question of the treatment of homosexuality must be approached with discrimination, caution, and scepticism. Nowadays we can have but little sympathy with those who, at all costs, are prepared to cure the invert. There is no sound method of cure in radical cases. At one time, the seemingly very radical method of castration was advocated, and occasionally carried out, as in the case I have recorded in a previous chapter, History 26. Like all methods of treatment, it is sometimes believed to have been successful by those who carried it out. Usually, after a short period, it is found to be unsuccessful, and in some cases the condition, especially the mental condition, is rendered worse. It is not difficult to understand why this should be. Sexual inversion is not a localized genital condition. It is a diffused condition, and firmly imprinted on the whole psychic state. There may be reasons for castration, or the slighter operation of vasectomy, but, although sexual tension may be thereby diminished, no authority now believes that any such operation will affect the actual inversion. Castration of the body in adult age cannot be expected to produce castration of the mind. Moll, Ferry, Necke, Bloch, Rohleder, Hirschfeld are all either opposed to castration for inversion or very doubtful as to any beneficial results. In a case communicated to me by Dr. Schufeld, an invert had himself castrated at the age of twenty-six to diminish sexual desire, make himself more like a woman, and to stop growth of beard. But the only apparent physical effect, he wrote, quote, was to increase my weight ten per cent and render me a semi-invalid for the rest of my life. After two years my sexuality decreased, but that may have been due to satiety or to advancing years. I was also rendered more easily irritated over trifles and more vengeful. Terrible criminal auto-suggestions came into my head, never experienced before. End quote. Ferré, Revue de Chirurgie, March 10, 1905, published the case of an invert of English origin who had been castrated. The inverted impulse remained unchanged, as well as sexual desire and the aptitude for erection but neurasthenic symptoms, which had existed before, were aggravated. He felt less capable to resist his impulses, became migratory in his habits of life, and addicted to the use of laudanum. In a case recorded by C. H. Hughes, alienist and neurologist, August 1914, the results were less unsatisfactory. In this case, the dorsal nerve of the penis was first excised, without any result. See also Alienist and Neurologist, February 1904, page 70, as regards worse than useless results of cutting the pudic nerve. And a year or so later the testes were removed, and the patient gained tranquillity and satisfaction. His homosexual inclinations appeared to go, and he began to show inclination for asexualized women, being specially anxious to meet with a woman whose ovaries had been removed on account of inversion. Reference may also be made to Necke, Die ersten Kastrationen aus sozialen Gründen auf europäischen Boden, Neurologisches Zentralblatt, 1909, number 5, and E. Wilhelm in Juristis Psychiatrische Grenzfragen, volume 8, heft 6 and 7, 1911. More trust has usually been placed in the psychotherapeutical and the surgical treatment of homosexuality. At one time, hypnotic suggestion was carried out very energetically on homosexual subjects. Kraft Ebbing seems to have been the first distinguished advocate of hypnotism for application to the homosexual. Dr. von Schrenk-Notzing, 
displayed special zeal and persistency in this treatment. He undertook to treat even the most pronounced cases of inversion by courses lasting more than a year, and involving, in at least one case, nearly 150 hypnotic sittings. He prescribed frequent visits to the brothel, previous to which the patient took large doses of alcohol. By prolonged manipulations, a prostitute endeavoured to excite erection, a process attended with varying results. It appears that in some cases this course of treatment was attended by a certain sort of success, to which an unlimited good will on the part of the patient, it is needless to say, largely contributed. The treatment was, however, usually interrupted by continual backsliding to homosexual practices, and sometimes, naturally, the cure involved a venereal disorder. The patient was enabled to marry and to beget children, it is a method of treatment which seems to have found few imitators. This we need not regret. The histories I have recorded in previous chapters show that it is not uncommon for even a pronounced invert to be able sometimes to effect coitus. It often becomes easy if at the time he fixes his thoughts on images connected with his own sex. But the perversion remains unaffected. The subject is merely, as one of Moll's inverts expressed it, practicing masturbation per vaginam. Such treatment is a training in vice, and, as Rafalovich points out, the invert is simply perverted and brought down to the vicious level which necessarily accompanies perversity. There can be no doubt that in slight and superficial cases of homosexuality, suggestion may really exert an influence. We can scarcely expect it to exert such influence when the homosexual tendency is deeply rooted in an organic inborn temperament. In such cases, indeed, the subject may resist suggestion even when in the hypnotic state. This is pointed out by Moll, a great authority on hypnotism, and with much experience of its application to homosexuality, but never inclined to encourage an exaggerated notion of its efficacy in this field. Forel, who was also an authority on hypnotism, was equally doubtful as to its value in relation to inversion, especially in clearly inborn cases. Kraft Ebing at the end said little about it, and Necke, who was himself without faith in this method of treating inversion, stated that he had been informed by the last homosexual case treated by Kraft Ebing by hypnotism that, in spite of all goodwill on the patient's side, the treatment had been quite useless. Ferry also had no belief in the efficacy of suggestive treatment, nor has Mersbach, nor Rohleder. Numa Praetorius states that the homosexual subjects he is acquainted with, who had been so treated, were not cured, and Hirschfeld remarks that the inverts, so-called cured by hypnotism, were either not cured or not inverted. Moll has shown his doubts as to the wide applicability of suggestive therapeutics in homosexuality by developing in recent years what he terms association therapy. In nearly all perverse individuals, he points out, there is a bridge, more or less weak no doubt, which leads to the normal sexual life. By developing such links of association with normality, Moll believes, it may be possible to exert a healing influence on the homosexual. Thus, a man who is attracted to boys may be brought to love a boyish woman. Indications of this kind have long been observed and utilized, though not developed into a systematic method of treatment. In the case of bisexual individuals, or of a youthful subject whose homosexuality is not fully developed, it is probable that this method is beneficial. It is difficult to believe, however, that it possesses any marked influence on pronounced and developed cases of inversion. Somewhat the same aim as Moll's association therapy, though on the basis of a more elaborate theory, is sought by Freud's psychoanalytic method of treating homosexuality. For the psychoanalytic theory, to which reference was made in the previous chapter, the congenital element of inversion is a rare and usually unimportant factor. The chief part is played by perverse psychic mechanisms. It is the business of psychoanalysis to straighten these out, and from the bisexual constitution which is regarded as common to everyone, to bring into the foreground the heterosexual elements, and so to reconstruct a normal personality, developing new sexual ideals from the patient's own latent and subconscious nature. Sadger has especially occupied himself with the psychoanalytic treatment of homosexuality, 
and claims many successes. Sedger admits that there are many limits to the success of his treatment, and that it cannot affect the inborn factors of homosexuality when present. Other psychoanalysts are less sanguine as to the cure of inversion. Stekel appears to have stated that he has never seen a complete cure by psychoanalysis, and Ferenesi is not able to give a good account of the results, especially as regards what he terms obsessional homosexuality. He states that he has never succeeded in effecting a complete cure, although obsessions in general are especially amenable to psychoanalysis. I have met with at least two homosexual persons who had undergone psychoanalytic treatment and found it beneficial. One, however, was bisexual, so that the difficulties in the way of the success, granting it to be real, were not serious. In the other case, the inversion persisted after treatment, exactly the same as before. The benefit he received was due to the fact that he was enabled to understand himself better and to overcome some of his mental difficulties. The treatment, therefore, in his case, was not a method of cure, but of psychic hygiene, of what Hirschfeld would call adaptation therapy. There can be no doubt that, even if we put aside all effort at cure and regard an invert's condition as inborn and permanent, a large and important field of treatment here still remains. As we have seen in the two previous chapters, Sexual inversion cannot be regarded as essentially an insane or psychopathic state, but it is frequently associated with nervous conditions which may be greatly benefited by hygiene and treatment, without any attempt at all to overcome a homosexual attitude which may be too deeply rooted to be changed. The invert is specially liable to suffer from a high degree of neurasthenia, often involving much nervous weakness and irritability, loss of self-control, and genital hyperesthesia. Hirschfeld finds that over 67% inverts suffer from nervous troubles, and among the cases dealt with in the present study, as shown in Chapter 5, slight nervous functional disturbances are very common. These are conditions which may be ameliorated, and they may be treated in much the same way as if no inversion existed, by physical and mental tonics, or, if necessary, sedatives by regulated gymnastics and out-of-door exercises, and by occupations which employ, without overexerting the mind. Very great and permanent benefit may be obtained by a prolonged course of such mental and physical hygiene. The associated neurasthenic conditions may be largely removed, with the morbid fears, suspicions, and irritabilities that are usually part of neurasthenia, and the invert may be brought into a fairly wholesome and tonic condition of self-control. The inversion is not thus removed, but if the patient is still young, and if the perversion does not appear to be deeply rooted in the organism, it is probable that, provided his own good will is aiding, general hygienic measures, together with removal to a favorable environment, may gradually lead to the development of the normal sexual impulse. If it fails to do so, it becomes necessary to exercise great caution in recommending stronger methods. Purely platonic association with the other sex, Moll points out, quote, leads to better results than any prescribed attempt at coitus, end quote. For even when such attempt is successful, it is not usually possible to regard the results with much satisfaction. Not only is the acquisition of the normal instinct by an invert very much on a level with the acquisition of a vice, but probably it seldom succeeds in eradicating the original inverted instinct, what usually happens is that the person becomes capable of experiencing both impulses, not a specially satisfactory state of things. It may be disastrous, especially if it leads to marriage, as it may do in an inverted man, or still more easily, in an inverted woman. The apparent change does not turn out to be deep, and the invert's position is more unfortunate than his original position, both for himself and for his wife. It may be observed in the histories brought forward in Chapter 3 that the position of married inverts, we must of course put aside the bisexual, is usually more distressing than that of the unmarried. Among my cases, 14% are married. Hirschfeld finds that 16% of inverts are married and 50% are impotent. He is unable to find a single cure of homosexuality and seldom any improvement due to marriage. 
nearly always the impulse remains unaffected. The invert's happiness is, however, often affected for the worse, and not least by the feeling that he is depriving his wife of happiness. An invert who had left his country through fear of arrest and married a rich woman who was in love with him, said to Hirschfeld, Five years' imprisonment would not have been worse than one year of marriage. In a marriage of this kind, the homosexual partner and the normal partner, however ignorant of sexual matters, are both conscious, often with equal pain, that, even in the presence of affection and esteem and the best will in the world, there is something lacking. The instinctive and emotional element, which is the essence of sexual love and springs from the central core of organic personality, cannot voluntarily be created or even assumed. For the sake of the possible offspring, also, marriage is to be avoided. It is sometimes entirely for the sake of children that the invert desires to marry. But it must be pointed out that homosexuality is undoubtedly in many cases inherited. Often, it is true, the children turn out fairly well, but, in many cases, they bear witness that they belong to a neurotic and failing stock. Hirschfeld goes so far as to say that it is always so, and concludes that from the eugenic standpoint, the marriage of a homosexual person is always very risky. In a large number of cases, such marriages prove sterile. The tendency to sexual inversion in eccentric and neurotic families seems merely to be nature's merciful method of winding up a concern which, from her point of view, has ceased to be profitable. As a rule, inverts have no desire to be different from what they are, and, if they have any desire for marriage, it is usually only momentary. Very pathetic appeals for help are, however, sometimes made. I may quote from a letter addressed to me by a gentleman who desired advice on this matter. Quote, in part, I write to you as a moralist, and, in part, as to a physician. Dr. Q has published a book in which, without discussion, hypnotic treatment of such cases was reported as successful. I am eager to know if your opinion remains what it was. This new assurance comes from a man whose moral firmness and delicacy are unquestionable, but you will easily imagine how one might shrink from the implantation of new impulses in the unconscious self since newly created inclinations might disturb the conditions of life. At any rate, in my ignorance of hypnotism, I fear that the effort to give the normal instinct might lead to marriage without the assurance that the normal instinct would be stable. I write, therefore, to explain my present condition and crave your counsel. It is with the greatest reluctance that I reveal the closely guarded secret of my life. I have no other abnormality and have not hitherto betrayed my abnormal instinct. I have never made any person the victim of passion. Moral and religious feelings were too powerful. I have found my reverence for other souls a perfect safeguard against any approach to impurity. I have never had sexual interest in women. Once I had a great friendship with a beautiful and noble woman, without any mixture of sexual feeling on my part. I was ignorant of my condition, and I have the bitter regret of having caused in her a hopeless love proudly and tragically concealed to her death. My friendships with men, younger men, have been coloured by passion, against which I have fought continually. The shame of this has made life a hell, and the horror of this abnormality, since I came to know it as such, has been an enemy to my religious faith. Here there could be no case of a divinely given instinct which I was to learn to use in a rational and chaste fashion under the control of spiritual loyalty. The power which gave me life seemed to insist on my doing that for which the same power would sting me with remorse. If there is no remedy, I must either cry out against the injustice of this life of torment between nature and conscience, or submit to the blind trust of baffled ignorance. If there is a remedy, life will not seem to be such an intolerable ordeal. I am not pleading that I must succumb to impulse. I do not doubt that a pure celibate life is possible so far as action is concerned, but I cannot discover that friendship with younger men can go on uncolored by a sensuous admixture which fills me with shame and loathing. The gratification of passion, normal or abnormal, is repulsive to aesthetic feeling. I am nearly forty-two, and I have always diverted myself from personal interests that threaten to become dangerous to me. More than a year ago, however, 
a new fate seemed to open to my unhappy and lonely life. I became intimate with a young man of twenty, of the rarest beauty of form and character. I am confident that he is and always has been pure. He lives an exalted moral and religious life, dominated by the idea that he and all men are partners of the divine nature, and able, in the strength of that nature, to be free from evil. I believe him to be normal. He shows pleasure in the society of attractive young women, and in an innocent, light-hearted way refers to the time when he may be able to marry. He is a general favourite, but turned to me as to a friend and teacher. He is poor, and it was possible for me to guarantee him a good education. I began to help him from the longings of a lonely life. I wanted a son and a friend in my inward desolation. I craved the companionship of this pure and happy nature. I felt such a reverence for him that I hoped to find the sensuous element in me purged away by his purity. I am, indeed, utterly incapable of doing him harm. I am not morally weak. Nevertheless, the sensuous element is there, and it poisons my happiness. He is ardently affectionate and demonstrative. He spends the summers with me in Europe, and the tenderness he feels for me has prompted him at times to embrace and kiss me, as he always has done to his father. Of late I have begun to fear that without will or desire I may injure the springs of feeling in him, especially if it is true that the homosexual tendency is latent in most men. The love he shows me is my joy, but a poisoned joy. It is the bread and wine of life to me, but I dare not think what his ardent affection might ripen into. I can go on fighting the battle of good and evil in my attachment to him, but I cannot define my duty to him. To shun him would be cruelty, and would belie his trust in human fidelity. Without my friendship he will not take my money, the condition of a large career." I might, indeed, explain to him what I explained to you, but the ordeal and shame are too great, and I cannot see what good it would do. If he has the capacity of homosexual feeling, he might be violently stimulated. If he is incapable of it, he would feel repulsion. Suppose, then, that I should seek hypnotic treatment. I still do not know what tricks an abnormal nature might play me when diverted by suggestion. I might lose the joy of this friendship without any compensation— I am afraid. I am afraid. Might I not be influenced to shun the only persons who inspire unselfish feeling? Bear with this account of my story. Many virtues are easy for me, and my life is spent in pursuits of culture. Alas, that all the culture with which I am credited, all the prayers and aspirations, all the strong will and heroic resolves, have not rid my nature of this evil bent. What I long for is the right to love— not for the mere physical gratification, for the right to take another into the arms of my heart and profess all the tenderness I feel, to find my joy in planning his career with him, as one who is rightfully and naturally entitled to do so. I crave this, since I cannot have a son. I leave the matter here. When I read what I have written, I see how pointless it is. It is possible, indeed, that brooding over my personal calamity magnifies in my mind the sense of danger to this friend through me, and that I only need to find the right relation of friendliness, coupled with aloofness, which will secure him against any too ardent attachment. Certainly I have no fear that I shall forget myself. Yet two things array themselves on the other side. I rebel inwardly against the necessity of isolating myself, as if I were a pestilence, and I rebel against the taint of sensuous feeling. The normal man can feel that his instinct is no shame when the spirit is in control. I know that through the consciousness of others, my instinct itself would be a shame and a baseness, and I have no tendency to construct a moral system for myself. I have, to be sure, moments when I declare to myself that I will have my sensuous gratification as well as other men, but the moment I think of the wickedness of it, the rebellion is soon over. The disesteem of self, the sense of taint, the necessity of withdrawing from happiness lest I communicate my taint, that is a spiritual malady which makes the ground tone of my existence one of pain and melancholy. Should you have only some moral consolation without the promise of medical assistance, I should feel grateful. End, quote. End of chapter 7, part 1